Book Eleven of Jerusalem Delivered by Joquato Tasso, translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The argument, with grave procession, songs and psalms devout, heaven's sacred aid the Christian lords invoke. That done, they scale the wall which kept them out. The fort is almost won; the gates nigh broke. Godfrey is wounded by Clorinda stout and lost is that day's conquest by the stroke the angel cures him he returns to fight but lost his labor for day lost his light the christian army's great and puissant guide to salt the town that all his thoughts had bent did ladders rams and engines huge provide when reverend peter to him gravely went and drawing him with sober grace aside with words severe thus told his high intent right well my lord these earthly strengths you move but let us first begin from heaven above with public prayer zeal and faith devout the aid assistance and the help obtain of all the blessed of the heavenly rout with whose support you conquest sure may gain first let the priests before thine armies stout with sacred hymns their holy voices strain and thou and all thy lords and peers with thee of godliness and faith examples be thus spake the hermit grave in words severe godfrey allowed his counsel sage and wise of christ the lord quoth he thou servant dear i yield to follow thy divine advice and while the princes i assemble here with great procession songs and sacrifice with bishop william thou and adamere with sacred and with solemn pomp prepare next morn the bishops twain the heremite and all the clerks and priests of less estate did in the middest of the camp unite within a place for prayer consecrate each priest adorned was in a surplus white the bishops donned their albs and copes of state above their rochets buttoned fair before and mitres on their heads like crowns they wore Peter alone before spread to the wind the glorious sign of our salvation great. With easy pace the choir come all behind, and hymns and psalms in order true repeat. With sweet respondence in harmonious kind their humble song the yielding air doth beat. Lastly together went the reverend pair of prelates sage, William and Adamair. The mighty duke came next, as princes do, without companion marching all alone the lords and captains then came two and two the soldiers for their guard were armed each one with easy pace thus ordered passing through the trench and rampire to the fields they gone no thundering drum no trumpet shrill they hear their godly music psalms and prayers were to thee o father son and sacred sprite one true eternal everlasting king to Christ's dear mother Mary, virgin bright, psalms and thanksgiving, and of praise they sing. To them that angels down from heaven to fight gainst the blasphemous beast and dragon bring, to him also that of our Saviour good washed the sacred front in Jordan's flood. Him likewise they invoke, called the rock, whereon the Lord they say his church did rear, whose true successors close or else unlock the blessed gates of grace and mercy dear and all the elected twelve the chosen flock of his triumphant death who witness bear and them by torment slaughter fire and sword who martyrs died to confirm his word and them also whose books and writings tell what certain path to heavenly bliss us leads and hermits good and anchoresses that dwell mewed up in walls and mumble on their beads and virgin nuns in close and private cell where but shrift fathers never mankind treads on these they called and on all the rout of angels martyrs and of saints devout singing and saying thus the camp devout spread forth her zealous squadrons broad and wide towards mount olivet went all this rout so called of olive trees the hill which hide a mountain known by fame the world throughout which riseth on the city's eastern side from it divided by the valley green of josaphat that fills the space between hither the armies went 
and chaunted shrill that all the deep and hollow dales resound from hollow mounts and caves in every hill a thousand echoes also sung around it seemed some choir that sung with art and skill dwelt in those savage dens and shady ground for oft resounded from the banks they hear the name of christ and of his mother dear upon the walls the pagans old and young stood hushed and still amated and amazed at their grave order and their humble song at their strange pomp and customs new they gazed but when the show they had beholden long and hideous yell the wicked miscreants raised that with vile blasphemies the mountains hoar the woods the waters and the valleys roar but yet with sacred notes the hosts proceed though blasphemies they hear and cursed things so with apollo's harp pan tunes his reed so adders hiss where philomela sings nor flying darts nor stones the christians dread nor arrows shot nor quarries cast from slings but with assured faith as dreading not the holy work begun to end they brought a table set they on the mountain's height to minister thereon the sacrament in golden candlesticks a hallowed light at either end of virgin wax there brent in costly vestments sacred william dight with fear and trembling to the altar went and prayer there and service loud begins both for his own and all his army's sins humbly they heard his words that stood him nigh the rest far off upon him bent their eyes but when he ended had the service high you servants of the lord depart he cries his hands he lifted then up to the sky and blessed all those warlike companies and they dismissed returned the way they came their order as before their pomp the same within their camp arrived this voyage ended towards his tent the duke himself withdrew upon their guide by heaps the bands attended till his pavilion's stately door they view there to the lord his welfare they commended and with him left the worthies of the crew whom at a costly and rich feast he placed and with the highest room old raymond graced now when the hungry knights sufficed are with meat with drink with spices of the best quoth he when next to see the morning star to salt the town be ready all and pressed to-morrow is a day of pains and war this of repose of quiet peace and rest go take your ease this evening and this night and make you strong against to-morrow's fight they took their leave and godfrey's heralds rode to intimate his will on every side and published it through all the lodgings broad that gainst the morn each should himself provide meanwhile they might their hearts of cares unload and rest their tired limbs that evening tide thus fared they till night their eyes did close night friend to gentle rest and sweet repose with little sign as yet of springing day out peeped not well appeared the rising morn the plough yet tore not up the fertile lay nor to their feed the sheep from folds return the birds sat silent on the greenwood spray amid the groves unheard was hound and horn when trumpets shrill true signs of hardy fights called up to arms the soldiers called the knights arm arm at once an hundred squadrons cried and with their cry to arm them all begin godfrey arose that day he laid aside his hauberk strong he wants to combat in and donned a breastplate fair of proof untried such one as footmen use light easy thin scantly the warlord thus clothed had his grooms when aged raymond to his presence comes and furnished thus when he the man beheld by his attire his secret thought he guessed where is quoth he your sure and trusty shield your helm your hauberk strong where all the rest why be you half disarmed why to the field approach you in these weak defences dressed i see this day you mean a course to run wherein may peril much small praise be won alas 
Do you that idle praise expect to set first foot this conquered wall above? Of less account some knight there to object, whose loss so great and harmful cannot prove. My lord, your life with greater care protect, and love yourself because all us you love. Your happy life is spirit, soul, and breath of all this camp. Preserve it then from death. To this he answered thus, You know, he said, in Claremont, by mighty Urban's hand, when I was girded with this noble blade, for Christ's true faith to fight in every land, to God even then a secret vow I made, not as a captain here this day to stand and give directions, but with shield and sword to fight, to win, or die for Christ my Lord. When all this camp in battle strong shall be ordained and ordered, well disposed all, and all things done which to the high degree and sacred place I hold belong and shall, then reason is it, nor dissuade thou me, that I likewise assault this sacred wall, lest from my vow to God late made I swerve, he shall this life defend, keep, and preserve. Thus he concludes, and every hardy knight his sample follows and his brethren twain. The other princes put on harness light as footmen use, but all the pagan train toward that side bent the defensive might that lies exposed to view of Charles's wain and Zephyrus' sweet blasts, for on that part the town was weakest, both by sight and art. On all parts else the fort was strong by sight, with mighty hills defensed from foreign rage and to this part the tyrant gan unite his subjects born, and bands that serve for wage. From this exploit he spared nor great nor light, the aged men and boys of tender age to fire of angry war still brought new fuel, stones, darts, lime, brimstone, and bitumen cruel. All full of arms and weapons was the wall under whose basis that fair plain doth run. There stood the soldan, like a giant tall, so stood at Rhodes, the coloss of the sun. Waist high Argantes showed himself withal, at whose stern looks the French to quake begun. Clorinda, on the corner tower alone in silver arms, like rising Cynthia shone. Her rattling quiver at her shoulders hung. Therein a flash of arrows feathered wheel. In her left hand her bow was bended strung. Therein a shaft headed with mortal steel, so fit to shoot she singled forth among her foes who first her quarry's strength should feel. So fit to shoot Latona's daughter stood, when Niobe she killed and all her brood. The aged tyrant tottered on his feet from gate to gate, from wall to wall he flew. He comforts all his bands with speeches sweet, and every fort and bastion doth review. For every need prepared in every street new regiments he placed and weapons new the matrons grave within their temples high to idols false for succors call and cry o oh, macon break in twain the steeled lance of wicked godfrey with thy righteous hands against thy name he doth his arm advance his rebel blood pour out upon these sands these cries within his ears no entrance could find for naught he hears, naught understands. While thus the town for her defense ordains, his army's Godfrey ordereth on the plains. His forces first on foot he forward brought, with goodly order, providence, and art. Against those towers which to sail he thought, in battles twain his strength he doth depart. Between them crossbows stood, and engines wrought to cast a stone, a quarry, or a dart, from whence, like thunder's dint, or lightning's new, against the bulwarks, stones and lances flew. His men-at-arms did back his bands on foot. The light horse ride far off, and serve for wings. He gave the sign. So mighty was the rout of those that shot with bows and cast with slings, such storms of shafts and stones flew all about, that many a pagan proud to death it brings. Some died, some at their loops durst scant out peep, some fled and left the place they took to keep. The hardy Frenchmen, full of heat and haste, ran boldly forward to the ditches large, 
and o'er their heads an iron pentis vast they built, by joining many a shield and targe, some with their engines ceaseless shot and cast, and volleys huge of arrows sharp discharge. Upon the ditches some employed their pain to fill the moat, and even it with the plain. With slime or mud the ditches were not soft, but dry and sandy, void of waters clear. Though large and deep, the Christians fill them oft with rubbish, faggots, stone, and trees they bear. Adrastus first advanced his crest aloft, and boldly gan a strong scalado rear, and through the falling storm did upward climb of stones, darts, arrows, fire, pitch, and lime. The hardy Switzer now so far was gone that halfway up with mickle pain he got, a thousand weapons he sustained alone, and his audacious climbing ceased not. At last upon him fell a mighty stone, as from some engine great it had been shot. It broke his helm, he tumbled from the height, the strong circassian cast that wondrous weight. Not mortal was the blow, yet with the fall on earth sore bruised the man lay in a swoon. Argantes gan with boasting words to call, Who cometh next? This first is tumbled down. Come, hardy soldiers, come, assault this wall. I will not shrink, nor fly, nor hide my crown. If in your trench yourselves for dread you hold, there shall you die, like sheep killed in their fold. Thus boasted he. But in their trenches deep the hidden squadrons kept themselves from scath. The curtain, made of shields, did well off keep both darts and shot, and scorned all their wrath. But now the ram upon the rampire's steep, on mighty beams his head advanced hath, with dreadful horns of iron tough, tree great, the walls and bulwarks trembled at his threat. An hundred able men, meanwhile, let fall the weights behind. The engine tumbled down, and battered flat the battlements and wall. So fell Tygetus Hill on Sparta town. It crushed the steeled shield in pieces small, and beat the helmet to the wearer's crown and on the ruins of the walls and stones dispersed left their blood, their brains, and bones. The fierce assailants, kept no longer close under the shelter of their targets fine, but their bold fronts to chance of war expose, and against those towers let their virtue shine. The scaling ladders up to skies arose, the groundworks deep some closely undermine, the walls before the Frenchmen shrink and shake, and gaping sign of headlong falling make. And fallen they had, so far the strength extends of that fierce ram and his redoubted stroke, but that the pagans care the place defends, and saved by warlike skill the wall nigh broke. For to what parts aware the engine bends, there sacks of wool they place, the blow to choke, whose yielding breaks the strokes thereon which light, so weakness oft subdues the greatest might. While thus the worthies of the western crew maintain their brave assault and skirmish hot, her mighty bow Clorinda often drew, and many a sharp and deadly arrow shot, and from her bow no steeled shaft there flew, but that some blood the cursed engine got, blood of some valiant knight or man of fame, for that proud shootress scorned weaker game. The first she hit among the Christian peers was the bold son of England's noble king. Above the trench himself he scantly rears, but she an arrow loosed from the string. The wicked steel his gauntlet breaks and tears, and through his right hand thrust the piercing sting. Disabled thus from fight, he gan retire, groaning for pain, but fretting more for ire. Lord Stephen of Amboise on the ditch's brim, and on a ladder high Clotharius died. From back to breast an arrow pierced him, the other was shot through from side to side. Then, as he managed brave his courser trim, on his left arm she hit the Fleming's guide. He stopped, and from the wound the reed outtwined, but left the iron in his flesh behind. 
as Adamare stood to behold the fight, high on a bank withdrawn to breathe a space, a fatal shaft upon his forehead light, his hand he lifted up to feel the place, where on a second arrow chanced right, and nailed his hand unto his wounded face, he fell, and with his blood disdained the land, his holy blood shed by a virgin's hand. While Palamede stood near the battlement, despising perils all and all mishap, and upward still his hardy footings bent, on his right eye he caught a deadly clap, through the right eye Clorinda's seventh shaft went, and in his neck broke forth a bloody gap. He underneath that bulwark dying fell, which late to scale and win he trusted well. Thus shot the maid. The duke with hard assay and sharp assault, meanwhile the town oppressed, against that part which to his campward lay an engine huge and wondrous he addressed, the tower of wood built for the town's decay, as high as were the walls and bulwarks best, the turret full of men and weapons pent, and yet on wheels it rolled, moved, and went. This rolling fort his nigh approaches made, and darts and arrows spit against his foes, as ships are wont in fight. So it essayed with the strong wall to grapple and to close. The pagans on each side the peace invade, and all their force against this mass oppose. Sometimes the wheels, sometimes the battlement, with timber, logs, and stones they broke and rent. So thick flew stones and darts, that no man sees the azure heavens, the sun his brightness lost, the cloud of weapons, like two swarms of bees, met in the air, and there each other crossed. And look, how falling leaves drop down from trees, when the moist sap is nipped with timely frost, or apples in strong winds from branches fall, the Saracens so tumbled from the wall. For on their part the greatest slaughter light, they had no shelter against so sharp a shower. Some left on live betook themselves to flight, so feared they this deadly thundering tower. But Solomon stayed like a valiant knight, and some with him that trusted in his power. Argantes, with a long beech tree in hand, ran thither this huge engine to withstand. With this he pushed the tower, and back it drives the length of all his tree a wondrous way. The hardy virgin by his side arrives to help Argantes in this hard essay. The band that used the ram this season strives to cut the cords wherein the wool packs lay, which done, the sacks down in the trenches fall, and to the battery naked left the wall. The tower above, the ram beneath, doth thunder. What lime and stone such puissance could abide? The wall began, now bruised and crushed asunder, her wounded lap to open broad and wide. Godfrey himself and his brought safely under the shattered wall where greatest breach he spied. Himself he saves behind his mighty targe, a shield not used but in some desperate charge. From hence he sees where Solomon descends down to the threshold of the gaping breach, and there it seems the mighty prince intends Godfredo's open entrance to impeach. Argantes, and with him the maid, defends the walls above, to which the tower doth reach. His noble heart, when Godfrey this beheld, with courage new, with wrath and valor swelled. He turned about, and to good Sigere spake, who bare his greatest shield and mighty bow. That sure and trusty target let me take, impenetrable is that shield I know. Over these ruins will I passage make, and enter first. The way is eath and low, and time requires that by some noble feat I should make known my strength and puissance great. He scant had spoken, scant received the targe, when on his leg a sudden shaft him hit, and through that part a hole made wide and large, where his strong sinews fastened were and knit. Clorinda, thou this arrow didst discharge, and let the pagans bless thy hand for it, for by that shot thou savedst them that day from bondage vile, from death and sure decay. The wounded duke, 
as though he felt no pain still forward went and mounted up the breach his high attempt at first he nulled refrain and after called his lords with cheerful speech but when his leg could not his weight sustain he saw his will did far his power outreach and more he strove his grief increased the more the bold assault he left at length therefore and with his hand he beckoned guelpho near and said i must withdraw me to my tent my place and person in mine absence bear supply my want let not the fight relent i go and will ere long again be here i go and straight return this said he went on a light steed he leaped and o'er the green he rode but rode not as he thought unseen when godfrey parted parted eke the heart the strength and fortune of the christian bands courage increased in their adverse part wrath in their hearts and vigor in their hands valor success strength hardiness and art failed in the princes of the western lands their swords were blunt faint was their trumpets blast their sun was set or else with clouds or cast upon the bulwarks now appeared bold that fearful band that late for dread was fled the women that clorinda's strength behold their country's love to war encouraged they weapons got and fight like men they would their gowns tucked up their locks were loose and spread sharp darts they cast and without dread or fear exposed their breasts to save their fortress dear but that which most dismayed the christian knights and added courage to the pagans most was guelpho's sudden fall in all men's sights who tumbled headlong down his footing lost a mighty stone upon the worthy lights but whence it came none wist nor from what coast and with like blow which more their hearts dismayed beside him low in dust old raymond laid and used to seek within the ditches large to narrow shifts and last extremes they drive upon their foes so fierce the pagans charge and with good fortune so their blows they give that whom they hit in spite of helm or targe they deeply wound or else of life deprive at this their good success argantes proud waxing more fell thus roared and cried aloud this is not antioch nor the evening dark can help your privy slights with friendly shade the sun yet shines your falsehood can we mark in other wise this bold assault was made of praise and glory quenched is the spark that made you first these eastern lands invade why cease you now why take you not this fort what are you weary for a charge so short thus raged he and in such hellish sort increased the fury in the brain-sick knight that he esteemed that large and ample fort too straight a field wherein to prove his might there where the breach had framed the new-made port himself he placed with nimble skips of light he cleared the passage out and thus he cried to solomon that fought close by his side come solomon the time and place behold that of your valors well may judge the doubt why stayest thou among these christians bold first leap he forth that holds himself most stout while thus his will the mighty champion told both solomon and he at once leaped out fury the first provoked disdain the last who scorned the challenge ere his lips had passed upon their foes unlooked for they flew each spited other for his virtue's sake so many soldiers this fierce couple slew so many shields they cleft and helms they break so many ladders to the earth they threw that well they seemed a mount thereof to make or else some bamure fit to save the town instead of that the christians late beat down the folk that strove with rage and haste before who first the wall and rampire should ascend retire and for that honor strive no more scantly they could their limbs and lives defend they fled their engines lost the pagans tore in pieces small their rams to naught they rend and all unfit for further service make with so great force and rage their beams they break 
the pagans ran transported with their ire now here now there and woeful slaughters wrought at last they called for devouring fire two burning pines against the tower they brought so from the palace of their hellish sire when all this world they would consume to naught the fury sisters come with fire in hands shaking their snaky locks and sparkling brands but noble tancred who this while applied gave exhortations to his bold latines when of these knights the wondrous acts he spied and saw the champions with their burning pines he left his talk and thither forthwith hired to stop the rage of those fell saracines and with such force the fight he there renewed that now they fled and lost who late pursued thus changed the state and fortune of the fray meanwhile the wounded duke in grief and teen within his great pavilion rich and gay good sigier and baldwin stood between his other friends whom his mishap dismay with grief and tears about assembled be he strove in haste the weapon out to wind and broke the reed but left the head behind he bade them take the speediest way they might of that unlucky hurt to make him sound and to lay ope the depth thereof to sight he willed them open search and lance the wound send me again quoth he to end this fight before the sun be sunken underground and leaning on a broken spear he thrust his legs straight out to him that cure it must erotimus born on the banks of po was he that undertook to cure the knight all what green herbs or waters pure could do he knew their power their virtue and their might the noble poet was the man also but in this science he had more delight he could restore to health death wounded men and make their names immortal with his pen the mighty duke yet never changed cheer but grieved to see his friends lamenting stand the leech prepared his cloths and cleansing gear and with a belt his gown about him band now with his herbs the steely head to tear out of the flesh he proved now with his hand now with his hand now with his instrument he shaked and plucked it yet not forth it went his labor vain his art prevailed not his luck was ill although his skill were good to such extremes the wounded prince he brought that with fell pain he swooned as he stood but the angel pure that kept him went and sought divine dictamnum out of ida wood this herb is rough and bears a purple flower and in his budding leaves lies all his power kind nature first upon the craggy cliff bewrayed this herb unto the mountain goat that when her sides a cruel shaft hath rift with it she shakes the reed out of her coat this in a moment fetched the angel swift and brought from ida hill though far remote the juice whereof in a prepared bath unseen the blessed spirit pour it hath pure nectar from that spring of lydia then and panaces divine therein he threw the cunning leech to bathe the wound began and of itself the steely head out flew the bleeding staunched no vermil drop outran the leg again waxed strong with vigor new erotimus cried out this hurt and wound no human art or hand so soon makes sound some angel good i think come down from skies thy surgeon is for here plain tokens are of grace divine which to thy help applies thy weapon take and haste again to war in precious cloths his leg the chieftain ties not could the man from blood and fight debar a sturdy lance in his right hand he braced his shield he took and on his helmet laced and with a thousand knights and barons bold toward the town he hasted from his camp in clouds of dust was titan's face and rolled trembled the earth whereon the worthies stamp his foes far off his dreadful looks behold which in their hearts of courage quenched the lamp a chilling fear ran cold through every vein lord godfrey shouted thrice and all his train their sovereign's voice his hardy people knew and his loud cries that cheered each fearful heart 
Thereat new strength they took and courage new, And to the fierce assault again they start. The pagans twain this while themselves withdrew Within the breach to save that battered part, And with great loss a skirmish hot they hold Against Tancredi and his squadron bold. Thither came Godfrey, armed round about In trusty plate, with fierce and dreadful look, at first approach, against Argantes stout, headed with poignant steel, a lance he shook. No casting engine with such force throws out a knotty spear, and as the way it took, it whistled in the air. The fearless knight opposed his shield against that weapon's might. The dreadful blow quite through his target drove, and bored through his breastplate strong and thick. The tender skin it in his bosom rove, the purple blood outstreamed from the quick. To rest it out, the wounded pagan strove, and little leisure gave it there to stick. At Godfrey's head the lance again he cast, and said, Lo, there again thy dart thou hast. The spear flew back the way it lately came, and would revenge the harm itself had done, but missed the mark whereat the man did aim. He stepped aside the furious blow to shun. But Sigier, in his throat received the same, the murdering weapon at his neck outrun, nor aught it grieved the man to lose his breath, since in his prince's stead he suffered death. Even then the soldan struck with monstrous mane the noble leader of the Norman band. He reeled a while and staggered with the pain, and wheeling round fell groveling on the sand. Godfrey no longer could the grief sustain of these displeasures, but with flaming brand up to the breach in heat and haste he goes, and hand to hand there combats with his foes. And there great wonder surely wrought he had, mortal the fight, and fierce had been the fray, but that dark night from her pavilion sad her cloudy wings did on the earth display. Her quiet shades she interposed, glad to cause the knights their arms aside to lay. Godfrey withdrew, and to their tents they wend, and thus this bloody day was brought to end. The weak and wounded, ere he left the field, the godly duke to safety thence conveyed, nor to his foes his engines would he yield, in them his hope to win the fortress laid. Then to the tower he went, and it behealed, the tower that late the pagan lords dismayed, but now stood bruised, broken, cracked, and shivered from some sharp storm as it were late deliver it. From dangers great escaped, but late it was, and now to safety brought well nigh it seems. But as a ship that under sail doth pass the roaring billows and the raging streams, and drawing nigh the wished port, alas, breaks on some hidden rock her ribs and beams, or as a steed rough ways that well hath passed, before his inn stumbleth and falls at last. Such hap befell that tower, for on that side gainst which the pagans force and battery bend, two wheels were broke whereon the piece should ride. The maimed engine could no further wend. The troop that guarded it, that part provide to underprop with posts, and did defend, till carpenters and cunning workmen came, whose skill should help and rear again the same. Thus Godfrey bids, and that, ere springing day, the cracks and bruises all amend they should. Each open passage and each privy way about the peace he kept with soldiers bold. But the loud rumor, both of that they say and that they do, is heard within the hold. A thousand lights about the tower they view, and what they wrought all night, both saw and knew. End of Book Eleven Book Twelve of Jerusalem Delivered by Toquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument. Clorinda hears her eunuch old report her birth, her offspring, and her native land. Disguised, she fireth Godfrey's rolling fort. The burned peace falls smoking on the sand, With Tancred long unknown in desperate sort she fights, And falls through pierced with his brand. 
christened she dies, with sighs, with plaints and tears he wails her death, Argant revengement swears. Now in dark night was all the world embarred, but yet the tyrant armies took no rest, the careful French kept heedful watch and ward, while their high tower the workmen newly dressed. The pagan crew to reinforce prepared the weakened bulwarks late to earth downcast, their rampires broke and bruised walls to mend, lastly their hurts the wounded knights attend. Their wounds were dressed, part of the work was brought to wish it end, part left to other days. A dull desire to rest deep midnight wrought, his heavy rod sleep on their eyelids lays. Yet rested not Clorinda's working thought, which thirsted still for fame and warlike praise. Argantes eke accompanied the maid from place to place, who to herself thus said, This day Argantes strong and Solomon strange things have done, and purchased great renown. Among our foes out of the walls they ran, their rams they broke and rent their engines down. I used my bow. Of naught else boast I can. Myself stood safe meanwhile within this town, And happy was my shot, and prosperous too. But that was all a woman's hand could do. On birds and beasts in forests wild that feed It were more fit mine arrows to bestow Than for a feeble maid in warlike deed With strong and hardy knights herself to show. Why take I not again my virgin weed, And spend my days in secret cell unknown? Thus thought, thus mused, thus devised the maid, and turning to the knight, at last thus said, My thoughts are full, my lord, of strange desire, some high attempt of war to undertake, whether high God my mind therewith inspire, or of his will his God mankind doth make. Among our foes behold the light and fire, I will among them wend, and burn or break the tower. God grant therein I have my will, and that performed, betide me good or ill. But if it fortune such my chance should be, that to this town I never turn again, my eunuch, whom I dearly love, with thee I leave, my faithful maids, and all my train, to Egypt then conducted safely see those woeful damsels and that aged swain, help them, my lord, in that distressed case, their feeble sex, his age deserveth grace. Argantes wondering stood, and felt the effect of true renown pierced through his glorious mind. And wilt thou go, quoth he, and me neglect, disgraced, despised, leave in this fort behind? Shall I, while these strong walls my life protect, behold thy flames and fires tossed in the wind? No, no, thy fellow have I been in arms, and will be still in praise, in death, in harms. This heart of mine death's bitter stroke despiseth, for praise this life, for glory take this breath. My soul the more, quoth she, thy friendship prizeth, for this thy proffered aid required uneath. I but a woman am, no loss ariseth to this besieged city by my death. But if, as God forbid, this night thou fall, ah, who shall then, who can defend this wall? Too late, these excuses vain, the knight replied, you bring. My will is firm, my mind is set. I follow you where so you list me guide, or go before if you my purpose let. This said, they hasted to the palace wide, about their prince where all his lords were met. Clorinda spoke for both and said, Sir King, attend my words, hear and allow the thing. Argantes here, this bold and hardy knight, will undertake to burn the wondrous tower, and I with him, only we stay till night bury in sleep our foes at deadest hour. The king with that cast up his hands on height, the tears for joy upon his cheeks down pour. Praised, quoth he, be make on whom we serve. This land I see he keeps and will preserve, nor shall so soon this shaken kingdom fall while such unconquered hearts my state defend. But for this act, what praise or guerdon shall I give your virtues which so far extend? Let fame your praises sound through nations all, and fill the world therewith to either end. 
take half my wealth and kingdom for your meed. You are rewarded half, even with the deed. Thus spake the prince, and gently gan distrain now him, now her, between his friendly arms. The soldan by no longer could refrain that noble envy which his bosom warms. Nor I, quoth he, bear this broadsword in vain, nor yet am unexpert in night alarms. Take me with you. Ah, quoth Clorinda, no. Whom leave we here of prowess if you go? This spoken, ready with a proud refuse Argantes was, his proffered aid to scorn, whom Aladine prevents, and with excuse, to Solomon thus gan his speeches turn. Right, noble prince, as I hath been your use, yourself so still you bear, and long have borne, bold in all acts, no danger can affright your heart, nor tired is your strength with fight. If you went forth, great things perform you would in my conceit, yet far unfit it seems that you, who most excel in courage bold, at once should leave this town in these extremes, nor would I that these twain should leave this hold. My heart their noble lives far worthier deems, if this attempt of less importance were, or weaker posts so great a weight could bear. But, for well guarded is the mighty tower, with hardy troops and squadrons round about, and cannot harm it be with little power, nor fit the time to send whole armies out, this pair, who past have many a dreadful stour, and proffer now to prove this venture stout, alone to this attempt let them go forth, alone than thousands of more price and worth. Thou, as it best beseems a mighty king, with ready bands beside the gate attend, that when this couple have performed the thing, and shall again their footsteps homeward bend, from their strong foes upon them following thou mayst them keep, preserve, save, and defend. Thus said the king, the soldan must consent. Silent remained the Turk, and discontent. Then Ismin said, You twain that undertake this hard attempt, a while I pray you stay, till I a wild fire of fine temper make, that this great engine burn to ashes may. Haply the guard that now doth watch and wake will then lie tumbled sleeping on the lay. Thus they conclude, and in their chambers sit to wait the time for this adventure fit. Clorinda there her silver arms off rent, her helm, her shield, her hauberk shining bright, an armor black as jet or coal she hent, wherein withouten plume herself she dight, for thus disguised amid her foes she meant to pass unseen by help of friendly knight to whom her eunuch old Arcetes came, that from her cradle nursed and kept the dame. This aged sire had followed far and near through lands and seas the strong and hardy maid. He saw her leave her arms and wanted gear, her danger nigh that sudden change foresaid. By his white locks, from black that changed were in following her, the woeful man her prayed by all his service and his taken pain to leave that fond attempt, but prayed in vain. At last, quoth he, since hardened to thine ill thy cruel heart is to thy loss prepared, that my weak age nor tears that down distill, nor humble suit nor plaint thou list regard, attend a while strange things unfold I will. Hear both thy birth and high estate declared, Follow my counsel, or thy will, that done. She sat to hear, the eunuch thus begun, Senapus ruled, and yet perchance doth reign In mighty Ethiop, and her deserts waste. The Lord of Christ, both he and all his train Of people black, hath kept and long embraced. To him, a pagan was I sold for gain, and with his queen, as her chief eunuch, placed. Black was this queen as jet, yet on her eyes sweet loveliness in black a tired lies. The fire of love and frost of jealousy her husband's troubled soul alike torment. The tide of fond suspicion flowed high, the foe to love and plague to sweet content. 
he mewed her up from sight of mortal eye, nor day he would his beams on her had bent, she wise and lowly by her husband's pleasure, her joy, her peace, her will, her wish did measure. Her prison was a chamber painted round with goodly portraits and with stories old, as white as snow there stood a virgin bound beside a dragon fierce a champion bold the monster did with poignant spear through wound the gored beast lay dead upon the mould the gentle queen before this image laid she plained she mourned she wept she sighed she prayed at last with child she proved and forth she brought and thou art she a daughter fair and bright in her thy color white new terror wrought she wondered on thy face with strange affright but yet she purposed in her fearful thought to hide thee from the king thy father's sight lest thy bright hue should his suspect approve for seld a crow begets a silver dove and to her spouse to show she was disposed a negro's babe late born in room of thee and for the tower wherein she lay enclosed was with her damsel's only wand and me to me on whose true faith she most reposed she gave thee ere thou couldst christened be nor could i since find means thee to baptize in pagan lands thou knowst it was not the guise to me she gave thee and thee wept withal to foster thee in some far distant place who can her griefs and plaints to reckoning call how oft she swooned at the last embrace her streaming tears amid her kisses fall her sighs her dire complaints did interlace and looking up at last o oh god quoth she who dost my heart and inward mourning see if mind and body spotless to this day if i have kept my bed still undefiled not for myself a sinful wretch i pray that in thy presence am an object vile preserve this babe whose mother must deny to nourish it preserve this harmless child oh let it live and chaste like me it make but for good fortune elsewhere sample take thou heavenly soldier which delivered hast that sacred virgin from the serpent old if on thine altars i have offerings placed and sacrificed myrrh frankincense and gold on this poor child thy heavenly looks downcast with gracious eye this silly babe behold this said her strength and living sprite was fled she sighed she groaned she swooned in her bed weeping i took thee in a little chest covered with herbs and leaves i brought thee out so secretly that none of all the rest of such an act suspicion had or doubt to wilderness my steps i first addressed where horrid shades enclosed me round about a tigress there i met in whose fierce eyes fury and wrath rage death and terror lies up to a tree i leapt and on the grass such was my sudden fear i left thee lying to thee the beast with furious course did pass with curious looks upon thy visage prying all suddenly both meek and mild she was with friendly cheer thy tender body eyeing at last she licked thee and with gesture mild about thee played and thou upon her smiled her fearful muzzle full of dreadful threat in thy weak hand thou took'st without and dread the gentle beast with milk outstretched teat as nurse's custom proffered thee to feed as one that wondereth on some marvel great i stood this while amazed at the deed when thee she saw were filled and satisfied unto the woods again the tigress hide she gone down from the tree i came in haste and took thee up and on my journey wend within a little thorpe i stayed at last and to a nurse the charge of thee commend and sporting with thee there long time i passed till term of sixteen months were brought to end and thou began as little children do with half-clipped words to prattle and to go but having passed the august of mine age when more than half my tap of life was run rich by rewards given by your mother sage for merits past and service yet undone i longed to leave this wandering pilgrimage and in my native soil again to one to get some silly home i had desire loath still to warm me at another's fire to egyptward where i was born i went 
and bore thee with me by a rolling flood till i with savage thieves well nigh was hent before the brook the thieves behind me stood thee to forsake i never could consent and gladly would i scape those outlaws would into the flood i leapt far from the brim my left hand bore thee with the right i swim swift was the current in the middle stream a whirlpool gaped with devouring jaws the gulf on such mishap ere i could dream into his deep abyss my carcass draws there i forsook thee the wild waters seem to pity thee a gentle wind there blows whose friendly puffs safe to the shore thee drive where wet and weary i at last arrive i took thee up and in my dream that night when buried was the world in sleep and shade i saw a champion clad in armor bright that o'er my head shaked a flaming blade he said i charge thee execute aright that charge this infant's mother on thee laid baptize the child high heaven esteems her dear and i her keeper will attend her near i will her keep defend save and protect i made the waters mild the tigress tame o wretch that heavenly warnings dost reject the warrior vanished having said the same i rose and journeyed on my way direct when blushing morn from titan's bed forth came but for my faith is true and sure i ween and dreams are false you still unchristened be a pagan therefore thee i fostered have nor of thy birth the truth did ever tell since you increased are in courage brave your sex and nature's self you both excel full many a realm have you made bond and slave your fortunes last yourself remember well and how in peace and war in joy and teen i have your servant and your tutor been last morn from skies ere stars exited were in deep and death-like sleep my senses drowned the self-same vision did again appear with stormy wrathful looks and thundering sound villain quoth he within short while thy dear must change her life and leave this sinful ground thine be the loss the torment and the care this said he fled through skies through clouds and air hear then my joy my hope my darling hear high heaven some dire misfortune threatened hath displeased by thee because i did thee leer a law repugnant to thy parents faith ah for my sake this bold attempt forbear put off these sable arms appease thy wrath this said he wept she pensive stood and sad because like dream herself but lately had with cheerful smile she answered him at last i will this faith observe it seems me true which from my cradle age thou taught me hast i will not change it for religion new nor with vain shows of fear and dread aghast this enterprise forbear i to pursue no not if death in his most dreadful face wherewith he scareth mankind kept the place approaching gan the time while thus she spake wherein they ought that dreadful hazard try she to argantes went who should partake of her renown and praise or with her die Ismen, with words more hasty still did make their virtue great which by itself did fly two balls he gave them made of hollow brass wherein enclosed fire pitch and brimstone was and forth they went and over dale and hill they hasted forward with a speedy pace unseen unmarked undescried until beside the engine close themselves they place new courage there their swelling hearts did fill rage in their breasts fury shone in their face they yearned to blow the fire and draw the sword the watch descried them both and gave the word silent they passed on the watch begun to rear a huge alarm with hideous cries therewith the hardy couple forward run to execute their valiant enterprise so from a cannon or a roaring gun at once the noise the flame and bullet flies they run they give the charge begin the fray and all at once their foes break spoil and slay they passed first through thousand thousand blows and then performed their designment bold a fiery ball each on the engine throws the stuff was dry the fire took quickly hold 
furious upon the timber work it grows how it increased cannot well be told how it crept up the piece and how to skies the burning sparks and towering smoke up flies a mass of solid fire burning bright rolled up in smouldering fumes there bursteth out and there the blustering winds add strength and might and gather close the spursed flames about the frenchmen trembled at the dreadful light to arms in haste and fear ran all the rout down fell the peace dreaded so much in war thus what long days do make one hour doth mar two christian bands this while came to the place with speedy haste where they beheld the fire argantes to them cried with scornful grace your blood shall quench these flames and quench mine ire this said the maid and he with sober pace drew back and to the banks themselves retire faster than brooks which falling showers increase their foes augment and faster on them press the golden port was opened and forth stepped with all his soldiers bold the turkish king ready to aid them to his force he kept when fortune should them home with conquest bring over the bars the hardy couple leapt and after them a band of christians fling whom solomon drove back with courage stout and shut the gate but shut clorinda out alone was she shut forth for in that hour wherein they closed the port the virgin went and full of heat and wrath her strength and power gainst Aramon that struck her erst she bent she slew the knight nor argant in that stour wist of her parting or her fierce intent the fight the press the night the darksome skies care from his heart had ta'en sight from his eyes but when appeased was her angry mood her fury calmed and settled was her head she saw the gates were shut and how she stood amid her foes she held herself for dead while none her marked at last she thought it good to save her life some other path to tread she feigned her one of them and close her drew amid the press that none her saw or knew then as a wolf guilty of some misdeed flies to some grove to hide himself from view so favored with the night with secret speed dissevered from the press the damsel flew tancred alone of her escape took heed he on that quarter was arrived new when aramon she killed he thither came he saw it marked it and pursued the dame he deemed she was some man of mickle might and on her person would he worship win over the hills the nymph her journey dight toward another port there to get in with hideous noise fast after spurred the knight she heard and stayed and thus her words begin what haste hast thou ride softly take thy breath what bringest thou he answered war and death and war and death quoth she here mayst thou get if thou for battle come with that she stayed tancred to ground his foot in haste down set and left his steed on foot he saw the maid their courage hot their ire and wrath they whet and either champion drew a trenchant blade together ran they and together struck like two fierce bulls whom rage and love provoke worthy of royal lists and brightest day worthy of golden trump and laurel crown the actions were and wonders of that fray which sable knight did in dark bosom drown yet knight consent that i their acts display and make their deeds to future ages known and in records of long enduring story enroll their praise their fame their worth and glory they neither shrunk nor vantage sought of ground they traversed not nor skipped from part to part their blows were neither false nor feigned found the knight their rage would let them use no art their swords together clash with dreadful sound their feet stand fast and neither stir nor start they move their hands steadfast their feet remain nor blow nor foin they struck nor thrust in vain shame bred desire a sharp revenge to take and vengeance taken gave new cause of shame so that with haste and little heed they strake fuel enough they had to feed the flame at last so close their battle fierce they make they could not wield their swords so nigh they came they used the hilts and each on other rushed and helm to helm and shield to shield they crushed 
thrice his strong arms he folds about her waist, and thrice was forced to let the virgin go, for she disdained to be so embraced, no lover would have strained his mistress so. They took their swords again, and each enchased deep wounds in the soft flesh of his strong foe, till weak and weary, faint, alive, uneath, they both retired at once, at once took breath. Each other long beheld, and leaning stood upon their swords, whose points in earth were pight. When daybreak, rising from the eastern flood, put forth the thousand eyes of blindfold night, Tancred beheld his foes outstreaming blood and gaping wounds, and waxed proud with the sight. O oh, vanity of man's unstable mind, puffed up with every blast of friendly wine! Why joyst thou wretch? Oh, what shall be thy gain? What trophy for this conquest is thou rears? Thine eyes shall shed in case thou be not slain, for every drop of blood a sea of tears. The bleeding warriors leaning thus remain, each one to speak one word long time forbears. Tancred the silence broke at last, and said, for he would know with whom this fight he made, Ill is our chance, and hard our fortune is, who here in silence and in shade debate, where light of sun and witness all we miss, that should our prowess and our praise dilate. If words in arms find place, yet grant me this, Tell me thy name, thy country, and estate, that I may know, this dangerous combat done, whom I have conquered, or who hath me won. What I nil tell, you ask, quoth she in vain, nor moved by prayer, nor constrained by power. But this much know, I am one of those twain who late with kindled fire destroyed the tower. Tancred at her proud words swelled with disdain, that hast thou said, quoth he, in evil hour, Thy vaunting speeches and thy silence, Both uncivil wretch, hath made my heart more wroth. Ire in their chafed breasts renewed the fray, Fierce was the fight, though feeble with their might, Their strength was gone, their cunning was away, And fury in their stead maintained the fight. Their swords, both points and edges sharp, embay in purple blood, where so they hit or light. And if weak life yet in their bosoms lie, they lived, because they both disdained to die. As Aegean seas, when storms be calmed again that rolled their tumbling waves with troublous blast, do yet of tempests past some show retain, and here and there their swelling billows cast. So, though their strength were gone, and might were vain, Of their first fierceness still the fury lasts, Wherewith sustained they to their tackling stood, And heaped wound on wound, and blood on blood. But now, alas, the fatal hour arrives That her sweet life must leave that tender hold. His sword into her bosom deep he drives, And bathed in lukewarm blood his iron cold. Between her breasts the cruel weapon rives her curious square, embossed with swelling gold. Her knees grow weak, the pains of death she feels, and like a falling cedar bends and reels. The prince his hand upon her shield doth stretch, and low on earth the wounded damsel layeth. And while she fell, with weak and woeful speech her prayers last, and last complaints she saith. A spirit new did her those prayers teach, Spirit of hope, of charity and faith, And though her life to Christ rebellious were, Yet died she his child and handmaid dear. Friend, thou hast won, I pardon thee, Nor save this body, that all torments can endure, But save my soul. Baptism I dying crave, Come wash away my sins with waters pure. His heart relenting nigh in sunder rave With woeful speech of that sweet creature, So that his rage, his wrath and anger died, And on his cheeks salt tears for ruth down slide. With murmur loud down from the mountain side A little runnel tumbled near the place, Thither he ran and filled his helmet wide, And quick returned to do that work of grace. With trembling hands her beaver he untied, which done, he saw, 
and seeing knew her face, and lost therewith his speech and moving quite. O oh, woeful knowledge, ah, unhappy sight. He died not, but all his strength unites, and to his virtues gave his heart in guard, bridling his grief, with water he requites the life that he bereft with iron hard. And while the sacred words the knight recites, the nymph to heaven with joy herself prepared. And as her life decays, her joys increase. She smiled and said, Farewell, I die in peace. As violets blue amongst lilies pure men throw, so paleness midst her native white begun. Her looks to heaven she cast, Their eyes I trod downward for pity, Bent both heaven and sun. Her naked hand she gave the night, In show of love and peace, Her speech, alas, was done. And thus the virgin fell on endless sleep, Love, beauty, virtue, for your darling weep. But when he saw her gentle soul was went, his manly courage to relent began. Grief, sorrow, anguish, sadness, discontent, Free empire got and lordship on the man. His life within his heart they close up pent. Death through his senses and his visage ran. Like his dead lady, dead seemed Tancred good, In paleness, stillness, wounds and streams of blood, And his weak sprite, to be unbodied from fleshly prison, free that ceaseless strived, had followed her fair soul, but lately fled, had not a Christian squadron there arrived, to seek fresh water thither haply led, and found the princess dead, and him deprived of signs of life. Yet did the knight remain on live, nigh dead, for her himself had slain. Their guide, far off the prince knew by his shield, And thither hasted, full of grief and fear. Her dead, him seeming so, he there beheld, And for that strange mishap shed many a tear. He would not leave the corpses fair in field, For food to wolves, though she a pagan were, But in their arms the soldiers both uphent, And both lamenting brought to Tancred's tent. With these dear burdens to their camp they pass, Yet would not that dead seeming knight awake. At last he deeply groaned, Which token was his feeble soul, Had not her flight yet take. The other lay a still and heavy mass, Her spirit had that earthen cage forsake. Thus were they brought, And thus they placed were in sundry rooms, Yet both adjoining near. All skill and art his careful servants used, To life again their dying lord to bring. At last, his eyes unclosed, With tears suffused he felt their hands, And heard their whispering. But how he thither came, long time he mused. His mind astonished was with everything. He gazed about, his squires in fine he knew, Then, weak and woeful, thus his plaints out through. What, live I yet? And do I breathe and see of this accursed day the hateful light, This spiteful ray which still upbraideth me With that accursed deed I did this night? Ah, oh, coward hand, afraid why shouldst thou be, Thou instrument of death, shame, and despite, Why shouldst thou fear with sharp and trenchant knife To cut the thread of this blood-guilty life? Pierce through this bosom, and my cruel heart in pieces cleave, Break every string and vein. But thou, to slaughter's vile which used art, Think'st it were pity so to ease my pain, Of luckless love therefore in torments smart, A sad example must I still remain, A woeful monster of unhappy love, Who still must live, lest death his comfort prove. Still must I live in anguish, grief, and care, Furies my guilty conscience that torment, The ugly shades, dark night, and troubled air, In grisly forms her slaughter still present. 
Madness and death about my bed repair, Hell gapeth wide to swallow up his tent, Swift from myself I run, myself I fear, Yet still my hell within myself I bear. But where, alas, where be those relics sweet, Wherein dwelt late all love, all joy, all good? My fury left them cast in open street, Some beast! Hath torn her flesh and licked her blood. Ah, noble prey for savage beast unmeet. Ah, sweet, too sweet and far too precious food. Ah, silly nymph, who night and darksome shade To beasts and me, far worse than beasts, betrayed. But where you be, if still you be, I wend to gather up those relics dear at least, and if some beast hath from the hills descend and on her tender bowels made his feast, let that fell monster me in pieces rend and deep into me in his hollow chest. For where she buried is, there shall I have a stately tomb, a rich and costly grave. Thus mourned the knight, his squires him told at last they had her there, for whom these tears he shed. A beam of comfort his dim eyes outcast, like lightning through thick clouds of darkness spread. The heavy burden of his limbs in haste with mickle pain he drew forth of his bed, and scant of strength to stand, to move or go, thither he staggered, reeling to and fro. When he came there, and in her breast aspired, his handiwork, that deep and cruel wound, and her sweet face with leaden paleness dyed, where beauty late spread forth her beams around, he trembled so that near his squires beside to hold him up, he had sunk down to ground, and said, O oh face, in death still sweet and fair, thou canst not sweeten yet my grief and care. O oh, fair right hand, the pledge of faith and love, Given me but late, too late, in sign of peace, How haps it now thou canst not stir nor move, And you, dear limbs, now laid in rest and ease, Through which my cruel blade this floodgate rove, Your pains have end, my torments never cease. O oh, hands, O oh, cruel eyes, Accursed alike you gave the wound, you gave them light to strike. But thither now run forth my guilty blood, whither my plaints, my sorrows cannot wend. He said no more, but as his passion would enforce at him, he gan to tear and rend his hair, his face, his wounds. A purple flood did from each side in rolling streams descend. He had been slain, but that his pain and woe bereft his senses, and preserved him so. Cast on his bed, his squires recalled his sprite to execute again her hateful charge. But tattling fame, the sorrows of the night and hard mischance, had told this while at large. Godfrey and all his lords of worth and might ran thither, and the duty would discharge a friendship true, and with sweet words the rage of bitter grief and woe they would assuage. But as a mortal wound, the more doth smart, the more its search it is, handled or sought, so their sweet words to his afflicted heart more grief, more anguish, pain, and torment brought. But reverend Peter, that knoll set apart care of his sheep as a good shepherd ought, his vanity with grave advice reproved, and told what morning Christian knights behooved. O oh, Tancred, Tancred, how far different from thy beginnings good these follies be? What makes thee deaf? What hath thy eyesight blent? What mist, what cloud thus overshadeth thee? This is a warning good from heaven down sent, yet his advice thou canst not hear nor see, who calleth and conducts thee to the way from which thou willing dost, and witting stray, to worthy actions and achievements fit for Christian knights he would thee home recall. But thou hast left that course, and changed it to make thyself a heathen damsel's thrall, 
but see thy grief and sorrow's painful fit is made the rod to scourge thy sins withal of thine own good thyself the means he makes but thou his mercy goodness grace forsakes dost thou refuse of heaven the proffered grace and gainst it still rebel with sinful ire o wretch o whither doth thy rage thee chase refrain thy grief bridle of thy fond desire at hell's wide gate vain sorrow doth thee place sorrow misfortune's son despair's foul sire oh see thine ill thy plaint and woe refrain the guides to death to hell and endless pain this said his will to die the patient abandoned that second death he feared these words of comfort to his heart down went and that dark night of sorrow somewhat cleared yet now and then his grief deep sighs forth sent his voice shrill plaints and sad laments oft reared now to himself now to his murdered love he spoke who heard perchance from heaven above till phoebus rising from his evening fall to her for her he mourns he calls he cries the nightingale so when her children small some churl doth take before their parents eyes alone dismayed quite bare of comforts all tires with complaints the seas the shores the skies till in sweet sleep against the morning bright she fall at last so mourned so slept the night and clad in starry veil amid his dream for whose sweet sake he mourned appeared the maid fairer than erst yet with that heavenly beam not out of knowledge was her lovely shade with looks of ruth her eyes celestial seemed to pity his sad plight and thus she said behold how fair how glad thy love appears and for my sake my dear forbear these tears thine be the thanks my soul thou madest flit at unawares out of her earthly nest thine be the thanks thou hast advanced it in abraham's dear bosom long to rest there still i love thee there for tancred fit a seat prepare it is among the blest there in eternal joy eternal light thou shalt thy love enjoy and she her knight unless thyself thyself heaven's joys envy and thy vain sorrow thee of bliss deprive live no i love thee that i nil deny as angels men as saints may white sun live this said of zeal and love forth of her eye and hundred glorious beams bright shining drive amid which rays herself she closed from sight and with new joy new comfort left her night thus comforted he waked and men discreet in surgery to cure his wounds were sought meanwhile of his dear love the relic sweet as best it could to grave with pomp he brought her tomb was not of varied spartan grit nor yet by cunning hand of scopas wrought but built of polished stone and thereon laid the lively shape and portrait of the maid with sacred burning lamps in order long and mournful pomp the corpse was brought to ground her arms upon a leafless pine were hung the hearse with cypress arms with laurel crowned next day the prince whose love and courage strong drew forth his limbs weak feeble and unsound to visit went with care and reverence meet the buried ashes of his mistress sweet before her new-made tomb at last arrived the woeful prison of his living sprite pale cold sad comfortless of sense deprived upon the marble gray he fixed his sight two streams of tears were from his eyes derived thus with a sad alas began the night o oh, marble dear on my dear mistress placed my flames within without my tears thou hast not of dead bones art thou the mournful grave but of quick love the fortress and the whole 
still in my heart thy wonted brand I have, more bitter far, alas, but not more cold. Receive these sighs, these kisses sweet receive, in liquid drops of melting tears enrolled, and give them to that body pure and chaste, which in thy bosom cold and tombed thou hast. For if her happy soul her eye doth bend on that sweet body which it lately dressed, my love, thy pity, cannot her offend, anger and wrath is not in angels blessed, she pardon will the trespass of her friend, that hope relieves me with these griefs oppressed, this hand, she knows, hath only sinned, not I, who living loved her, and for love now die. And loving will I die, O oh, happy day, whene'er it chanceth, but, O oh, far more blessed, if, as about thy polished sides I stray my bones within thy hollow grave might rest, together should in heaven our spirits stay, together should our bodies lie in chest. So happy death should join what life doth sever. O death, O life, sweet both, both blessed ever. Meanwhile the news in that besieged town of this mishap was whispered here and there. Forthwith it spread, and for too true was known, a woeful loss was talked everywhere mingled with cries and plaints to heaven upthrown, as if the city's self new taken were with conquering foes, or as if flame and fire, nor house, nor church, nor street had left entire. But all men's eyes were on Arcetes bent, his eyes were deep, his looks full of despair, out of his woeful eyes no tears there went, his heart was hardened with his too much care. His silver locks with dust he foul besprent, He knocked his breast, his face he rent and tear, And while the press flocked to the eunuch old, Thus to the people spake Argantes bold. I would, when first I knew the hardy maid excluded was Among her Christian foes, have followed her to give her timely aid, Or by her side this breath and life to lose. What did I not? or what left I unsaid to make the king the gates again unclose? But he denied, his power did a restrain my will, my suit was waste, my speech was vain. Ah, had I gone, I would from danger free have brought to Sion that sweet nymph again, or in the bloody fight where killed was she, in her defense there nobly have been slain. But what could I do more? The counsels be of God and man gainst my designments plain. Dead is Clorinda fair, laid in cold grave. Let me revenge her whom I could not save. Jerusalem, hear what Argantes saith. Hear heaven, and if he break his oath and word, Upon his head cast thunder in thy wrath. I will destroy and kill that Christian lord, Who this fair dame by night thus murdered hath. Nor from my side I will ungird this sword, Till Tancred's heart it cleave, and shed his blood, And leave his corpse to wolves and crows for food. This said, the people with a joyful shout, Applaud his speeches, and his words approve, And calmed their grief in hope the boaster stout would kill the prince who late had slain his love. No oh, promise vain, it otherwise fell out, men purpose, but high gods dispose above. For underneath his sword this boaster died, whom thus he scorned and threatened in his pride. End of Book Twelve Book Thirteen of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso, translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The argument: His Mino sets to guard the forest old the wicked sprites whose ugly shapes affray and put to flight the men whose labor would to their dark shades let in heaven's golden ray. 
Thither goes Tancred, hardy, faithful, bold, But foolish pity lets him not assay his strength and courage. Heat the Christian power annoys, Whom to refresh God sends a shower. But scant dissolved into ashes cold The smoking tower fell on the scorched grass, When new device found out the enchanter old By which the town besieged secured was. Of timber fit his foes deprive he would, Such terror bred that late consumed mass, So that the strength of Zion's walls to shake, They should no turrets, rams, nor engines make. From Godfrey's camp a grove a little way Amid the valley's deep grows out of sight, Thick with old trees whose horrid arms display An ugly shade like everlasting night. There, when the sun spreads forth his clearest ray, Dim, thick, uncertain, gloomy seems the light, As when in evening day and darkness strive Which should his foe from our horizon drive. But when the sun his chair in seas doth steep, Night, horror, darkness thick the place invade, Which veil the mortal eyes with blindness deep, and with sad terror make weak hearts afraid. Thither no groom drives forth his tender sheep to browse, or ease their faint and cooling shade, nor traveller nor pilgrim there to enter, so awful seems that forest old dare venter. United there the ghosts and goblins meet to frolic with their mates in silent night. With dragon's wings some cleave the welkin fleet, some nimbly run o'er hills and valleys light. A wicked troop that with allurement sweet draws sinful man from that is good and right, and there with hellish pomp their banquets brought they solemnize, thus the vain pagans thought. No twist, no twig, no bough, nor branch therefore the Saracens cut from that sacred spring, but yet the Christians spared ne'er the more the trees to earth with cutting steel to bring. Thither went Ismen old with tresses hoar, when night on all this earth spread forth her wing, and there in silence, deaf, and murksome shade his characters and circles vain he made. He in the circle set one foot unshod, and whispered dreadful charms in ghastly wise. Three times, for witchcraft loveth numbers odd, toward the east he gaped, westward thrice. He struck the earth thrice with his charmed rod, wherewith dead bones he makes from graves to rise and thrice the ground with naked foot he smote, and thus he cried loud with thundering note, Hear, hear, you spirits all that whilom fell, cast down from heaven with dint of roaring thunder, hear, you amid the empty air that dwell, and storms and showers pour on these kingdoms under, hear all you devils that lie in deepest hell, and rend with torments damned ghosts asunder, and of those lands of death, of pain and fear, thou monarch great, great Dees, great Pluto, hear. Keep ye this forest well, keep every tree, numbered I give you them, and truly told. As souls of men in bodies clothed be, so every plant a sprite shall hide and hold. With trembling fear make all the Christians flee, when they presume to cut these cedars old. This said, his charms he gan again repeat, Which none can say but they that use like feet. At those strange speeches, still night's splendent fires Quenched their lights, and shrunk away for doubt. The feeble moon her silver beams retires, And wraps her horns with folding clouds about. His mean his sprites to come with speed requires. Why come you not, you ever damned rout? Why tarry you so long? Pardi, you stay till stronger charms and greater words, I say. I have not yet forgot, for want of use, what dreadful terms belong this sacred feat. My tongue, if still your stubborn hearts refuse, that so much dreaded name can well repeat, which heard great Dees cannot himself excuse, but hither run from his eternal seat. O oh, great and fearful! More he would have said, but that he saw the sturdy sprites obeyed. Legions of devils by thousands thither come, Such as in sparsed air their biding make, And thousands also which by heavenly doom condemned lie In deep Avernus lake, 
but slow they came displeased all and some because those woods they should in keeping take yet they obeyed and took the charge in hand and under every branch and leaf they stand when thus his cursed work performed was the wizard to his king declared the feat my lord let fear let doubt and sorrow pass henceforth in safety stands your regal seat your foe as he supposed no mean now has to build again his rams and engines great and then he told at large from part to part all what he late performed by wondrous art besides this help another hap quoth he will shortly chance that brings not profit small within few days mars and the sun i see their fiery beams unite in leo shall and then extreme the scorching heat will be which neither rain can quench nor dews that fall so placed are the planets high and low that heat fire burning all the heavens for show so great with us will be the warmth therefore as with the garaments or those of ind yet nil it grieve us in this town so sore we have sweet shade and waters cold by kind our foes abroad will be tormented more what shield can they or what refreshing find heaven will them vanquish first then egypt's crew destroy them quite weak weary faint and few thou shalt sit still and conquer prove no more the doubtful hazard of uncertain fight but if argante is bold that hates so sore all cause of quiet peace though just and right provoke thee forth to battle as before find means to calm the rage of that fierce knight for shortly heaven will send thee ease and peace and war and trouble amongst thy foes increase the king assured by these speeches fair held godfrey's power his might and strength in scorn and now the walls he gan in part repair which late the ram had bruised with iron horn with wise foresight and well advised care he fortified each breach and bulwark torn and all his folk men women children small with endless toil again repaired the wall but godfrey knowed this while bring forth his power to give assault against that fort in vain till he had builded new his dreadful tower and reared high his downfall rams again his workmen therefore he dispatched that hour to hew the trees out of the forest main they went and scant the wood appeared in sight when wonders knew their fearful hearts affright as silly children dare not bend their eye where they are told strange bugbears haunt the place or as new monsters while in bed they lie their fearful thoughts present before their face so feared they and fled yet wist not why nor what pursued them in that fearful chase except their fear perchance while thus they fled new chimeras sphinxes or like monsters bred swift to the camp they turned back dismayed with words confused uncertain tales they told that all which heard them scorn at what they said and those reports for lies and fables hold a chosen crew in shining arms arrayed duke godfrey thither sent of soldiers bold to guard the men and their faint arms provoke to cut the dreadful trees with hardy stroke these drawing near the wood where close ypent the wicked sprites in sylvan pinfolds were their eyes upon those shades no sooner bent but frozen dread pierced through their entrails dear yet on they stalked still and on they went under bold semblance hiding coward fear and so far wandered forth with trembling pace till they approached nigh that enchanted place when from the grove a fearful sound outbreaks as if some earthquake hill and mountain tore wherein the southern wind a rumbling makes or like sea waves against the scraggy shore there lions grumble there hiss scaly snakes there howl the wolves the rugged bears there roar there trumpets shrill are heard and thunders fell and all these sounds one sound expressed well upon their faces pale well might ye note a thousand signs of heart amating fear their reason gone by no device they wot how to press nigh or stay still where they were 
Against that sudden dread their breasts which smote, Their courage weak no shield of proof could bear. At last they fled, and one, then all more bold, Excused their flight, and thus the wonders told. My lord, not one of us there is, I grant, That dares cut down one branch in yonder spring. I think there dwells a sprite in every plant, there keeps his court great Dees, infernal king. He hath a heart of hardened adamant, That without trembling dares attempt the thing, And sense he wanteth, who so hardy is, To hear the forest thunder, roar, and hiss. This said, Alcasto to his words gave heed, Alcasto, leader of the Switzers grim, A man both void of wit and void of dread, Who feared not loss of life nor loss of limb. No savage beasts in deserts wild that feed, Nor ugly monster could dishearten him, Nor whirlwind, thunder, earthquake, storm, Or aught that in this world is strange or fearful thought. He shook his head, and smiling thus can say, The hardiness have I that would to fell, And those proud trees low in the dust to lay, Wherein such grisly fiends and monsters dwell. No roaring ghost my courage can dismay, No shriek of birds, beasts roar, or dragons yell. But through and through that forest will I wend, Although to deepest hell the paths descend. Thus boasted he, and leave to go desired, And forward went with joyful cheer and will. He viewed the wood and those thick shades admired, He heard the wondrous noise and rumbling shrill. Yet not one foot the audacious man retired. He scorned the peril, pressing forward still, Till on the forest's outmost marge he stepped. A flaming fire from entrance there him kept. The fire increased and built a stately wall Of burning coals, quick sparks, and embers hot. And with bright flames the wood environed all, That there no tree nor twist Alcasto got. The higher stretched flames seemed bulwarks tall, Castles and turrets full of fiery shot, With slings and engines strong of every sort. What mortal wight durst scale so strange a fort? Oh, what strange monsters on the battlement In loathsome form stood to defend the place! Their frowning looks upon the night they bent, And threatened death with shot, with sword, with mace. At last he fled, and though but slow he went, as lions do, whom jolly hunters chase, yet fled the man, and with sad fear withdrew, though fear till then he never felt nor knew. That he had fled long time he never wist, but when far run he had discovered it, himself for wonder with his hand he blissed, a bitter sorrow by the heart him bit amazed, ashamed, disgraced, sad, silent, trist, alone he would all day in darkness sit, nor durst he look on man of worth or fame, his pride late great, now greater made his shame. Godfredo called him, but he found delays and causes why he should his cabin keep. At length, perforce he comes, but not he says, or talks like those that babble in their sleep. His shamefacedness, to Godfrey plain bewrays his flight, So does his sighs and sadness deep. Whereat amazed, What chance is this, quoth he, These witchcrafts strange or nature's wonders be? But if his courage any champion move To try the hazard of this dreadful spring, I give him leave that venture great to prove. Some news he may report us of the thing. This said, his lords attempt the charmed grove, Yet nothing back but fear and flight they bring, For them enforced with trembling to retire The sight, the sound, the monsters, and the fire. This happed when woeful Tancred left his bed, To lay in marble cold his mistress dear. The lively color from his cheeks was fled, His limbs were weak, his helm or tard to bear. Nathless, when need to high attempts him led, no labor would he shun, no danger fear. His valor, boldness, heart, and courage brave To his faint body strength and vigor gave. To this exploit forth went the venturous knight, Fearless, yet heedful, silent, well advised. The terrors of that forest's dreadful sight, Storms, earthquakes, thunders, cries, he all despised. 
he feared nothing, yet a motion light that quickly vanished in his heart arised, when, lo, between him and the charmed wood, a fiery city high as heaven upstood. The knight stepped back, and took a sudden pause, and to himself, what help these arms, quoth he, if in this fire or monster's gaping jaws I headlong cast myself, what boots it me? For common profit, or my country's cause, to hazard life, before me none should be. But this exploit of no such weight I hold, for it to lose a prince or champion bold. But if I fly, what will the pagan say? If I retire, who shall cut down this spring? Godfredo will attempt it every day. What if some other knight perform the thing? These flames uprising to forestall my way, perchance more terror far than danger bring. But hap what shall. This said, he forward stepped, and through the fire a wondrous boldness leapt. He bolted through, but neither warmth nor heat he felt, nor sign of fire or scorching flame. Yet wist he not in his dismayed conceit if that were fire or no through which he came. For at first touch vanished those monsters great, and in their stead the clouds black night did frame, and hideous storms and showers of hail and rain, yet storms and tempests vanished straight again. Amazed, but not afraid, the champion good stood still. But when the tempest passed, he spied, he entered boldly that forbidden wood, and of the forest all the secrets eyed. In all his walk no sprite or phantasm stood that stopped his way or passage free denied, save that the growing trees so thick were set that oft his sight and passage oft they let. At length a fair and spacious green he spied, like calmest waters plain, like velvet soft, wherein a cypress clad in summer's pride pyramid-wise lift up his tops aloft in whose smooth bark upon the evenest side strange characters he found and viewed them oft, like those which priests of Egypt erst instead of letters used, which none but they could read. Mongst them he picked out these words at last, writ in the Syriac tongue, which well he could. O hardy knight, who through these woods hast passed, where death his palace and his court doth hold, O oh, trouble not these souls in quiet placed, O oh, be not cruel as thy heart is bold, Pardon these ghosts deprived of heavenly light, With spirits dead why should men living fight? This found he graven in the tender rind, And while he mused on this uncouth writ, Him thought he heard the softly whistling wind His blasts amid the leaves and branches knit, and frame a sound like speech of human kind, but full of sorrow, grief, and woe was it, whereby his gentle thoughts all filled were with pity, sadness, grief, compassion, fear. He drew his sword at last, and gave the tree a mighty blow that made a gaping wound. Out of the rift red streams he trickling see, that all be bled the verdant plain around. His hair start up, yet once again struck he. He no give over till the end he found of this adventure. When with plaint and moan, as from some hollow grave, he heard one groan. Enough, enough, the voice lamenting said. Tancred, thou hast me hurt. Thou didst me drive out of the body of a noble maid who with me lived, whom late I kept on live. And now within this woeful cypress laid, my tender rind thy weapon sharp doth rive. Cruel is not enough thy foes to kill, but in their graves wilt thou torment them still. I was Clorinda, now imprisoned here, yet not alone, within this plant I dwell. For every pagan lord and Christian peer before the city's walls, last day that fell, in bodies new or graves I wot not clear, 
but here they are confined by magic spell so that each tree hath life and sense each bough a murderer if thou cut one twist art thou as the sick man that in his sleep doth see some ugly dragon or some chimera new though he suspect or half persuaded be it is an idle dream no monster true yet still he fears he quakes and strives to flee so fearful is that wondrous form to view so feared the knight yet he both knew and thought all were illusions false by witchcraft wrought but cold and trembling waxed his frozen heart such strange effects such passions it torment out of his feeble hand his weapon start himself out of his wits nigh after went wounded he saw he thought for pain and smart his lady weep complain mourn and lament nor could he suffer her dear blood to see or hear her sighs that deep far-fetched be thus his fierce heart which death had scorned oft whom no strange shape nor monster could dismay with feigned shows of tender love made soft a spirit false did with vain plaints betray a whirling wind his sword heaved up aloft and through the forest bare it quite away or come retired the prince and as he came his sword he found and repossessed the same yet no return he had no mind to try his courage further in those forests green but when to godfrey's tent he approached nigh his spirits waked his thoughts composed been my lord quoth he a witness true am i of wonders strange believed scant though seen what of the fire the shades the dreadful sound you heard all true by proof myself have found a burning fire so are those deserts charmed built like a battled wall to heaven was reared whereon with darts and dreadful weapons armed of monsters foul misshaped whole bands appeared but through them all i passed unhurt unharmed no flame or threatened blow i felt or feared then rain and night i found but straight again to day the night to sunshine turned the rain what would you more each tree through all that wood hath sense hath life hath speech like human kind i heard their words as in that grove i stood that mournful voice still still i bear in mind and as they were a flesh the purple blood at every blow streams from the wounded rind no no not i nor any else i trow hath power to cut one leaf one branch one bough while thus he said the christian's noble guide felt uncouth strife in his contentious thought he thought what if himself in person tried those witchcrafts strange and bring those charms to naught for such he deemed them or elsewhere provide for timber easier got though farther sought but from his study he at last abrayed called by the hermit old that to him said leave off thy hardy thought another's hands of these her plants the woods despoil and shall now now the fatal ship of conquest lands her sails are struck her silver anchors fall our champion broken hath his worthless bands and looseth from the soil which held him thrall the time draws nigh when our proud foes in field shall slaughtered lie and zion's fort shall yield this said his visage shone with beams divine and more than mortal was his voice's sound godfredo's thought to other acts incline his working brain was never idle found but in the crab now did bright titan shine and scorched with scalding beams the parched ground and made unfit for toil or warlike feet his soldiers weak with labor faint with sweat the planet smiled their lamps benign quenched out and cruel stars in heaven did seniorize whose influence cast fiery flames about and hot impressions through the earth and skies the growing heat still gathered deeper root the noisome warmth through lands and kingdoms flies 
a harmful night, a hurtful day succeeds, and worse than both next morn her light outspreads. When Phoebus rose, he left his golden weed, and donned a gight in deepest purple dyed. His sanguine beams about his forehead spread, a sad presage of ill that should betide, with vermil drops at even his tresses bleed, for shows of future heat, from the ocean wide when next he rose, and thus increased still their present harms, with dread of future ill. While thus he bent against earth his scorching rays, he burnt the flowers, burnt his clyte dear. The leaves grew wan upon the withered sprays, the grass and growing herbs all parched were. Earth cleft in rifts, in floods their streams decays, the barren clouds with lightning bright appear, and mankind feared lest Clymene's child again had driven awry his sire's ill-guided wain. As from a furnace flew the smoke to skies, Such smoke as that when damned Sodom brent. Within his caves sweet Zephyr silent lies, Still was the air, the rack nor came nor went, But o'er the lands with lukewarm breathing flies The southern wind from sunburnt Afric sent, Which, thick and warm, his interrupted blasts Upon their bosoms, throats, and faces casts nor yet more comfort brought the gloomy night, when her thick shades was burning heat uprolled, her sable mantle was embroidered bright with blazing stars, and gliding fires for gold. Nor to refresh, sad earth, thy thirsty sprite, the niggard moon let fall her maid use cold, and dried up the vital moisture was in trees, in plants, in herbs, in flowers, in grass sleep to his quiet dales exiled fled from these unquiet nights and oft in vain the soldiers restless sought the god in bed but most for thirst they mourned and most complain for judah's tyrant had strong poison shed poison that breeds more woe and deadly pain than acheron or stygian waters bring in every fountain cistern well and spring and little silo that his store bestows of purest crystal on the christian bands the pebbles naked in his channel shows and scantly glides above the scorched sands nor po in may when o'er his banks he flows nor ganges waterer of the indian lands nor seven-mouthed nile that yields all egypt drink to quench their thirst the men sufficient think he that the gliding rivers erst had seen adown their verdant channels gently rolled or falling streams which to the valleys green distilled from tops of alpine mountains cold those he desired in vain new torments been augmented thus with wish of comforts old those waters cool he drank in vain conceit which more increased his thirst increased his heat the sturdy bodies of the warriors strong, whom neither marching far, nor tedious way, nor weighty arms which on their shoulders hung could weary make, nor death itself dismay, now weak and feeble, cast their limbs along, unwieldy burdens, on the burned clay. And in each vein a smouldering fire there dwelt, which dried their flesh, and solid bones did melt. Languished the steed late fierce, and proffered grass, his fodder erst despised, and from him kissed. Each step he stumbled, and which lofty was and high advanced before, now fell his crest. His conquests gotten, all forgotten pass, nor with desire of glory swelled his breast. The spoils won from his foe, his late rewards, he now neglects, despiseth, not regards. Languished the faithful dog, and wanted care of his dear lord and cabin both forgot. Panting he laid, and gathered fresher air to cool the burning of his entrails hot. But breathing, which wise nature did prepare to swage the stomach's heat, now booted not. For little ease, alas, small help they win, that breathe forth air, and scalding fire suck in. Thus languished the earth. In this estate lay woeful thousands of the Christians stout. The faithful people grew nigh desperate of hoped conquest. Shameful death, they doubt. 
of their distress they talk and oft debate these sad complaints were heard the camp throughout what hope hath godfrey shall we still here lie till all his soldiers all our armies die alas with what device what strength thinks he to scale these walls or this strong fort to get whence hath the engines new doth he not see how wrathful heaven gainst us his sword doth wet these tokens shown true signs and witness be our angry god our proud attempts doth let and scorching sun so hot his beams outspreads that not more cooling ind nor ethiop needs or thinks he it an eath or little thing that us despised neglected and disdained like abjects vile to death he thus should bring that so his empire may be still maintained is it so great a bliss to be a king that he that wears the crown with blood is stained and buys his sceptre with his people's lives see whither glory vain fond mankind drives see see the man called holy just and good that courteous meek and humble would be thought yet never cared in what distress we stood if his vain honor were diminished not when dried up from us is spring and flood his water must from jordan streams be brought and now he sits at feasts and banquets sweet and mingleth waters fresh with wines of crete the french thus murmured but the greekish knight tatine that of this war was weary grown why die we here quoth he slain without fight killed not subdued murdered not overthrown upon the frenchman let the penance light of godfrey's folly let me save mine own and as he said without farewell the knight and all his cornet stole away by night his bad example many a troop prepares to imitate when his escape they know clotharius is banned and adamers and all whose guides in dust were buried low discharged of duty's chains and bondage snares free from their oath to none they service owe but now concluded all on secret flight and shrunk away by thousands every night godfredo this both heard and saw and knew yet knowed with death them chastise though he mocked but with that faith wherewith he could remew the steadfast hills and seas dry up to naught he prayed the lord upon his flock to rue to ope the springs of grace and ease this draught out of his looks shone zeal devotion faith his hands and eyes to heaven he heaves and saith father and lord if in the desert's waste thou hadst compassion on thy children dear the craggy rock when moses cleft and brast and drew forth flowing streams of waters clear like mercy lord like grace on us downcast and though our merits less than theirs appear thy grace supply that want for though they be thy first-born sons thy children yet are we these prayers just from humble heart forth sent were nothing slow to climb the starry sky but swift as winged bird themselves present before the father of the heavens high the lord accepteth them and gently bent upon the faithful host his gracious eye and in what pain and what distress it laid he saw and grieved to see and thus he said mine armies dear till now have suffered woe distress and danger hell's infernal power their enemy hath been the world their foe but happy be their actions from this hour what they begin to blessed end shall go i will refresh them with a gentle shower rinaldo shall return the egyptian crew they shall encounter conquer and subdue at these high words great heaven began to shake the fixed stars the planets wandering still trembled the air the earth and ocean quake spring fountain river forest dale and hill from north to east a lightning flash outbreak and coming drops presaged with thunder shrill with joyful shouts the soldiers on the plain these tokens bless of long desired rain a sudden cloud as when elias prayed not from dry earth exhaled by phoebus beams arose moist heaven his windows open laid whence clouds by heaps outrush and watery streams 
the world o'erspread was with a gloomy shade, That like a dark and murksome even it seems, The crashing rain from molten skies down fell, And o'er their banks the brooks and fountains swell. In summer season, when the cloudy sky Upon the parched ground doth rain down send, As duck and mallard in the furrows dry, With merry noise the promised showers attend, and spreading broad their wings, displayed lie to keep the drops that on their plumes descend, and where the streams swell to a gathered lake, therein they dive, and sweet refreshing take, so they the streaming showers with shouts and cries salute, which heaven shed on the thirsty lands. The falling liquor from the dropping skies he catcheth in his lap, he barehead stands, and his bright helm to drink therein unties, in the fresh streams he dives his sweaty hands, Their faces some, and some their temples wet, And some, to keep the drops, large vessels set. Nor man alone to ease his burning sore Herein doth dive and wash, and hereof drinks, But earth itself, weak, feeble, faint before, Whose solid limbs were cleft with rifts and chinks, Received the falling showers, and gathered store Of liquor sweet, that through her veins down sinks, and moisture new infused largely was in trees, in plants, in herbs, in flowers, in grass. Earth, like the patient was, whose lively blood hath overcome at last some sickness strong, whose feeble limbs had been the bait and food whereon this strange disease to pastured long, but now restored in health and welfare stood, as sound as erst, as fresh, as fair, as young, so that, forgetting all his grief and pain, his pleasant robes and crowns he takes again. Ceased the rain, the sun began to shine with fruitful, sweet, benign, and gentle ray, full of strong power and vigor masculine, as be his beams in April or in May. O happy zeal, who trusts in help divine, The world's afflictions thus can drive away, Can storms appease, and times and seasons change, And conquer fortune, fate, and destiny strange. End of Book Thirteen Book Fourteen of Jerusalem Delivered by Toquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument The Lord to Godfrey in a dream doth show his will. Rinaldo must return at last. They have their asking who for pardon sue. Two knights to find the prince are sent in haste. But Peter who by vision all foreknew, sendeth the searchers to a wizard, placed deep in a vault, who first at large declares Armida's trains, then how to shun those snares. Now from the fresh, the soft, and tender bed of her still mother, gentle night outflew, the fleeting balm on hills and dales she shed, with honey drops of pure and precious dew and on the verdure of green forests spread the virgin primrose and the violet blue. And sweet-breathed Zephyr on his spreading wings sleep, ease, repose, rest, peace, and quiet brings. The thoughts and troubles of broad waking day they softly dipped in mild oblivion's lake. But he whose Godhead heaven and earth doth sway in his eternal light did watch and wake, and bent on Godfrey down the gracious ray of his bright eye, still ope for Godfrey's sake, to whom a silent dream the Lord down sent, which told his will, his pleasure, and intent. Far in the east, the golden gate beside, whence Phoebus comes, a crystal port there is, and ere the sun his broad doors open wide, the beams of spreading day uncloseth this. Hence comes the dreams by which heaven's sacred guide reveals to man those high decrees of his. Hence toward Godfrey, ere he left his bed, a vision strange his golden plumes bespread. Such semblances, such shapes, such portraits fair, did never yet in dream or sleep appear. 
For all the forms in sea, in earth, or air, The signs in heaven, the stars in every sphere, All that was wondrous, uncouth, strange, and rare, All in that vision well presented were. His dream had placed him in a crystal wide, Beset with golden fires, top, bottom, side. There, while he wandereth on the circles vast, The stars, their motions, course, and harmony, a knight, with shining rays and fire embraced, Presents himself unwares before his eye, Who, with a voice that far for sweetness past all human speech, Thus said, approaching nigh, What, Godfrey, knowst thou not thy Hugo here? Come and embrace thy friend and fellow dear. He answered him, Thy glorious shining light which in thine eyes his glistering beams doth place, estranged hath from my foreknowledge quite thy countenance, thy favor, and thy face. This said, three times he stretched his hands outright, and would in friendly arms the knight embrace, and thrice the spirit fled, that thrice he twined not in his folded arms, but air and wine. Lord Hugo smiled. Not as you think, quoth he, I clothed am in flesh and earthly mould, my spirit pure and naked soul, you see, a citizen of this celestial hold. This place is heaven, and here a room for thee prepared is among Christ's champions bold. Ah, when, quoth he, these mortal bonds unknit, shall I in peace, in ease, and rest there sit? Hugo replied, Ere many years shall run, amid the saints in bliss here shalt thou reign. But first, Great wars must by thy hand be done, much blood be shed, and many pagans slain. The holy city by assault be won, the land set free from servile yoke again, wherein thou shalt a Christian empire frame, and after thee shall Baldwin rule the same. But to increase thy love and great desire to heavenward, this blessed place behold. These shining lamps, these globes of living fire, How they are turned, guided, moved, and rolled, The angels singing here and all their choir. Then bend thine eyes on yonder earth and mold, All in that mass that globe and compass see. Land, sea, spring, fountain, man, beast, grass, and tree. How vile, how small, and of how slender price Is their reward of goodness, virtue's gain? A narrow room our glory vain upties, A little circle doth our pride contain. Earth, like an isle, amid the water lies, Which sea sometime is called, sometime the main. Yet not therein responds a name so great, It's but a lake, a pond, a marish strait. Thus said the one. The other bended down his looks to ground, And half in scorn he smiled. He saw at once earth, sea, flood, castle, town, Strangely divided, strangely all compiled, And wondered, folly man so far should drown, To set his heart on things so base and vile, That servile empire searcheth, and dumb fame, and scorns heaven's bliss, yet proffereth heaven the same. Wherefore he answered, Since the Lord not yet will free my spirit from this cage of clay, lest worldly error vain my voyage let, teach me to heaven the best and surest way. Hugo replied, Thy happy foot is set in the true path, nor from this passage stray, only from exile young Rinaldo call. This give I thee in charge, else not at all. For as the Lord of hosts, the King of bliss, Hath chosen thee to rule the faithful band, So he, thy stratagems appointed is to execute, So both shall win this land. The first is thine, the second place is his. Thou art this army's head, and he the hand. No other champion can his place supply, And that thou do it, doth thy state deny. The enchanted forest and her charmed treen with cutting steel shall he to earth down you, and thy weak armies, which too feeble been to scale again these walls, renforced new, 
and fainting lie dispersed on the green, shall take new strength, new courage at his view. The high-built towers, the eastern squadrons, all shall conquered be, shall fly, shall die, shall fall. He held his peace, and Godfrey answered so. Oh, how his presence would recomfort me, you that man's hidden thoughts perceive and know, if I say truth, or if I love him, see, but say, what messengers shall for him go? What shall their speeches, what their errand be? Shall I entreat, or else command the man? With credit, neither well perform I can. The eternal Lord, the other knight replied, that with so many graces hath thee blessed, wills that among the troops thou hast to guide, thou honored be and feared of most and least. Then speak not thou, lest blemish some betide thy sacred empire if thou make request. But when by suit thou moved art to Ruth, then yield, forgive, and home recall the youth. Guelfo shall pray thee, God shall him inspire to pardon this offence, this fault commit by hasty wrath, by rash and headstrong ire, to call the knight again. Yield thou to it, and though the youth, enwrapped in fond desire, far hence in love and looseness idle sit, yet fear it not he shall return with speed when most you wish him, and when most you need. Your hermit Peter, to whose sapient heart high heaven his secrets opens, tells, and shews, your messengers direct can to that part where of the prince they shall hear certain news, and learn the way, the manner, and the art to bring him back to these thy warlike crews, that all thy soldiers, wandered and misgone, heaven may unite again and join in one. But this conclusion shall my speeches end, Know that his blood shall mixed be with thine, Whence barons bold and worthy shall descend, That many great exploits shall bring to fine. This said, he vanished from his sleeping friend, Like smoke in wind, or mist in titan's shine. Sleep fled likewise, and in his troubled thought, With wonder, pleasure, joy with marvel fought. The duke looked up, and saw the azure sky with argent beams of silver morning spread, and started up, for praise and virtue lie in toil and travail, sin and shame in bed. His arms he took, his sword girt to his thigh, to his pavilion all his lords them sped, and there in council grave the princes sit, for strength by wisdom, war is ruled by wit. Lord Guelpho there, within whose gentle breast heaven had infused that new and sudden thought, his pleasing words thus to the duke addressed. Good prince, mild though unasked, kind unbesought, O oh, let thy mercy grant my just request, pardon this fault by rage not malice wrought, for great offence I grant, so late commit, my suit too hasty is perchance unfit, but since to Godfrey meek, benign, and kind, for Prince Rinaldo bold I humbly sue, and that the suitor's self is not behind thy greatest friends, in state or friendship true, I trust I shall thy grace and mercy find acceptable to me and all this crew. O oh, call him home, this trespass to amend, he shall his blood in Godfrey's service spend. And if not he, who else dares undertake? Of this enchanted wood to cut one tree. Against death and danger, who dares battle make with so bold face, so fearless heart as he? Beat down these walls, these gates in pieces break, leap o'er these rampires high, thou shalt him see. Restore, therefore, to this desirous band their wish, their hope, their strength, their shield, their hand. To me, my nephew, to thyself, Restore a trusty help when strength of hand thou needs. In idleness let him consume no more. Recall him to his noble acts and deeds. Known be his worth as was his strength of yore. Where'er thy standard broad her cross outspreads, O oh, let his fame and praise spread far and wide. Be thou his lord, his teacher, and his guide. Thus he entreated, and the rest approve his words with friendly murmurs whispered low. Godfrey, as though their suit his mind did move to that whereon he never thought till now, 
How can my heart, quoth he, if you I love, To your request and suit but bend and bow? Let rigor go, that right and justice be, Wherein you all consent and all agree. Rinaldo shall return, let him restrain henceforth his headstrong wrath and hasty ire, and with his hardy deeds let him take pain to correspond your hope and my desire. Guelfo, thou must call home the knight again, see that with speed he to these tents retire. The messengers appoint as likes thy mind, and teach them where they should the young man find. Up starts the Dane that bore Prince Sueno's brand. I will, quoth he, that message undertake. I will refuse no pains by sea or land to give the knight this sword kept for his sake. This man was bold of courage, strong of hand. Guelfo was glad he did the proffer make. Thou shalt, quoth he, Ubaldo shalt thou have to go with thee, a knight stout, wise, and grave. Ubaldo in his youth had known and seen the fashion strange of many an uncouth land, and travelled over all the realms between the Arctic Circle and hot Meroe strand, and as a man whose wit his guide had been, their customs use he could, tongues understand. For thee, when spent his youthful seasons were, Lord Guelfo entertained and held him dear. To these committed was the charge and care to find and bring again the champion bold. Guelfo commands them to the fort repair where Boymond doth his seat and scepter hold. For public fame said that Bertoldo's heir there lived, there dwelt, there stayed. The hermit old that knew they were misled by false report, among them came and parlored in this sort. Sir Knights, quoth he, if you intend to ride and follow each report fond people say, you follow but a rash and trothless guide that leads vain men amiss and makes them stray. Near Ascalon go to the salt sea side, where a swift brook falls in with hideous sway. An aged sire, our friend, there shall you find all what he saith that do, that keep in mind. Of this great voyage which you undertake, much by his skill and much by mine advice hath he foreknown, and welcome for my sake you both shall be, the man is kind and wise. Instructed thus, no further question make the twain elected for this enterprise, but humbly yielded to obey his word. For what the hermit said, that said the Lord. They took their leave, and on their journey went, their will could brook no stay, their zeal no let. To Ascalon their voyage straight they bend, Whose broken shores with brackish waves are wet. And there they heard how gainst the cliffs, Besprent with bitter foam, The roaring surges wet. A tumbling brook their passage stopped and stayed, Which late fallen rain had proud and puissant made. So proud that over all his banks he grew, And through the fields ran swift as shaft from bow. While here they stopped and stood, before them drew an aged sire, grave and benign in show, crowned with a beechen garland gathered new, clad in a linen robe that wrought down low, in his right hand a rod, and on the flood against the stream he marched, and dry shod yod. As on the Rhine, when winter's freezing cold congeals the streams to thick and hardened glass, the beauties fair of shepherds' daughters bold, with wanton windlays run, turn, play, and pass. So on this river passed the wizard old, although unfrozen soft and swift it was, and thither stalked where the warrior stayed. To whom, their greetings done, he spoke and said, Great pains, great travail, lords, you have begun and of a cunning guide great need you stand. Far off, alas, is great Pertoldo's son, imprisoned in a waste and desert land. What soil remains by which you must not run? What promontory, rock, sea, shore, or sand? Your search must stretch before the prince be found beyond our world, beyond our half of ground. But yet vouchsafe to see my cell, I pray, in hidden caves and vaults, though builded low. Great wonders there, strange things I will bewray, things good for you to hear and fit to know. 
This said, he bids the river make them way, The flood retired, backward gan to flow, And here and there two crystal mountains rise, So fled the Red Sea once, and Jordan thrice. He took their hands, and led them headlong down under the flood, Through vast and hollow deeps, such light they had, as when through shadows brown of thickest deserts feeble Cynthia peeps. There spacious caves they saw all overgrown, there all his waters pure great Neptune keeps, and thence, to moisten all the earth, he brings seas, rivers, floods, lakes, fountains, wells, and springs, whence Ganges, Indus, Volga, Ister, Po, whence Euphrates, whence Tigris spring they view. Whence Tanaeus, whence Nilus comes also, Although his head till then no creature knew. But under these a wealthy stream doth go That sulphur yields, and ore rich, quick, and new, Which the sun beams doth polish, purge, and fine, And makes it silver pure and gold divine. And all his banks, the rich and wealthy stream, Hath fair beset with pearl and precious stone, Like stars in sky, or lamps on stage that seem. The darkness there was day, the night was gone. There sparkled, clothed in his azure beam, The heavenly sapphire, there the jacinth shone, The carbuncle there flamed, the diamond sheen There glistered bright, there smiled the emerald green. Amazed the knights amid these wonders past, And fixed so deep the marvels in their thought, That not one word they uttered, Till at last Ubaldo spake, And thus his guide besought, O oh, father, tell me, By what skill thou hast these wonders done, And to what place us brought? For well I know not if I wake or sleep, My heart is drowned in such amazement deep. You are within the hollow womb, quoth he, of fertile earth, the nurse of all things made, and but you brought and guided are by me, her sacred entrails could no white invade. My palace shortly shall you splendent see with glorious light, though built in night and shade. A pagan was I born, but yet the Lord to grace by baptism hath my soul restored nor yet by help of devil, or aid from hell, I do this uncouth work and wondrous feat. The Lord forbid I use or charm or spell to raise foul dees from his infernal seat. But of all herbs, of every spring and well, the hidden power I know, and virtue great, and all that kind hath hid from mortal sight, and all the stars, their motions, and their might. For in these caves I dwell, not buried still from sight of heaven, But often I resort to tops of Lebanon or Carmel Hill, And there in liquid air myself disport. There Mars and Venus I behold at will, As bare as erst when Vulcan took them short. And how the rest roll, glide, and move I see, How their aspects benign or froward be. And underneath my feet the clouds I view, Now thick, now thin, now bright with iris bow, The frost and snow, the rain, the hail, the dew, The winds from whence they come and whence they blow, How Jove his thunder makes, and lightning new, How with a bolt he strikes the earth below, How comet, crinet, caught its stars are framed I knew, my skill with pride my heart inflamed. So learned, cunning, wise myself I thought, That I supposed my wit so high might climb To know all things that God had framed or wrought. Fire, air, sea, earth, man, beast, sprite, place, and time. But when your hermit me to baptism brought, And from my soul had washed the sin and crime, Then I perceived my sight was blindness still, My wit was folly, ignorance my skill. Then saw I that, like owls in shining sun, So gainst the beams of truth our souls are blind, And at myself to smile I then begun, And at my heart puffed up with folly's wind. Yet still these arts, as I before had done, I practised. Such was the hermit's mind. 
Thus hath he changed my thoughts, my heart, my will, And rules mine art, my knowledge, and my skill. In him I rest, on him my thoughts depend, My lord, my teacher, and my guide is he, This noble work he strives to bring to end, He is the architect, the workman we. The hardy youth, home to this camp to send From prison strong, my care, my charge shall be. So he commands, and me ere this foretold your coming oft to seek the champion bold. While this he said, he brought the champions twain down to a vault wherein he dwells and lies. It was a cave, high, wide, large, ample, plain, with goodly rooms, halls, chambers, galleries, all what is bred in rich and precious vein of wealthy earth and hid from mortal eyes there shines and fair adorned was every part with riches grown by kind not framed by art a hundred grooms quick diligent and neat attendants gave about these strangers bold against the wall there stood a cupboard great of massy plate of silver crystal gold but when with precious wines and costly meat they filled were thus spake the wizard old now fits the time, Sir Knights, I tell and show what you desire to hear and long to know. Armida's craft, her slight and hidden guile, you partly wot, her acts and arts untrue, how to your camp she came, and by what while the greatest lords and princes thence she drew. You know she turned them first to monsters vile, and kept them since closed up in secret mew. Lastly, to Gaza word in bonds them sent, whom young Rinaldo rescued as they went. What chanced since, I would at large declare, to you unknown, a story strange and true. When first her prey, got with such pain and care, escaped and gone, the witch perceived anew, her hands she wrung for grief, her clothes she tear, and full of woe these heavy words out threw. Alas, my knights are slain, my prisoners free, yet of that conquest never boast shall he. He in their place shall serve me, and sustain their plagues, their torments suffer, sorrows bear, and they his absence shall lament in vain, and wail his loss, and theirs with many a tear. Thus talking to herself she did ordain a false and wicked guile, as you shall hear, Thither she hasted, where the valiant knight had overcome and slain her men in fight. Rinaldo there had doffed and left his own, and on his back a pagan's harness tied. Perchance he deemed so to pass unknown, and in those arms less noted safe to ride. A headless corse, in fight late overthrown, the witch in his forsaken arms did hide, and by a brook exposed it on the sand whither she wist would come a Christian band. Their coming might the dame foreknow right well, for secret spies she sent forth thousand ways, which every day news from the camp might tell, who parted thence booties to search or praise. Besides, the sprites, conjured by sacred spell, all what she asks or doubts reveals and says. The body therefore placed she in that part that furthered best her slight, her craft, and art. And near the corpse, a varlet false and sly she left, Attired in shepherd's homely weed, And taught him how to counterfeit and lie as time required, And he performed the deed. With him your soldier spoke, of jealousy and false suspect, Mongst them he strewed the seed, that since brought forth the fruit of strife and jar, Of civil brawls, contention, discord, war. And as she wished, so the soldiers thought, by Godfrey's practice, that the prince was slain. Yet vanished that suspicion false to naught when truth spread forth her silver wings again. Her false devices thus Armida wrought. This was her first deceit, her foremost train. What next she practiced, shall you hear me tell against our knight, and what thereof befell? Armida hunted him through wood and plain, till on Orontes' flowery banks he stayed. There, where the stream did part and meet again, and in the midst a gentle island made, a pillar fair was piped beside the main, near which a little frigate floating laid. 
The marble white the prince did long behold, And this inscription read there writ in gold, Whoso thou art, whom will or chance doth bring with happy steps to flood Orontes' sides, know that the world hath not so strange a thing twixt east and west as this small island hides. Then pass and see without more tarrying. The hasty youth to pass the stream provides, and for the cog was narrow, small and straight, alone he rode and bade his squires there wait. Landed, he stalks about, yet not he sees but verdant groves, sweet shades, and mossy rocks, with caves and fountains, flowers, herbs, and trees, so that the words he read he takes for mocks. But that green isle was sweet at all degrees, wherewith enticed down sits he and unlocks his closed helm and bears his visage fair to take sweet breath from cool and gentle air. A rumbling sound amid the waters deep meanwhile he heard, and thither turned his sight, and tumbling in the troubled stream took keep how the strong waves together rush and fight, whence first he saw with golden tresses peep the rising visage of a virgin bright, and then her neck, her breasts, and all as low as he for shame could see or she could show. So in the twilight doth sometimes appear a nymph, a goddess, or a fairy queen, and though no siren but a sprite this were, yet by her beauty seemed it she had been one of those sisters false which haunted near the Tyrene shores, and kept those waters sheen. Like theirs her face, her voice was, and her sound, and thus she sung and pleased both skies and ground. Ye happy youths, whom April fresh and May attire in flowering green of lusty age, for glory vain or virtue's idle ray, do not your tender limbs to toil engage. In calm streams fishes, birds in sunshine play, who fall with pleasure he is only sage. So nature saith, yet gainst her sacred will, why still rebel you, and why strive you still? O oh, fools, who youth possess, yet scorn the same, a precious but a short abiding treasure. Virtue itself is but an idle name, prized by the world above reason all and measure. And honor, glory, praise, renown, and fame, that men's proud hearts bewitch with tickling pleasure, an echo is a shade, a dream, a flower, with each wind blasted, spoiled with every shower. But let your happy souls in joy possess the ivory castles of your bodies fair. Your passed harms salve with forgetfulness. Haste not your coming ills with thought and care. Regard no blazing star with burning tress, nor storm, nor threatening sky, nor thundering air. This wisdom is good life and worldly bliss. Kind teacheth us, nature commands us this. Thus sung the spirit false, and stealing sleep, to which her tunes enticed his heavy eyes, by step and step did on his senses creep, till every limb therein unmoved lies. Not thunders loud could from this slumber deep of quiet death, true image, make him rise. Then from her ambush forth Armida start, swearing revenge, and threatening torments smart. But when she looked on his face a while, and saw how sweet he breathed, how still he lay, how his fair eyes, though closed, seemed to smile, at first she stayed, astound with great dismay, then sat her down, so love can art beguile, and as she sat and looked, fled fast away her wrath. Thus on his forehead gazed the maid, as in his spring Narcissus tooting laid. And with a veil she wiped now and then from his fair cheeks the globes of silver sweat, and cool air gathered with a trembling fan to mitigate the rage of melting heat. Thus, who would think it, his hot eye glance can of that cold frost dissolve the hardness great, which late congealed the heart of that fair dame, who, late a foe, a lover now became. 
of woodbines, lilies, and of roses sweet, which proudly flowered through that wanton plain, all plaited fast, well knit and joined meat, she framed a soft, but surely holding chain, wherewith she bound his neck, his hands, and feet. Thus bound, thus taken, did the prince remain, and in a coach which two old dragons drew, she laid the sleeping knight, and thence she flew. Nor turned she to Damascus' kingdom large, nor to the fort built by us Faulty's lake, but, jealous of her dear and precious charge, and of her love ashamed, the way did take to the wide ocean, whither skiff or barge from us doth sell, or never voyage make. And there, to frolic with her love a while, she chose a waste, a soul and desert isle. An isle that with her fellows bears the name of fortunate, for temperate air and mold. There, in a mountain high, alight the dame, a hill, obscured with shades of forest sold, upon whose sides the witch by art did frame continual snow, sharp frost and winter cold, but on the top, fresh, pleasant, sweet, and green, beside a lake a palace built this queen. There in perpetual sweet and flowering spring she lives at ease, and joys her lord at will. The hardy youth from this strange prison bring your valors must, directed by my skill, and overcome each monster and each thing that guards the palace or that keeps the hill. Nor shall you want a guide or engines fit to bring you to the mount or conquer it. Beside the stream parted shall you find a dame in visage young but old in years. Her curled locks about her front are twined, a party-colored robe of silk she wears. This shall conduct you swift as air or wind, or that flit bird that Jove's hot weapon bears. A faithful pilot, cunning, trusty, sure, as Typhus was, or skilful Palinure. At the hill's foot, whereon the witch doth dwell, the serpents hiss and cast their poison vial. The ugly boars do rear their bristles fell, there gape the bears and roar the lions wild. But yet a rod I have can easily quell their rage and wrath, and make them meek and mild. Yet on the top and height of all the hill the greatest danger lies, and greatest ill. There welleth out a fair, clear, bubbling spring, whose waters pure the thirsty guests entice, but in whose liquors cold the secret sting of strange and deadly poison closed lies. One sup thereof the drinker's heart doth bring to sudden joy, whence laughter vain doth rise. Nor that strange merriment once stops or stays, till with his laughter's end he end his days. Then from those deadly wicked streams refrain your thirsty lips, despise the dainty cheer you find exposed upon the grassy plain, nor those false damsels once vouchsafe to hear, that in melodious tunes their voices strain, whose faces lovely, smiling, sweet appear, but you their looks, their voice, their songs despise, and enter fair Armada's paradise. The house is builded like a maze within, with turning stairs, false doors, and winding ways. The shape whereof, plotted in vellum thin, I will you give, that all those slights bewrays. In midst a garden lies, where many a gin and net to catch frail hearts false cupid lays. There in the verdure of the arbor's green, with your brave champion, lies the wanton queen. But... When she haply riseth from the night, and hath withdrawn her presence from the place, then take a shield I have of diamonds bright, and hold the same before the young man's face, that he may glass therein his garments light, and wanton soft attire, and view his case, that with the sight shame and disdain may move his heart to leave that base and servile love. Now resteth naught that needful is to tell, but that you go secure, safe, sure, and bold. Unseen the palace may you enter well, and past the dangers all I have foretold. For neither art, nor charm, nor magic spell can stop your passage, or your steps withhold. Nor shall Armida, so you guarded be, your coming aught foreknow or once foresee. And eke, as safe from that enchanted fort, you shall return and scape unhurt away. But now the time doth us to rest exhort. 
and you must rise by peep of springing day. This said, he led them through a narrow port into a lodging fair wherein they lay. There, glad and full of thoughts, he left his guests, and in his wanted bed the old man rests. End of Book 14book 15 of jerusalem delivered by toquato tasso translated by edward fairfax this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland the argument the well instructed knights forsake their host and come where their strange bark in harbor lay and setting sail behold on egypt's coast the monarch's ships and armies in array their wind and pilot good, the seas in post they pass, and of long journeys make short way. The far-sought isle they find, Armida's charms they scorn, they shun her slights, despise her arms. The rosy-fingered morn with gladsome ray rose to her task from old Tithonus' lap, when their grave host came where the warriors lay, and with him brought the shield, the rod, the map, Arise, quoth he, ere lately broken day in his bright arms the round world fold or wrap. All what I promised, here I have them brought, enough to bring Armida's charms to naught. They started up, and every tender limb in sturdy steel and stubborn plate they dight. Before the old man stalked, they followed him through gloomy shades of sad and sable night, through vaults obscure again and entries dim. The way they came, their steps remeasured right. But at the flood arrived, farewell, quoth he, good luck your aid, your guide good fortune be. The flood received them in his bottom low, and lift them up above his billows thin. The water so cast up a branch or bough, by violence first plunged and dived therein. But when upon the shore the waves them throw, the knights for their fair guide to look begin and gazing round a little bark they spied wherein a damsel sat the stern to guide upon her front her locks were curled new her eyes were courteous full of peace and love in look a saint an angel bright in show so in her visage grace and virtue strove her robe seemed sometimes red and sometimes blue and changed still as she did stir or move that look how oft man's eye beheld the same, so oft the colors changed, went and came. The feathers so that tender, soft, and plain about the dove's smooth neck close couched been, do in one color never long remain, but change their hue gainst glimpse of Phoebus' sheen. And now of rubies bright of vermil chain, now make a carknet rich of emeralds green now mingle both, now alter, turn, and change to thousand colors, rich, pure, fair, and strange. Enter this boat, you happy men, she says, wherein through raging waves secure I ride, to which all tempest, storm, and wind obeys, all burdens light, benign is stream and tide. My lord that rules your journeys and your ways hath sent me here, your servant and your guide. This said, her shallop drove she gainst the sand, and anchor cast amid the steadfast land. They entered in. Her anchor she upwound, and launched forth to see her pinnace flit. Spread to the wind her sails she broad unbound, and at the helm sat down to govern it. Swelled the flood that all his banks he drowned, to bear the greatest ship of burden fit. Yet was her frigate little, swift, and light, that at his lowest ebb bear it he might. Swifter than thought the friendly wind forth bore the sliding boat upon the rolling wave. With curded foam and froth the billows hoar about the cable murmur, roar, and rave. At last they came where all his watery store the flood in one deep channel did engrave, and forth to greedy seas his streams he sent, and so his waves, his name himself is bent. The wondrous boat scant touched the troubled main, but all the sea still hushed and quiet was. Vanished the clouds, ceased the wind and rain, the tempests threatened, overblow and pass. A gentle breathing air made even and plain the azure face, 
and heaven's smooth looking glass, and heaven itself smiled from the skies above with a calm clearness on the earth his love. By Ascalon they sailed, and forth drived toward the west their speedy course they frame, in sight of Gaza till the bark arrived, a little port, when first it took that name, but since by others loss, so well it thrived, a city great and rich that it became, and there the shores and borders of the land they found as full of armed men as sand. The passengers to landward turned their sight, and there saw pitched many a stately tent, soldier and footman, captain, lord and knight, between the shore and city came and went, huge elephants, strong camels, coursers light, with horned hoofs and sandy ways outrent, and in the haven many a ship and boat with mighty anchors fasten, swim and float. Some spread their sails, and some with strong oars sweep the water smooth and brush the buxom wave. Their breasts in sunder cleave the yielding deep, the broken seas for anger foam and rave. When thus their guide began, Sir Knights, take keep how all these shores are spread with squadrons brave, and troops of hardy knights. Yet, on these sands the monarch scant hath gathered half his bands. Of Egypt only these the forces are, and aid from other lands they here attend. For twixt the noonday sun and morning star all realms at his command do bow and bend. So that I trust we shall return from far, and bring our journey long to wish it end. Before this king or his lieutenant shall these armies bring to Sion's conquered wall. While thus she said, as soaring eagles fly amongst other birds securely through the air, and mounting up, behold with wakeful eye the radiant beams of old Hyperion's hair, her gondola so passed swiftly by, twixt ship and ship without in fear or care, who should her follow, trouble, stop, or stay, and forth to sea made lucky speed and way. Themselves fornenced old Raphia's town they fanned, a town that first to sailors doth appear as they from Syria pass to Egypt land. The sterile coasts of barren Renokir they pass, and seas where Cassius Hill doth stand, that with his trees o'erspreads the waters near, against whose roots breaketh the brackish wave, where Jove his temple, Pompey hath his grave. Then Damietta next, where they behold how to the sea his tribute Nilus pays, by his seven mouths, renowned in stories old, and by a hundred more ignoble ways. They passed the town built by the Grecian bold, of him called Alexandria till our days. And Pharaoh's tower and isle, removed of yore far from the land, now join it to the shore. Both Crete and Rhodes they left by north unseen, and sailed along the coasts of Afric lands, whose sea-towns fair but realms more inward been, all full of monsters and of desert sands. With her five cities then they left Cyrene, where that old temple of false Ammon stands. Next Ptolemaeus, and that sacred wood whence spring the silent streams of Lethe flood. The greater cert that sailors often cast in peril great of death and loss extreme they compassed round about, and safely passed. The Cape Judeca, and flood Magra's stream, then Tripoli, against which is Malta placed, that low and hid to lurk in seas doth seem. The little cert then, and Alzerbe's isle, where dwelt the folk that Lotus ate erewhile. Next Tunis, on the crooked shore they spied, whose bay a rock on either side defends. Tunis, all towns in beauty, wealth, and pride above, as far as Libya's bounds extends, gainst which, from fair Sicilia's fertile side, his rugged front, great Lilibium bends. The dame there pointed out where sometimes stood Rome's stately rival whilom, Carthage proud. Great Carthage, blow in ashes cold doth lie, her ruins poor the herbs in height scant pass. So cities fall, so perish kingdoms high, their pride and pomp lies hid in sand and grass. Then why should mortal man repine to die, whose life is air, breath, wind, and body glass? From thence the seas, next Bizzard's walls, they cleft, 
and fair Sardinia on their right hand left. Numidia's mighty plains they coasted then, Where wandering shepherds used their flocks to feed. Then Bugia and Algiers, the infamous den of pirates false, Oran they left with speed. All Tingitan they swiftly overran, Where elephants and angry lions breed, Where now the realms of Fez and Morocco be, Gainst which Granada's shores and coasts they see. Now are they there, where first the sea break in by great Alcides' help, as stories feign. True may it be, that where those floods begin, it whilom was a firm and solid main, before the sea there through did passage win, and parted Afric from the land of Spain. Abila hence, thence Calpe great upsprings, such power hath time to change the face of things. Four times the sun had spread his morning ray, Since first the dame launched forth her wondrous barge, And never yet took port in creek or bay, But fairly forward bore the knights her charge. Now through the strait her jolly ship made way, And boldly sailed upon the ocean large. But if the sea in midst of earth was great, Oh, what was this wherein earth hath her seat? Now deep engulfed in the mighty flood, They saw not Gades nor the mountains near, Fled was the land and towns on land that stood, Heaven-covered sea, sea seemed the heavens to bear. At last, fair lady, quoth Ubaldo good, That in this endless main doth guide us here, If ever man before here sailed, tell, Or other lands here be wherein men dwell. Great Hercules, quoth she, when he had quelled the monsters fierce in Africa and in Spain, and all along your coasts and countries sailed, yet durst he not assay the ocean main. Within his pillars would he have impaled the overdaring wit of mankind vain, till Lord Ulysses did those bounders pass to see and know he so desirous was. He passed those pillars, and in open wave of the broad sea first his bold sails untwined. But yet the greedy ocean was his grave, not helped him his skill gainst tide and wine. With him all witness of his voyage brave lies buried there. No truth thereof we find, and they whom storm hath forced that way since are drowned all or unreturned from thence so that this mighty sea is yet unsought where thousand isles and kingdoms lie unknown not void of men as some have vainly thought but peopled well and wanted like your own the land is fertile ground but scant well wrought air wholesome temperate sun grass proudly grown but quoth ubaldo dame i pray thee teach of that hid world what be the laws and speech as diverse be their nations, answered she, Their tongues, their rights, their laws so different are. Some pray to beasts, some to a stone or tree, Some to the earth, the sun, or morning star. Their meats unwholesome, vile, and hateful be. Some eat man's flesh, and captives ta'en in war, And all from Calpe's mountain west that dwell, In faith profane, in life are rude and fell. But will our gracious god the knight replied that with his blood all sinful men hath bought his truth for ever and his gospel hide from all those lands as yet unknown unsought oh no quoth she his name both far and wide shall there be known all learning thither brought nor shall these long and tedious ways for ever your world and theirs their lands your kingdom sever the time shall come that sailors shall disdain to talk or argue of Alcides' strait. The lands and seas that nameless yet remain shall well be known, their boundaries, sight and seat. The ships encompass shall the solid main, as far as seas outreach their waters great, and measure all the world, and with the sun about this earth, this globe, this compass run. A knight of genes shall have the hardiment upon this wondrous voyage first to wend, nor winds nor waves that ships in sunder rent, nor seas unused, strange climbed, or pool unkenned, nor other peril nor astonishment that makes frail hearts of men to bow and bend within Abila's strait shall keep and hold the noble spirit of this sailor bold. Thy ship, Columbus, 
shall her canvas wing spread o'er that world that yet concealed lies that scant swift fame her looks shall after bring though thousand plumes she have and thousand eyes let her of bacchus and alcides sing of thee to future age let this suffice that of thine acts she some forewarning give which shall in verse and noble story live thus talking swift twixt south and west they run and slice it out twixt froth and foam their way at once they saw before the setting sun behind the rising beam of springing day and when the morn her drops and dews begun to scatter broad upon the flowering lay far off a hill and mountain high they spied whose tops the cloud environ clothe and hide and drawing near the hill at ease they view when all the clouds were molten fallen and fled whose top pyramid wise did pointed show high narrow sharp the sides yet more outspread thence now and then fire flame and smoke out flew as from that hill where under lies in bed enceladus whence with imperious sway bright fire breaks out by night black smoke by day about the hill lay other islands small where other rocks crags cliffs and mountains stood the isles fortunate the elder times did call to which high heaven they feigned so kind and good and of his blessings rich so liberal that without tillage earth gives corn for food and grapes that swell with sweet and precious wine there without pruning yields the fertile vine the olive fat there ever buds and flowers the honey drops from hollow oaks distill the falling brook her silver streams down pours with gentle murmur from their native hill the western blast tempereth with dews and showers the sunny rays lest heat the blossoms kill the fields elision as fond heathens fain were there where souls of men in bliss remain to these their pilots steered and now quoth she your voyage long to end is brought well near the happy isles of fortune now you see of which great fame and little truth you hear sweet wholesome pleasant fertile fat they be yet not so rich as fame reports they were this said towards an island fresh she bore the first of ten that lie next afric's shore when charles thus if worthy governess to our good speed such tarriance be not let upon this isle that heaven so fair doth bless to view the place on land a while us set to know the folk and what god they confess and all whereby man's heart may knowledge get that i may tell the wonders therein seen another day and say there have i been she answered him well fits this high desire thy noble heart yet cannot i consent for heaven's decree firm stable and entire thy wish repugns and gainst thy will is bent nor yet the time hath titan's gliding fire met forth prefixed for this discoverment and nor is it lawful of the ocean main that you the secrets know or known explain to you without a needle map or card it's given to pass these seas and there arrive where in strong prison lies your knight embarred and of her prey you must the witch deprive if further to aspire you be prepared in vain gainst fate and heaven's decree you strive while thus she said the first seen isle gave place and high and rough the second showed his face they saw how eastward stretched in order long the happy islands sweetly flowering lay and how the seas betwixt those isles in throng and how they shouldered land from land away in seven of them the people rude among the shady trees their sheds had built of clay the rest lay waste unless wild beasts unseen or wanton nymphs roamed on the mountains green a secret place they found in one of those where the cleft shore sea in his bosom takes and twixt his stretched arms doth fold and close an ample bay a rock the haven makes which to the main doth his broad back oppose whereon the roaring billow cleaves and breaks 
and here and there two crags like turrets high point forth a port to all that sail thereby the quiet seas below lie safe and still the green wood like a garland grows aloft sweet caves within cool shades and waters shrill where lie the nymphs on moss and ivy soft no anchor there needs hold her frigate still nor cable twisted sure though breaking oft into this desert silent quiet glade entered the dame and there her heaven made the palace proudly built quoth she behold that sits on top of yonder mountain's height of christ's true faith there lies the champion bold in idleness love fancy folly light when phoebus shall his rising beams unfold prepare you gainst the hill to mount upright nor let this stay in your bold hearts breed care for save that one all ours unlucky are but yet this evening if you make good speed to that hill's foot with daylight might you pass thus said the dame their guide and they agreed and took their leave and leaped forth on the grass they found the way that to the hill doth lead and softly went that neither tired was but at the mountain's foot they both arrived before the sun his team in waters dived they saw how from the crags and clefts below his proud and stately pleasant top grew out and how his sides were clad with frost and snow the height was green with herbs and flowerets sout like hairy locks the trees about him grow the rocks of ice keep watch and ward about the tender roses and the lilies new thus art can nature change and kind subdue within a thick a dark and shady plot at the hill's foot that night the warriors dwell but when the sun his rays bright shining hot to spread of golden light the eternal well up up they cried and fiercely up they got and climbed boldly against the mountain fell but forth there crept from whence i cannot say an ugly serpent which forestalled their way armed with golden scales his head and crest he lifted high his neck swelled great with ire flamed his eyes and hiding with his breast all the broad path he poison breathed and fire now reached he forth in folds and forward pressed now would he back in rolls and heaps retire thus he presents himself to guard the place the knights pressed forward with assured pace charles drew forth his brand to strike the snake ubaldo cried stay my companion dear will you with sword or weapon battle make against this monster that affronts us here this said he gan his charmed rod to shake so that the serpent durst not hiss for fear but fled and dead for dread fell on the grass and so the passage plain eath open was a little higher on the way they met a lion fierce that hugely roared and cried his crest he reared high and open set of his broad gaping jaws the furnace wide his stern his back oft smote his rage to whet but when the sacred staff he once espied a trembling fear through his bold heart was spread his native wrath was gone and swift he fled the hardy couple on their way forth went and met a host that on them roar and gape of savage beasts to fore unseen unkenned differing in voice in semblance and in shape all monsters which hot afric doth forth send twixt nilus atlas and the southern cape were all there met and all wild beasts besides hyrcania breeds or hyrcan forest hides but yet that fierce that strange and savage host could not in presence of those worthies stand but fled away their heart and courage lost when lord obaldo shook his charming wand no other let their passage stopped or crossed till on the mountain's top themselves they fanned save that the ice the frost and drifted snow oft made them feeble weary faint and slow and having passed all that frozen ground and overgone that winter sharp and keen a warm mild pleasant gentle sky they found that overspread a large and ample green 
the winds breathe spikenard, myrrh, and balm around, the blasts there firm, unchanged, stable been, not as elsewhere the winds now rise, now fall, and Phoebus there I shine, sets not at all, not as elsewhere now sunshine bright, now showers, now heat, now cold, there interchanged were, but everlasting spring mild heaven down pours, in which nor rain, nor storm, nor clouds appear, nursing to fields their grass, to grass his flowers, to flowers their smell, to trees the leaves they bear. There by a lake a stately palace stands that overlooks all mountains, seas, and lands. The passage hard against the mountains steep these travelers had faint and weary made, that through those grassy plains they scantly creep, they walked, they rested oft, they went, they stayed. When from the rocks that seemed for joy to weep, before their feet a dropping crystal played, enticing them to drink, and on the flowers the plenteous spring a thousand streams down pours, all which united in the springing grass ate forth a channel through the tender green, and underneath eternal shade did pass with murmur shrill, cold, pure, and scantly seen, yet so transparent that perceived was the bottom rich, the sands that golden been, and on the brims the silken grass aloft proffered them seats sweet, easy, fresh, and soft. See here the stream of laughter, see the spring, quoth they, of danger and of deadly pain. Here fond desire must by fair governing be ruled, our lust bridled with wisdom's rein. Our ears be stopped while these sirens sing, their notes enticing men to pleasure vain. Thus passed they forward where the stream did make an ample pond, a large and spacious lake. There on the table was all dainty food that sea, that earth, or liquid air could give, and in the crystal of the laughing flood they saw two naked virgins bathe and dive, that sometimes toying, sometimes wrestling stood, sometimes for speed and skill in swimming strive. Now underneath they dived, now rose above, and ticing baits laid forth of lust and love. These naked wantons, tender, fair, and white, moved so far the warrior's stubborn hearts, that on their shapes they gazed with delight. The nymphs applied their sweet, alluring arts, and one of them above the waters quite lift up her head, her breasts, and higher parts, and all that might weak eyes subdue and take. Her lower beauties veiled the gentle lake. As when the morning star escaped and fled from greedy waves, with dewy beams up flies, or as the queen of love, newborn and bred, of the ocean's fruitful froth did first arise, so vented she her golden locks forth spread round pearls and crystal moist therein which lies. But when her eyes upon the nights she cast, she start and feigned her of their sight aghast. And her fair locks, that in a knot were tied high on her crown, she gan at large unfold, which falling long and thick and spreading wide, the ivory soft and white mantled in gold. Thus her fair skin the dame would clothe and hide, and that which hid it no less fair was hold. Thus clad in waves and locks, her eyes divine from them ashamed did she turn and twine. With all she smiled, and she blushed with all, her blush, her smiling, smiles, her blushing graced. Over her face her amber tresses fall, whereunder love himself in ambush placed. At last she warbled forth a treble small, and with sweet looks her sweet songs interlaced. O oh, happy men, that have the grace, quoth she, this bliss, this heaven, this paradise to see. This is the place wherein you may assuage your sorrows past. Here is that joy and bliss that flourished in the antique golden age. Here needs no law, here none doth aught amiss. Put off those arms, and fear not Mars's rage. Your sword, your shield, your helmet needless is. Then consecrate them here to endless rest. You shall love's champions be and soldiers blessed. 
the field for combat here are beds of down or heaped lilies under shady brakes but come and see our queen with golden crown that all her servants blessed and happy makes she will admit you gently for her own numbered with those that of her joy partakes but first within this lake your dust and sweat wash off and at that table sit and eat while thus she sung her sister lured them nigh with many a gesture kind and loving show to music sound as dames in court apply their cunning feet and dance now swift now slow but still the knights unmoved passed by these vain delights for wicked charms they know nor could their heavenly voice or angels look surprise their hearts if eye or ear they took for if that sweetness once but touched their hearts and proffered there to kindle cupid's fire straight armed reason to his charge upstarts and quencheth lust and killeth fond desire thus scorned were the dames their wiles and arts and to the palace gates the knights retire where in their streams the damsels dived sad ashamed disgraced for that repulse they had End of Book 15book 16 of Jerusalem delivered by Toquato Tasso translated by Edward Fairfax this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Thomas Copeland the argument the searchers pass through all the palace bright where in sweet prison lies Rinaldo pent, and do so much that full of rage and spite with them he goes, sad, shamed, discontent. With plaints and prayers to retain her knight Armida strives, he hears, but thence he went, and she forlorn her palace great and fair destroys for grief and flies thence through the air. The palace great is builded rich and round, and in the centre of the inmost hold there lies a garden sweet on fertile ground fairer than that where grew the trees of gold the cunning sprites had buildings reared around with doors and entries false a thousandfold a labyrinth they made that fortress brave like dedal's prison or porsena's grave the knights passed through the castle's largest gate though round about a hundred ports there shine the door leaves framed of carved silver plate upon their golden hinges turn and twine they stayed to view this work of wit and state the workmanship excelled the substance fine for all the shapes in that rich metal wrought save speech of living bodies wanted not alcides there sat telling tales and spun among the feeble troops of damsels mild he that the fiery gates of hell had won and heaven upheld false love stood by and smiled armed with his club fair iole forth run his club with blood of monsters foul defiled and on her back his lion's skin had she too rough a bark for such a tender tree beyond was made a sea whose azure flood the hoary froth crushed from the surges blue wherein two navies great well ranged stood of warlike ships fire from their arms out flew the waters burned about their vessels good such flames the gold therein enchased through caesar his romans hence the asian kings thence antony and indian princes brings the cyclades seemed to swim amid the main and hill gainst hill and mount gainst mountain smote with such great fury met those armies twain here burnt a ship there sunk a bark or boat here darts and wildfire flew there drowned or slain of princes dead the bodies fleet and float here caesar wins and yonder conquered been the eastern ships there fled the egyptian queen antonius eke himself to fight betook the empire lost to which he would aspire yet fled not he nor fight for fear forsook but followed her drawn on by fond desire well might you see within his troubled look strive and contend love courage shame and ire oft looked he back 
Oft gazed he on the fight, but oftener on his mistress and her flight. Then in the secret creeks of fruitful Nile, cast in her lap he would sad death await, and in the pleasure of her lovely smile sweeten the bitter stroke of cursed fate. All this did art with curious hand compile in the rich metal of that princely gate. The knights these stories viewed first and last, which seen they forward pressed, and in they passed. As through his channel crooked meander glides with turns and twines, and rolls now to now fro, whose streams run forth there to the salt seasides, here back return, and to their springward go, such crooked paths, such ways this palace hides, yet all the maze their map described so, that through the labyrinth they got in fine, as Theseus did by Ariadne's line. When they had passed all those troublous ways, the garden sweet spread forth her green to show. The moving crystal from the fountains plays, fair trees, high plants, strange herbs and flowerets new, sunshiny hills, dales hid from Phoebus' rays, groves, arbors, mossy caves, at once they view. And that which beauty most, most wonder brought, nowhere appeared the art which all this wrought. So with the rude the polished mingled was, that natural seemed all, and every part nature would craft in counterfeiting pass and imitate her imitator art. Mild was the air, the skies were clear as glass, the trees no whirlwind felt nor tempest smart, but ere the fruit drop off the blossom comes, this springs, that falls, that ripeneth, and this blooms. The leaves upon the selfsame bough did hide beside the young, the old and ripened fig. Here fruit was green, there ripe with vermil side. The apples new and old grew on one twig. The fruitful vine her arms spread high and wide, that bended underneath their clusters big. The grapes were tender here, hard, young, and sour. There purple ripe and nectar sweet forth pour. The joyous birds hid under greenwood shade, sung merry notes on every branch and bough. The wind that in the leaves and waters played, with murmur sweet now sang, and whistled now. Ceased the birds, the wind loud answer made, and while they sung it rumbled soft and low. Thus, were it hap or cunning, chance or art, the wind in this strange music bore his part. With party-colored plumes and purple bill, a wondrous bird among the rest there flew, that in plain speech sung lovelays loud and shrill. Her leaden was like human language true. So much she talked, and with such wit and skill, that strange it seemed how much good she knew. Her feathered fellows all stood hushed to hear. Dumb was the wind, the waters silent were. The gently budding rose, quoth she, behold, that first scant peeping forth with virgin beams, half ope, half shut, her beauties doth upfold in their dear leaves, and less seen fairer seems, and after spreads them forth more broad and bold, then languisheth and dies in last extremes, for seems the same that decked bed and bower of many a lady late and paramour. So in the passing of a day doth pass the bud and blossom of the life of man, nor air doth flourish more, but like the grass cut down, becometh withered, pale, and wan. O oh, gather then the rose, while time thou hast, short is the day, done when it scant began. Gather the rose of love while yet thou mayst, loving be loved, embracing be embraced. She ceased, and as approving all she spoke, the choir of birds their heavenly tunes renew. The turtles sighed, and sighs with kisses broke. The fowls to shades unseen by pairs withdrew. It seemed the laurel, chaste and stubborn oak, and all the gentle trees on earth that grew. It seemed the land, the sea, and heaven above, all breathed out fancy sweet, and sighed out love. Through all this music rare and strong consent of strange allurements, sweet, above mean and measure, Severe, firm, constant, 
Still the knights forth went, hardening their hearts gainst false enticing pleasure. Twixt leaf and leaf their sight before they sent, and after crept themselves at ease and leisure, till they beheld the queen set with their knight besides the lake, shaded with boughs from sight. Her breasts were naked, for the day was hot. Her locks unbound, waved in the wanton wind. Some deal she sweat, tired with the game, you wot. Her sweat drops bright, white, round, like pearls of eind. Her humid eyes a fiery smile forth shot, that like sunbeams in silver fountains shine. O'er him her look she hung, and her soft breast the pillow was where he and love took rest. His hungry eyes upon her face he fed, and feeding them so pined himself away. And she, declining often down her head, his lips, his cheeks, his eyes kissed as he lay, wherewith he sighed, as if his soul had fled from his frail breast to hers, and there would stay with her beloved sprite. The armed pair these follies all beheld, and this hot fair. Down by the lover's side their pendant was a crystal mirror, bright, pure, smooth, and neat. He rose, and to his mistress held the glass, a noble page graced with that service great. She with glad looks, he with inflamed, alas, beauty and love beheld both in one seat. Yet them in sundry objects each espies, she in the glass, he saw them in her eyes. Her to command, to serve it pleased the knight. He proud of bondage, of her empire she. My dear, he said, that blessest with thy sight even blessed angels, turn thine eyes to me, for painted in my heart and portrait right thy worth, thy beauties, and perfections be of which the form, the shape, and fashion best, not in this glass is seen, but in my breast. And if thou me disdain, yet be content, at least so to behold thy lovely hue, that while thereon thy looks are fixed and bent, thy happy eyes themselves may see and view. So rare a shape no crystal can present, no glass contain that heaven of beauties true. O oh, let the skies thy worthy mirror be, and in clear stars thy shape and image see. And with that word she smiled, and ne'ertheless her love toys still she used in pleasures bold. Her hair, that done, she twisted up in tress, and looser locks in silken laces rolled. Her curlers garlandwise she did updress, wherein, like rich enamel laid on gold, the twisted flowers smiled and her white breast the lilies there that spring with roses dressed. The jolly peacock spreads not half so fair the eyed feathers of his pompous train, nor golden iris so bends in the air her twenty-colored bow through clouds of rain. Yet all her ornaments, strange, rich, and rare, her girdle did in price and beauty stain. Not that with scorn which Tuscan Guilla lost, nor Venus Seston could match this for cost. Of mild denays, of tender scorns, of sweet repulses, war, peace, hope, despair, joy, fear, of smiles, jests, mirth, woe, grief, and sad regret, sighs, sorrows, tears, embracements, kisses dear, that mixed first by weight and measure meet, then at an easy fire attempered were, this wondrous girdle did Armida frame, and when she would be loved, wore the same. But when her wooing fit was brought to end, she congee took, kissed him, and went her way. For once she used it every day to win bout her affairs, her spells and charms to say. The youth remained, yet had no power to bend one step from thence, but used it there to stray amongst the sweet birds, through every walk and grove, alone, save for a hermit false called love. And when the silence deep and friendly shade recalled the lovers to their wonted sport, in a fair room for pleasure built they laid, and longest nights with joys made sweet and short. Now while the queen her household things surveyed, and left her lord her garden and disport, the twain, that hidden in the bushes were, before the prince in glistering arms appear. 
as the fierce steed for age withdrawn from war wherein the glorious beast had always won that in vile rest from fight sequestered far feeds with the mares at large his service done if arms he see or hear the trumpet's jar he neigheth loud and thither fast doth run and wisheth on his back the armed knight longing for juists for tournaments and fight so fared rinaldo when the glorious light of their bright harness glistered in his eyes his noble sprite awaked at that sight his blood began to warm his heart to rise though drunk with ease devoid of wonted might on sleep till then his weakened virtue lies Ubaldo forward stepped, and to him held of diamonds clear that pure and precious shield. Upon the targe his looks amazed he bent, and therein all his wanton habit spied, his civet, balm, and perfumes redolent, how from his locks they smoked and mantle wide. His sword, that many a pagan stout had shent, bewrapped with flowers hung idly by his side, so nicely decked that it seemed the knight wore it for fashion's sake but not for fight as when from sleep and idle dreams abraid a man awaked calls home his wits again so in beholding his attire he played but yet to view himself could not sustain his looks he downward cast and not he said grieved shame it sad he would have died fain and oft he wished the earth or ocean wide would swallow him and so his errors hide Ubaldo took the time, and thus begun. All Europe now and Asia be in war, And all that Christ adore and fame have won In battle strong in Syria fighting are. But thee alone, Bertoldo's noble son, This little corner keeps, exiled far from all the world, Buried in sloth and shame, A carpet champion for a wanton dame. What lethargy hath in drowsiness up End thy courage thus what sloth doth thee infect up up our camp and godfrey for thee send thee fortune praise and victory expect come fatal champion bring to happy end this enterprise begun and all that sect which oft thou shaken hast to earth full low with thy sharp brand strike down kill overthrow this said the noble infant stood a space confused speechless senseless ill ashamed but when that shame to just disdain gave place to fierce disdain from courage sprung untamed another redness blushed through his face whence worthy anger shone displeasure flamed his nice attire in scorn he rent and tore for of his bondage vile that witness bore that done he hasted from the charmed fort and through the maze passed with his searchers twain armida of her mount and chiefest court wondered to find the furious keeper slain a while she feared but she knew in short that her dear lord was fled then saw she plain ah woeful sight how from her gates the man in haste in fear in wrath in anger ran whither o oh, cruel leav'st thou me alone she would have cried her grief her speeches stayed so that her woeful words are backward gone and in her heart a bitter echo made poor soul of greater skill than she was one whose knowledge from her thus her joy conveyed this wist she well yet had desire to prove if art could keep if charms recall her love all that the witches of thessalia land with lips unpure yet ever said or spake words that could make heaven's rolling circles stand and draw the damned ghosts from limbo lake all well she knew but yet no time she fanned to use her knowledge or her charms to make but left her arts and forth she ran to prove if single beauty were best charm for love she ran nor of her honor took regard oh where be all her vaunts and triumphs now love's empire great of late she made or marred to her his subjects humbly bend and bow and with her pride mixed was a scorn so hard that to be loved she loved yet whilst they woo her lovers all she hates that pleased her will to conquer men and conquered so to kill but now herself disdained abandoned ran after him that from her fled in scorn and her despised beauty labored with humble plaints and prayers to adorn 
she ran and hasted after him that fled through frost and snow through briar bush and thorn and sent her cries on message her before that reached not him till he had reached the shore o oh, thou that leavest but half behind quoth she of my poor heart and half with thee dost carry o oh, take this part or render that to me else kill them both at once ah oh, tarry tarry hear my last words no parting kiss of thee i crave for some more fit with thee to marry keep them unkind what fearst thou if thou stay thou mayst deny as well as run away at this rinaldo stopped stood still and stayed she came sad breathless weary faint and weak so woe begone was never nymph or maid and yet her beauty's pride grief could not break on him she looked she gazed but not she said she would not could not or she durst not speak at her he looked not glanced not if he did those glances shamefast were close secret hid as cunning singers ere they strain on high in loud melodious tunes their gentle voice prepare the hearer's ears to harmony with feigning sweet low notes and warbles choice so she not having yet forgot pretty her wanted shifts and slights in cupid's toys a sequence first of sighs and sobs forth cast to breed compassion dear then spake at last suppose not cruel that i come to woo or praise ladies do their loves and lords such were we late if thou disdain it now or scorn to grant such grace as love affords at least yet as an enemy listen thou sworn foes sometimes will talk and chaffer words for what i ask thee mayst thou grant right well and lessen not thy wrath and anger fell if me thou hate and in that hate delight i come not to appease thee hate me still it's like for like i bore great hate and spite gainst christians all chiefly i wish thee ill i was a pagan born and all my might against Godfredo bent, mine art and skill. I followed thee, took thee, and bore thee far to this strange isle, and kept thee safe from war. And more, which more thy hate may justly move, more to thy loss, more to thy shame and grief, I thee enchanted and allured to love. Wicked deceit, craft worthy sharp reprief, mine honor gave I thee, all gifts above and of my beauties made thee lord and chief and to my suitors old what i denied that gave i thee my lover new unprayed but reckon that among my faults and let those many wrongs provoke thee so to wrath that hence thou run and that at naught thou set this pleasant house so many joys which hath go travel pass the seas fight conquest get destroy our faith what shall i say our faith ah no no longer ours before thy shrine alone i pray thou cruel saint of mine ah only let me go with thee unkind a small request although i were thy foe the spoiler seldom leaves the prey behind who triumphs lets his captives with him go among thy prisoners poor armada bind and let the camp increase thy praises so that thy beguiler so thou couldst beguile and point at me thy thrall and bond-slave vile despised bond-slave since my lord doth hate these locks why keep i them or hold them dear come cut them off that to my servile state my habit answer may and all my gear i follow thee in spite of death and fate through battles fierce where dangers most appear courage i have and strength enough perchance to lead thy courser spare and bear thy lance i will or bear or be myself thy shield and to defend thy life will lose mine own this breast this bosom soft shall be thy beeld gainst storms of arrows darts and weapons thrown thy foes pardie encountering thee in field will spare to strike thee mine affection known lest me they wound or will sharp vengeance take on thee for this despised beauty's sake o oh, wretch 
dare I still vaunt or help invoke from this poor beauty, scorned and disdained? She said no more. Her tears her speeches broke, which from her eyes like streams from springs down rained. She would have caught him by the hand or cloak, but he stepped backward and himself restrained. Conquered his will, his heart Ruth softened not. There plaints no issue, love no entrance got. Love entered not to kindle in his breast, which reason late had quenched his wonted flame. Yet entered pity, in the place at least, love's sister, but a chaste and sober dame, and stirred him so that hardly he suppressed the springing tears that to his eyes up came. But yet, e'en there his plaints repressed were, and as he could, he looked and feigned cheer. Madam, quoth he, for your distress I grieve, and would amend it if I might or could. From your wise heart that fond affection drive. I cannot hate nor scorn you, though I would. I seek no vengeance. Wrongs I all forgive. Nor you my servant, nor my foe, I hold. Truth is, you erred, and your estate forgot. Too great your hate was, and your love too hot. But those are common faults, and faults of kind excused by nature, by your sex, and years. I erred likewise. If I pardon find, none can condemn you that our trespass hears. Your dear remembrance will I keep in mind, in joys, in woes, in comforts, hopes, and fears. Call me your soldier and your knight, as far as Christian faith permits, and Asia's war. Ah, let our faults and follies here take end, and let our errors past you satisfy. And in this angle of the world depend, let both the fame and shame thereof now die. From all the earth where I am known and kenned, I wish this fact should yet concealed lie. Nor yet in following me, poor knight, disgrace your worth, your beauty, and your princely race. Stay here in peace. I go, nor wend you may with me, my guide your fellowship denies. Stay here, or hence depart some better way, and calm your thoughts, you are both sage and wise. While thus he spoke, her passions found no stay, but here and there she turned and rolled her eyes, and staring on his face a while, at last, thus in foul terms, her bitter wrath forth brast. Of Sophia fair thou never wert the child, nor of the Azine race is sprung thou art. The mad sea waves thee bear, some tigress wild on Caucasus cold crags nursed thee apart. Ah, cruel man, in whom no token mild appears of pity, ruth, or tender heart. Could not my griefs, my woes, my plaints, and all, one sigh strain from thy breast, one tear make fall? What shall I say, or how renew my speech? He scorns me, leaves me, bids me call him mine. The victor hath his foe within his reach, yet pardons her that merits death and pine. Hear how he counsels me, how he can preach, O oh, chaste Xenocrates, gainst love divine. O oh, heavens, O oh, gods, why do these men of shame thus spoil your temples and blaspheme your name? Go, cruel, go, go with such peace, such rest, such joy, such comfort as thou leavest me here. My angry soul discharged from this weak breast shall haunt thee ever and attend thee near, and fury-like in snakes and firebrands dressed shall a torment thee whom it late held dear. And if thou scape the seas, the rocks and sands, and come to fight among the pagan bands, there lying wounded amongst the hurt and slain, of these my wrongs thou shalt the vengeance bear, and oft Armida shalt thou call in vain at thy last gasp. This hope I soon to hear. Here fainted she, with sorrow, grief, and pain. Her latest words scant well expressed were, but in a swoon on earth outstretched she lies. Stiff were her frozen limbs, closed were her eyes. Thou closed thine eyes, Armida. Heaven envied ease to thy grief or comfort to thy woe. Ah, open them again. See tears down slide from his kind eyes whom thou esteemst thy foe. 
if thou hadst heard, his sighs had mollified thine anger hard, he sighed and mourned so, and as he could, with sad and rueful look, his leave of thee and last farewell he took. What should he do? Leave on the naked sand this woeful lady, half alive, half dead? Kindness forbade, pity did that withstand. But hard constraint, alas, did thence him lead. Away he went, the west wind blew from land Mongst the rich tresses of their pilot's head, And with that golden sail the waves she cleft. To land he looked, till land unseen he left. Waked from her trance, forsaken, speechless, sad, Armida wildly stared and gazed about. And is he gone, quoth she, nor pity had To leave me thus twixt life and death in doubt? Could he not stay, could not the traitor lad From this last trance help or recall me out? And do I love him still, and on this sand, Still on revenge, still mourn, still weeping, stand? Fie, no! Complaints farewell, with arms and art I will pursue to death the spiteful knight. Not earth's low center nor sea's deepest part, not heaven nor hell can shield him from my might. I will o'ertake him, take him, cleave his heart. Such vengeance fits a wronged lover's spite. In cruelty that cruel knight surpass I will. But what avail vain words, alas, O oh, fool! Thou shouldest have been cruel then, For then this cruel well deserved thine ire, When thou in prison hadst entrapped the man. Now, dead with cold, too late thou askest fire, But though I wit my cunning nothing can, Some other means shall work my heart's desire. To thee, my beauty, thine be all these wrongs, Vengeance to thee, to thee revenge belong. Thou shalt be his reward with murdering brand That dare this traitor of his head deprive. O oh, you, my lovers, on this rock doth stand The castle of her love for whom you strive. I, the sole heir of all Damascus land, For this revenge myself and kingdom give. If by this price my will I cannot gain, Nature gives beauty, fortune, wealth in vain. But thee, vain gift, vain beauty, thee I scorn. I hate the kingdom which I have to give. I hate myself and rue that I was born. Only in hope of sweet revenge I live. Thus raging with fell ire, she gan return from that bare shore in haste and homeward drive. And as true witness of her frantic ire, her locks waved loose, face shone, eyes sparkled fire. When she came home, she called with outcries shrill A thousand devils in limbo deep that won. Black clouds the skies with horrid darkness fill, And pale for dread became the eclipsed sun. The whirlwind blustered big on every hill, And hell to roar under her feet begun. You might have heard how through the palace wide Some spirits howled, some barked, some hissed, some cried. A shadow blacker than the murkest night Environed all the place with darkness sad, Wherein a firebrand gave a dreadful light Kindled in hell by Tisiphone the mad. Vanished the shade, the sun appeared in sight, Pale were his beams, the air was nothing glad, And all the palace vanished was and gone, Nor of so great a work was left one stone. As oft the clouds frame shapes of castles great amid the air, that little time do last, but are dissolved by wind or titan's heat, or like vain dreams soon made and sooner past, the palace vanished so, nor in his seat left aught but rocks and crags by kind there placed. She in her coach, which two old serpents drew, sat down, and as she used, away she flew. She broke the clouds and cleft the yielding sky, And bout her gathered tempest, storm, and wine. The lands that view the south pole flew she by, And left those unknown countries far behind. The straits of Hercules she passed, Which lie twixt Spain and Afric. Nor her flight inclined to north or south, But still did forward ride o'er seas and streams, Till Syria's coasts she spied. 
nor went she forward to Damascus fair, but of her country dear she fled the sight, and guided to Asphalti's lake her chair, where stood her castle, there she ends her flight, and from her damsel's fair she made repair to a deep vault, far from resort and light, where in sad thoughts a thousand doubts she cast, till grief and shame to wrath gave place at last. I will not hence, quoth she, till Egypt's lord, in aid of science king, his host shall move. Then will I use all helps that charms afford, and change my shape or sex, if so behoove. Well can I handle bow, or lance, or sword. The worthies all will aid me for my love. I seek revenge, and to obtain the same, farewell regard of honor, farewell shame. Nor let mine uncle and protector me reprove for this. He most deserves the blame. My heart and sex, that weak and tender be, he bent to deeds that maidens ill became. His niece, a wandering damsel, first made he. He spurred my youth, and I cast off my shame. His be the fault, if aught gainst mine estate I did for love, or shall commit for hate. This said, her knights, her ladies, pages, squires, she all assembleth, and for journey fit, in such fair arms and vestures them attires, as showed her wealth and well declared her wit, and forward marched full of strange desires. Nor rested she by day or night one whit, till she came there where all the eastern bands, their kings and princes, lay on Gaza's sands. End of Book Sixteen Book Seventeen of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument. Egypt's great host in battle ray forth brought, the Caliph sends with Godfrey's power to fight. Armida, who Rinaldo's ruin sought, to them adjoins herself and Syria's might. To satisfy her cruel will and thought, she gives herself to him that kills her knight. He takes his fatal arms, and in his shield his ancestors and their great deeds be healed. Gaza, the city, on the frontier stands of Judah's realm, as men to Egypt ride, built near the sea. Beside it, of dry sands, huge wildernesses lie, and deserts wide, which the strong winds lift from the parched lands and toss like roaring waves in roughest tide, that from those storms poor passengers almost no refuge find, but there are drowned and lost. Within this town, one from the Turks of yore, strong garrison the king of Egypt placed, and for it nearer was, and fitted more that high emprise to which his thoughts he cast, he left great Memphis, and to Gaza bore his regal throne and there from countries vast of his huge empire all the puissant host assembled he and mustered on the coast come say my muse what manner times these were and in those times how stood the state of things what power this monarch had what arms they bear what nation subject and what friends he brings for from all lands the southern ocean near or morning star came princes dukes and kings and only thou, of half the world well nigh, the armies, lords, and captains canst descry. When Egypt, from the Greekish emperor rebelled first, and Christ's true faith denied, of Mahomet's descent a warrior there set his throne, and ruled that kingdom wide. Caliph he hight, and caliphs since that hour are his successors named all beside. So Nilus old his kings long time had seen, That Ptolemies and Pharaohs called had been. Established was that kingdom in short while, And grew so great, that over Asia's lands And Libya's realms it stretched many a mile, From Syria's coasts as far as Cyrene stands, And southward passed against the course of Nile, Through the hot clime where burnt Syene stands. Hence bounded in with sandy deserts waste, and thence with Euphrates rich flood embraced. Marema, myrrh and spices that doth bring, and all the rich red sea it comprehends, 
and to those lands toward the morning spring that lie beyond that gulf it far extends great is that empire greater by the king that rules it now whose worth the land amends and makes more famous lord thereof by blood by wisdom valor and all virtues good with turks and persians war he oft did wage and oft he won and sometime lost the field nor could his adverse fortune aught assuage his valor's heat or make his proud heart yield but when he grew unfit for war through age he sheathed his sword and laid aside his shield but yet his warlike mind he laid not down nor his great thirst of rule praise and renown but by his knights still cruel wars maintained so wise his word so quick his wit appears that of the kingdom large o'er which he reigned the charge seemed not too weighty for his years his greatness afric's lesser kings constrained to tremble at his name all inned him fears and other realms that would his friendship hold some armed soldiers sent some gifts some gold this mighty prince assembled had the flower of all his realms against the frenchmen stout to break their rising empire and their power nor of sure conquest had he fear or doubt to him armida came even at the hour when in the plains old gaza's walls without the lords and leaders all their armies bring in battle ray mustered before their king he on his throne was set to which on height who clomb an hundred ivory stairs first told under a pentis wrought of silver bright and trod on carpets made of silk and gold his robes were such as best beseemen might a king so great so grave so rich so old and twined of sixty ells of lawn and more a turban strange adorned his tresses hoar his right hand did his precious sceptre wield his beard was gray his looks severe and grave and from his eyes not yet made dim with yield sparkled his former worth and vigor brave his gestures all the majesty upheeled and state as his old age and empire crave so phidias carved apelles so pretty erst painted jove jove thundering down from sky on either side him stood a noble lord whereof the first held in his upright hand of severe justice the unpartial sword the other bare the seal and causes scanned keeping his folk in peace and good accord and termed was lord chancellor of the land but marshal was the first and used to lead his armies forth to war oft with good speed of bold circassians with their halberds long about his throne his guard stood in a ring all richly armed in golden corslets strong and by their sides their crooked swords down hing thus set thus seated his grave lords among his hosts and armies great beheld the king and every band as by his throne it went their ensigns low inclined and arms down bent their squadrons first the men of egypt show in four troops and each his several guide of the high country two two of the low which nile had won out of the salt seaside his fertile slime first stopped the water's flow then hardened to firm land the plough to bide so egypt still increased within far placed that part is now where ships erst anchor cast the foremost band the people were that dwelled in alexandria's rich and fertile plain along the western shore where nile expelled the greedy billows of the swelling main araspes was their guide who more excelled in wit and craft than strength or warlike pain to place an ambush close or to devise a treason false was none so sly so wise the people next that gainst the morning rays along the coast of asia have their seat arontes led them whom no warlike praise ennobled but high birth and titles great his helm ne'er made him sweat in toilsome phrase nor was his sleep e'er broke with trumpet's threat but from soft ease to try the toil of fight his fond ambition brought this carpet night the third seemed not a troop or squadron small but a huge host nor seemed it so much grain in egypt grew as to sustain them all 
Yet from one town thereof came all that train, A town in people to huge shires equal, That did a thousand streets and more contain. Great care it hight, whose commons from each side Came swarming out to war, Campson their guide. Next under Gazel marched they that plowed the fertile lands above that town which lie, up to the place where Nilus, tumbling low, falls from his second cataract on high. The Egyptians weaponed were with sword and bow, no weight of helm or hauberk list they try, and richly armed in their strong foes, no dread of death, but great desire of spoil they breed. The naked folk of Barca these succeed, unarmed half. Alarcon led that band that long in deserts lived in extreme need, on spoils and preys purchased by strength of hand. To battle strong, unfit, their king did lead his army next, brought from Zumara land. Then he of Tripoli, for sudden fight and skirmish short, both ready, bold, and light. Two captains next brought forth their bands to show, whom Stony sent and happy Araby which never felt the cold of frost and snow, or force of burning heat, unless fame lie, where incense pure and all sweet odors grow, where the soul phoenix doth revive, not die, and midst the perfumes rich and flowerets brave, both birth and burial, cradle hath and grave. Their clothes not rich, their garments were not gay, but weapons like the Egyptian troops they had. The Arabians next, that have no certain stay, no house, no home, no mansion, good or bad, but ever, as the Scythian horde astray, from place to place their wandering cities gad. These have both voice and stature feminine, hair long and black, black face and fiery eyne. Long Indian canes with iron armed they bear, and as upon their nimble steeds they ride, like a swift storm their speedy troops appear, if wind so fast brings storms from heavens wide. By Syphax led the first Arabians were, Aldine the second squadron had to guide, and Abiazar proud brought to the fight the third, a thief, a murderer, not a knight. The islanders came then their prince before, whose lands Arabia's gulf enclosed about, wherein they fish and gather oysters store, whose shells great pearls rich and round pour out. The Red Sea sent with them from his left shore, of negroes grim, a black and ugly rout. These agricult, and those Osmida brought, a man that set law, faith, and truth at naught. The Ethiops next, which Meroe doth breed, that sweet and gentle isle of Meroe, twixt Nile and Astrabor that far doth spread, where two religions are and kingdoms three. These Asimiro and Canario led, both kings, both pagans, and both subjects be to the great caliph. But the third king kept Christ's sacred faith, nor to these wars outstepped. After two kings, both subject also ride, and of two bands the archers had the charge. The first soldan of Orms placed in the wide, huge Persian bay a town rich, fair, and large, the last of Beacon, which at every tide the sea cuts off from Persia's southern marge and makes an isle. But when it ebbs again, the passage there is sandy, dry, and plain. Nor thee, great Altamore, in her chaste bed thy loving queen kept with her dear embrace, she tore her locks, she smote her breast, and shed salt tears to make thee stay in that sweet place. Seem the rough seas more calm, cruel, she said, than the mild looks of thy kind spouse's face? Or is thy shield with blood and dust defiled a dearer armful than thy tender child? This was the mighty king of Samarkand, a captain wise, well skilled in feats of war, in courage fierce matchless for strength of hand, great was his praise, his force was noised far, his worth right well the Frenchmen understand, by whom his virtues feared and loved are. His men were armed with helms and hauberks strong, and by their sides broad swords and maces hung. Then from the mansions bright of fresh aurora, Adrastus came, 
the glorious king of Ind, a snake's green skin spotted with black he wore, that was made rich by art and hard by kind. An elephant this furious giant bore, he fierce as fire, his mounture swift as wind. Much people brought he from his kingdoms wide, twixt Indus, Ganges, and the salt seaside. The king's own troops came next, a chosen crew, of all the camp, the strength, the crown, the flower, wherein each soldier had with honors due rewarded been for service ere that hour. Their arms were strong for need and fair for show. Upon fierce steeds well mounted rode this power, and heaven itself with the clear splendor shone of their bright armor, purple, gold, and stone. Amongst these Alcaro fierce, and Odomer the muster master was, and Hidreort, and Rimadon, whose rashness took no care to shun death's bitter stroke in field or fort. Tigranes, Rapold's stern, the men that fare by sea, that robbed in each creek and port, Ormond and Marlebust, the Arabian named, because that land rebellious he reclaimed. There Pyrga, Araman, Orinda are, Grimart the scaler, and with him Swifont, the breaker of wild horses brought from far, then the great wrestler, strong Aridament, and Tisiphern, the thunderbolt of war, whom none surpassed, whom none to match durst vaunt at tilt, at tourney, or in combat brave, with spear or lance, with sword, with mace or glaive. A false Armenian did this squadron guide, that in his youth from Christ's true faith and light to the blind lore of paganism did slide, that Clement late, now Emerino hight. Yet to his king he faithful was and tried, true in all causes, his in wrong and right, a cunning leader and a soldier bold, for strength and courage young, for wisdom old. When all these regiments were past and gone, appeared our mind, and came her troop to show, set in a chariot bright with precious stone, her gown tucked up, and in her hand a bow. In her sweet face her new displeasures shone mixed with the native beauties there which grow, and quickened so her looks, that in sharp wise it seemed she threats, and yet her threats entice. Her chariot, like Aurora's glorious wane, with carbuncles and jacinths glistered round. Her coachman guided with the golden rein four unicorns by couples yoked and bound, of squires and lovely ladies hundreds twain, whose rattling quivers at their backs resound, on milk-white steeds wait on the chariot bright their steeds to manage ready, swift to flight. Followed her troop, led forth by Aradin, which Hidriort from Syria's kingdom sent. As when the newborn phoenix doth begin to fly to Ethiop ward, at the fair bent of her rich wings, strange plumes and feathers thin, her crowns and chains with native gold besprent, the world amazed stands, and with her fly a host of wandering birds that sing and cry. So passed Armida, looked on, gazed on so, a wondrous dame in habit, gesture, face. There lived no wight to love so great a foe, but wished and longed those beauties to embrace. Scant seen, with anger sullen, sad for woe, she conquered all the lords and knights in place. What would she do, her sorrows past, think you, when her fair eyes, her looks, and smiles shall woo? She passed, the king commanded Emeren of his rich throne to mount the lofty stage, to whom his host, his army, and his men he would commit, now in his graver age. With stately grace the man approached then, his looks, his coming honor did presage. The guard asunder cleft and passage made, he to the throne up went, and there he stayed. To earth he cast his eyes and bent his knee, to whom the king thus gan his will explain. To thee the scepter, Emeren, to thee these armies I commit, my place sustain amongst them. Go, set the king of Judah free, and let the Frenchmen feel my just disdain. Go meet them, conquer them, leave none alive or those that scape from battle, bring captive. 
Thus spake the tyrant, and the sceptre laid With all his sovereign power upon the knight. I take this sceptre at your hand, he said, And with your happy fortune go to fight, And trust, my lord, in your great virtue's aid, To avenge all Asia's harms, her wrongs to right. Nor e'er but victor will I see your face, Our overthrow shall bring death, not disgrace. Heavens grant, if ill, yet no mishap I dread, Or harm they threaten against this camp of thine, That all that mischief fall upon my head, Theirs be the conquest, and the danger mine, And let them safe bring home their captain dead, Buried in pomp of triumph's glorious shrine. He ceased, and then a murmur loud up went, With noise of joy and sound of instrument. Amid the noise and shout uprose the king, environed with many a noble peer, that to his royal tent the monarch bring. And there he feasted them and made them cheer. To him and him he talked and carved each thing, the greatest honored, meanest graced were. And while this mirth, this joy and feast doth last, Armida found fit time her nets to cast. But when the feast was done, she that espied all eyes on her fair visage fixed and bent, and by true notes and certain signs descried how love's empoisoned fire their entrails brent, arose. And where the king sate in his pride with stately pace and humble gestures went, and as she could, in looks, in voice, she strove fierce, stern, bold, angry, and severe to prove. Great emperor, behold me here, she saith, for thee, my country, and my faith to fight. A dame, a virgin, but a royal maid, and worthy seems this war a princess height, for by the sword the scepter is upstayed. This hand can use them both with skill and might. This hand of mine can strike and at each blow thy foes and ours kill, wound, and overthrow. Nor yet suppose this is the foremost day wherein to war I bent my noble thought, but for the surety of thy realms, and stay of our religion true, ere this I wrought. Yourself best know if this be true, I say, or if my former deeds rejoiced you aught when Godfrey's hardy knights and princes strong I captive took, and held in bondage long. I took them, bound them, and so sent them bound to thee a noble gift, with whom they had condemned, low in dungeon underground, for ever dwelt, in woe and torment sad. So might thine host an easy way have found to end this doubtful war with conquest glad, had not Rinaldo fierce my knights all slain, and set those lords, his friends, at large again. Rinaldo is well known and there a long and true rehearsal made she of his deeds. This is the knight that since hath done me wrong, wrong yet untold, that sharp revengement needs. Displeasure, therefore, mixed with reason strong, this thirst of war in me, this courage breeds. Nor how he injured me, time serves to tell. Let this suffice, I seek revengement fell, and will procure it. For all shafts that fly light not in vain, some work the shooter's will, and Jove's right hand, with thunders cast from sky, takes open vengeance oft for secret ill. But if some champion dare this knight defy to mortal battle, and by fight him kill, and with his hateful head will me present, that gift my soul shall please, my heart content. So please that for reward and joy he shall, the greatest gift I can or may afford, myself, my beauty, wealth, and kingdoms all, to marry him and take him for my lord. This promise will I keep whate'er befall, and thereto bind myself by oath and word. Now he that deems this purchase worth his pain, let him step forth and speak, I none disdain, while thus the princess said, his hungry eye Adrastus fed on her sweet beauty's light. 
The gods forbid, quoth he, one shaft of thine should be discharged gainst that discourteous knight. His heart unworthy is, shootress divine, of thine artillery to feel the might. To wreak thine ire behold me, pressed and fit. I will his head cut off and bring thee it. I will his heart with this sharp sword divide, and to the vultures cast his carcass out. Thus threatened he. But Tisiphern envied to hear his glorious vaunt and boasting stout, and said, But who art thou that so great pride thou show'st before the king, me, and this rout? Pardy, here are some such, whose worth exceeds thy vaunting much, yet boast not of their deeds. The Indian fierce replied, I am the man whose acts his words and boasts have a surpassed, but if elsewhere the words thou now began had uttered been, that speech had been thy last. Thus quarreled they. The monarch stayed them then, and twixt the angry knights his scepter cast. Then to Armida said, Fair queen, I see thy heart is stout, thy thoughts courageous be. Thou worthy art, that their disdain and ire at thy commands these knights should both appease. Against thy foe their courage hot as fire thou mayst employ, both when and where thou please. There all their power and force, and what desire they have to serve thee, may they show at ease. The monarch held his peace when this was said, and they knew proffer of their service made. Nor they alone, but all that famous were in feats of arms, boast that he shall be dead. All offer her their aid, all say and swear to take revenge on his condemned head. So many arms moved she against her dear, And swore her darling underfoot to tread. But he, since first the enchanted isle he left, Safe in his barge the roaring waves still cleft. By the same way returned the well-taught boat By which it came, and made like haste, like speed. The friendly wind upon her sail that smote, So turned as to return her ship had need. The youth sometimes the pole or bear did note, Or wandering stars which clearest nights forth spread. Sometimes the floods, the hills, or mountains steep, Whose woody fronts or shade the silent deep. Now of the camp the man the state inquires, Now asks the custom strange of sundry lands, and sailed till clad in beams and bright attires the fourth day's sun on the eastern threshold stands. But when the western seas had quenched those fires, their frigate struck against the shore and sands. Then spoke their guide, The land of Palestine this is, here must your journey end and mine. The knights she set upon the shore all three, and vanished thence in twinkling of an eye. Up rose the night, in whose deep blackness be all colors hid of things in earth or sky. Nor could they house or hold or harbor see, or in that desert sign of dwelling spy. Nor track of man or horse, or aught that might inform them of some path or passage right. When they had mused what way they travel should, from the waste shore their steps at last they twined. And lo! Far off, at last, their eyes behold something, they wist not what, that clearly shined, with rays of silver and with beams of gold, which the dark folds of night's black mantle lined. Forward they went, and marched against the light, to see and find the thing that shone so bright. High on a tree they saw an armor new that glistered bright against Cynthia's silver ray. Therein, like stars in skies, the diamond shoe fret in the gilden helm and hauberk gay. The mighty shield, all scored, full they view of pictures fair, ranged in meet array. To keep them sat an aged man beside, who to salute them rose when them he spied. The twain who first were sent in this pursuit, of their wise friend well knew the aged face, but when the wizard sage their first salute received, and quitted had with kind embrace, to the young prince that silent stood and mute he turned his speech. In this unused place, for you alone I wait, my lord, quoth he. 
my chiefest care your state and welfare be for though you wot it not i am your friend and for your profit work as these can tell i taught them how i might as charms to end and bring you hither from love's hateful cell now to my words though sharp perchance attend nor be aggrieved although they seem to fell but keep them well in mind till in the truth a wise and holier man instruct thy youth not underneath sweet shades and fountains shrill among the nymphs the fairies leaves and flowers but on the steep the rough and craggy hill of virtue stands this bliss this good of ours by toil and travel not by sitting still in pleasure's lap we come to honor's bowers why will you thus in sloth's deep valley lie the royal eagles on the mountains fly nature lifts up thy forehead to the skies and fills thy heart with high and noble thought that thou to heavenward a shouldst lift thine eyes and purchase fame by deeds well done and wrought she gives the ire by which hot courage flies to conquests not through brawls and battles fought for civil jars nor that thereby you might your wicked malice wreak and cursed spite but that your strength spurred forth with noble wrath with greater fury might christ's foes assault and that you bridle should with lesser scath each secret vice and kill each inward fault for so his godly anger ruleth hath each righteous man beneath heaven's starry vault and at his will makes it now hot now cold now lets it run now doth it fettered hold thus pilot he rinaldo hushed and still great wisdom heard in those few words compiled he marked the speech a purple blush did fill his guilty cheeks down went his eyesight mild the hermit by his bashful looks his will well understood and said look up my child and painted in this precious shield behold the glorious deeds of thy forefathers old thine elders glory here in see and know in virtue's path how they trod all their days whom thou art far behind a runner slow in this true course of honor fame and praise up up thyself in sight by the fair show of knightly worth which this bright shield bewrays that be thy spur to praise at last the knight looked up and on those portraits bent his sight the cunning workman had in little space infinite shapes of men there well expressed for there described was the worthy race and pedigree of all the house of est come from a roman spring or all the place flowed pure streams of crystal east and west with laurel crowned stood the princes old their wars the hermit and their battles told he showed him caius first when first in prey to people strange the falling empire went first prince of est that did the sceptre sway o'er such as chose him lord by free consent his weaker neighbors to his rule obey need made them stoop constraint doth force content after when lord honorius called the train of savage goths into his land again and when all italy did burn and flame with bloody war by this fierce people made when rome a captive and a slave became and to be quite destroyed was most afraid aurelius to his everlasting fame preserved in peace the folk that him obeyed next whom was forest who the rage withstood of the bold huns and of their tyrant proud known by his look was attila the fell whose dragon eyes shone bright with anger spark worse faced than a dog who viewed him well supposed they saw him grin and heard him bark but when in single fight he lost the bell how through his troops he fled there might you mark and how lord forest after fortified aquila's town and how for it he died for there was wrought the fatal end and fine both of himself and of the town he kept but his great son renowned acarine into his father's place and honor stepped to cruel fate not to the huns all time gave place 
and when time served again forth left, and in a vale of Po built for his seat, of many a village small, a city great. Against the swelling flood he banked it strong, and thence up rose the fair and noble town, where they of Est would by succession long command, and rule in bliss and high renown. Against Odoacer then he fought, but wrong oft spoileth right, fortune treads courage down, for there he died for his dear country's sake, and of his father's praise did so partake. With him died Alphoresio, Atso was with his dear brother into exile sent, but homewards they in arms again repass, the herald king oppressed, from banishment. His front through pierced with a dart, alas, next them of Est, the Pamanondas went, that smiling seemed to cruel death to yield, when Totila was fled and safe his shield. Of Boniface I speak, Valerian his son, in praise and power succeeded him, who durst sustain in years, though scant a man, of the proud Goths, an hundred squadrons trim. Then he that gainst the Slavs much honor won, Ernesto, threatening, stood with visage grim. Before him, Alduard, the Lombard stout, who from Monchelsey's boldly erst shut out. There Henry was, and Beregar the bold, that served great Charles in his conquest high who in each battle give the onset would, a hardy soldier and a captain sly. After Prince Louis did he well uphold against his nephew, king of Italy. He won the field and took that king on live. Next him stood Otho with his children five. Of Almeric the image next they view, Lord Marquis of Ferrara first create, founder of many churches that up through his eyes like one that used to contemplate. Against him the second Azzo stood in rue with Berengarius that did long debate, till after often change of fortune's stroke he won, and on all Italy laid the yoke. Albert, his son, the Germans warred among, and there his praise and fame was spread so wide that, having foiled the Danes in battle strong, his daughter young became great Otho's bride. Behind him Hugo stood with warfare long that broke the horn of all the Romans' pride who of all Italy the Marquis hight, and Tuscan whole possessed as his right. After Tibaldo, puissant Boniface and Beatrice his dear possessed the stage, nor was there left heir male of that great race to enjoy the scepter, state, and heritage. The princess Maud alone supplied the place, supplied the want in number, sex, and age. For far above each scepter, throne, and crown, the noble dame advanced her veil and gown. With manlike vigor shone her noble look, And more than manlike wrath her face o'erspread. There the fell Normans, Guichard there, forsook the field, Till then who never feared nor fled. Henry the fourth she beat, And from him took his standard, And in church it offered. Which done the Pope back to the Vatican she brought, And placed in Peter's chair again. As he that honored her and held her dear, Atso the fifth stood by her lovely side. But the fourth Atso's offspring far and near spread forth, and through Germania fructified. Sprung from that branch did Guelfo bold appear, Guelfo his son by Cunegon his bride, and in Bavaria's field transplanted new, this Roman graft flourished, increased, and grew. A branch of Est there in the Guelfian tree engrafted was, which of itself was old whereon you might the Guelfo's fairer see renew their sceptres and their crowns of gold, on which heaven's good aspect so bended be that high and broad it spread and flourished bold, till underneath his glorious branches laid half Germany and all under his shade. This regal plan from his Italian root sprung up as high and blossomed fair above, for nenst Lord Guelfo Berthold issued out with the sixth Atso, whom all virtues love, this was the pedigree of worthy stout who seemed in that bright shield to live and move. Rinaldo waked up and cheered his face to see these worthies of his house and race, to do like acts of courage wished and sought, and with that wish transported him so far that all those deeds which filled a his thought 
towns won, forts taken, armies killed in war, as if they were things done indeed and wrought, before his eyes he thinks they present are. He hastily arms him, and with hope and haste sure conquest met, prevented and embraced. But Charles, who had told the death and fall of the young prince of Danes, his late dear lord, gave him the fatal weapon, and with all, young knight, quoth he, take with good luck this sword, your just, strong, valiant hand in battle shall employ it long for Christ's true faith and word, and of his former lord revenge the wrongs, who loved you so, that deed to you belongs. He answered it, God, for his mercy's sake, grant that this hand which holds this weapon good, for thy dear master may sharp vengeance take, may cleave the pagan's heart and shed his blood, to this but short reply did Charles make, and thanked him much, nor more on terms they stood. For lo, the wizard sage that was their guide, on their dark journey hastes them forth to ride. High time it is, quoth he, for you to wend where Godfrey you awaits, and many a night. There may be well arrive ere night doth end, and through this darkness can I guide you right. This said, up to his coach they all ascend, on its swift wheels forth rolled the chariot light. He gave his coursers fleet the rod and rein, and galloped forth and eastward drove amain. While silent so through night's dark shade they fly, the hermit thus bespake the young man stout. Of thy great house, thy race, thine offspring high, here hast thou seen the branch, the bowl, the root. And as these worthies born to chivalry and deeds of arms, it hath tofore brought out. So is it, so it shall be fertile still, nor time shall end, nor age that seed shall kill. Would God, as drawn from the forgetful lap of antique time, I have thine elders shown, that so I could the catalogue unwrap of thy great nephews yet unborn, unknown, that ere this light they view their fate and hap I might foretell, and how their chance is thrown, that like thine elders, so thou mightst behold thy children many, famous, stout, and bold. But not by art or skill of things future can the plain truth revealed be and told. Although some knowledge doubtful, dark, obscure we have of coming haps in clouds uprolled, nor all which in this cause I know for sure dare I foretell. For of that father old, the hermit Peter, learned I much and he without unveil heaven's secrets great doth see. But this, to him revealed by grace divine, by him to me declared, to thee I say, was never race, Greek, barbarous, or Latine, great in times past, or famous at this day, richer in hardy nights than this of thine. Such blessings heaven shall on thy children lay, that they in fame shall pass, in praise or come the worthies old of Sparta, Carthage, Rome. But amongst the rest I chose Alphonsus bold, in virtue first, second in place and name. He shall be born when this frail world grows old, corrupted, poor, and bare of men of fame. Better than he none shall, none can or could the sword or scepter use or guide the same, to rule in peace, or to command in fight, thine offspring's glory and thy house's light. His younger age four tokens true shall yield of future valor, puissance, force, and might. From him no rock the savage beast shall shield. At tilt or tourney match him shall no knight. After he conquer shall in pitched field great armies, and win spoils in single fight. And on his locks, rewards for knightly praise, shall garlands wear of grass, of oak, of bays his graver age as well that yield it fits shall happy peace preserve and quiet blessed and from his neighbor strong amongst whom he sits shall keep his cities safe in wealth and rest shall nourish arts and cherish pregnant wits make triumphs great and feast his subjects best reward the good the ill with pains torment shall dangers all foresee and seen prevent but if it hap against those wicked bands that sea and earth infest with blood and war, and in these wretched times to noble lands give laws of peace false and unjust that are, 
that he be sent to drive their guilty hands from Christ's pure altars and high temples far. Oh, what revenge, what vengeance shall he bring on that false sect and their accursed king? Too late the Moors, too late the Turkish king gainst him should arm their troops and legions bold, for he beyond great Euphrates should bring beyond the frozen tops of Taurus cold, beyond the land where is perpetual spring, the cross, the eagle white, the lily of gold, and by baptizing of the Ethiops brown, of aged Nile reveal the springs unknown. Thus said the hermit, and his prophecy the prince accepted with content and pleasure, the secret thought of his posterity, of his concealed joys heaped up the measure. Meanwhile the morning bright was mounted high, and changed heaven's silver wealth to golden treasure, and high above the Christian tents they view how the broad ensigns trembled, waved, and blew. When thus again their leader sage begun, See how bright Phoebus clears the darksome skies, See how with gentle beams the friendly sun, The tents, the towns, the hills, and dales descries. Through my well guiding is your voyage done, From danger safe in travel oft which lies. Hence, without fear of harm or doubt of foe, March to the camp, I may no nearer go. Thus took he leave, and made a quick return, And forward went the champions three on foot, And marching right against the rising morn, a ready passage to the camp found out. Meanwhile had speedy fame the tidings borne that to the tents approached these barons stout, and starting from his throne and kingly seat to entertain them rose Godfredo great. End of Book 17Book 18 of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso Translated by Edward Fairfax This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland The Argument The charms and spirits false therein which lie Rinaldo chaseth from the forest old. The host of Egypt comes. Bephrine the spy entereth their camp, Stout, crafty, wise, and bold. Sharp is the fight about the bulwarks high and ports of Zion to assault the hold. Godfrey hath aid from heaven. By force the town is won, the pagans slain, walls beaten down. Arrived where Godfrey to embrace him stood, my sovereign lord Rinaldo meekly said, To venge my wrongs against Gernando proud, my honor's care provoked my wrath unstayed. But that I you displeased, my chieftain good, my thoughts yet grieve, my heart is still dismayed, and here I come, pressed all exploits to try to make me gracious in your gracious eye. To him that kneeled, folding his friendly arms about his neck, the duke this answer gave, Let pass such speeches sad of passed harms, remembrance is the life of grief, his grave forgetfulness. And for amends, in arms your wanted valor use and courage brave, for you alone to happy end must bring the strong enchantments of the charmed spring, that aged wood whence heretofore we got to build our scaling engines timber fit, is now the fearful seat, but how none wot, where ugly fiends and damned spirits sit, to cut one twist thereof adventureth not the boldest knight we have, nor without it this wall can battered be. Where others doubt, there venture thou, and show thy courage stout. Thus said he, and the knight, in speeches few, proffered his service to attempt the thing. To hard assays his courage willing flew. To him praise was no spur, words were no sting. Of his dear friends then he embraced the crew to welcome him which came, for in a ring about him Guelpho, Tancred, and the rest stood of the camp the greatest, chief, and best. When with the prince these lords had iterate their welcomes oft, and oft their dear embrace, toward the rest of lesser worth and state he turned, and them received with gentle grace. The merry soldiers bowed him with shout and prate, 
with cries as joyful and as cheerful face, as if in triumph's chariot bright as sun he had returned, Afric or Asia won. Thus marched to his tent the champion good, and there sat down with all his friends around. Now of the war he asked, now of the wood, and answered each demand they list propound. But when they left him to his ease, up stood the hermit, and, fit time to speak once found, My lord, he said, your travels wondrous are, far have you strayed, erred, wandered far. Much are you bound to God above, who brought you safe from false Armida's charmed hold, and thee a straying sheep, whom once he bought, hath now again reduced to his fold. And gainst his heathen foes, these men of naught, hath chosen thee in place next Godfrey bold. Yet mayst thou not, polluted thus with sin, in his high service war or fight begin. The world, the flesh, and their infection vile, pollute thy thoughts impure, thy spirit stain. Not Po, not Ganges, not seven-mouthed Nile, not the wide seas can wash thee clean again. Only to purge all faults which thee defile, his blood hath power who for thy sins was slain. His help therefore invoke, to him bewray thy secret faults, mourn, weep, complain, and pray. This said, the knight first, with the witch unchaste, his idle loves and follies vain, lamented. Then, kneeling low, with heavy looks downcast, his other sins confessed, and all repented and meekly pardon craved for first and last. The hermit, with his zeal, was well contented, and said, On yonder hill next morn go pray that turns his forehead against the morning ray. That done, march to the wood, whence each one brings such news of furies, goblins, fiends, and sprites, that giants, monsters, and all dreadful things thou shalt subdue, which that dark grove unites. Let no strange voice that mourns or sweetly sings, Nor beauty whose glad smile frail hearts delights, Within thy breast make ruth or pity rise, But their false looks and prayers false despise. Thus he advised him, and the hardy knight Prepared him gladly to this enterprise. Thoughtful he passed the day, and sad the night, And ere the silver morn began to rise, His arms he took and in a coat him dight of color strange cut in the warlike guise, and on his way soul silent forth he went alone, and left his friends, and left his tent. It was the time when against the breaking day rebellious night yet strove, and still repined, for in the east appeared the morning gray, and yet some lamps in Jove's high palace shined, when to Mount Olivet he took his way, and saw, as round about his eyes he twined, Night's shadows hence, from thence the mornings shine, This bright, that dark, that earthly, this divine. Thus to himself he thought, How many bright and splendid lamps Shine in heaven's temple high. Day hath his golden sun, her moon the night, Her fixed and wandering stars the azure sky, So framed all by their creator's might, that still they live and shine, and ne'er shall die, till, in a moment, with the last day's brand they burn, and with them burn sea, air, and land. Thus, as he mused, to the top he went, and there kneeled down with reverence and fear. His eyes upon heaven's eastern face he bent, his thoughts above all heavens uplifted were. The sins and errors which I now repent, of mine unbridled youth, O father dear, remember not, but let thy mercy fall, and purge my faults, and mine offences all. Thus prayed he. With purple wings up flew in golden weed the morning's lusty queen, begilding with the radiant beam she threw his helm, his harness, and the mountain green. Upon his breast and forehead gently blew the air That balm and nardus breathed unseen, And o'er his head let down from clearest skies A cloud of pure and precious dew there flies. The heavenly dew was on his garment spread, To which compared his clothes pale ashes seem, And sprinkled so that all that paleness fled, And thence a purest white bright rays outstream. So cheered are the flowers late withered, 
with the sweet comfort of the morning beam and so returned to youth the serpent old adorns herself in new and native gold the lovely whiteness of his changed weed the prince perceived well and long admired towards the forest marched he on with speed resolved as such adventures great required thither he came whence shrinking back for dread of that strange desert sight the first retired but not to him fearful or loathsome maid that forest was but sweet with pleasant shade forward he passed and in the grove before he heard a sound that strange sweet pleasing was there rolled a crystal brook with gentle roar there sighed the winds as through the leaves they pass there did the nightingale her wrongs deplore there sung the swan and singing died alas there lute harp cittern human voice he heard and all these sounds one sound right well declared a dreadful thunderclap at last he heard the aged trees and plants well nigh that rent yet heard the nymphs and sirens afterward birds winds and waters sing with sweet consent whereat amazed he stayed and well prepared for his defence heedful and slow forth went nor in his way his passage aught withstood except a quiet still transparent flood on the green banks which that fair stream inbound flowers and odors sweetly smiled and smelled which reaching out his stretched arms around all the large desert in his bosom held and through the grove one channel passage found that in the wood in that the forest dwelled trees clad the streams streams green those trees a made and so exchanged their moisture and their shade the knight some way sought out the flood to pass and as he sought a wondrous bridge appeared a bridge of gold a huge and weighty mass of arches great of that rich metal reared when through that golden way he entered was down fell the bridge swelled the stream and weared the work away nor sign left where it stood and of a river calm became a flood he turned amazed to see it troubled so like sudden brooks increased with molten snow the billows fierce that tossed to and fro the whirlpools sucked down to their bosoms low but on he went to search for wonders mo through the thick trees there high and broad which grow and in that forest huge and desert wide the more he sought more wonders still he spied where so he stepped it seemed the joyful ground renewed the verdure of her flowery weed a fountain here a well-spring there he found here bud the roses there the lilies spread the aged wood o'er and about him round flourished with blossoms new new leaves new seed and on the boughs and branches of those trees the bark was softened and renewed the green the manna on each leaf did pearled lie the honey stilled from the tender rind again he heard that wondrous harmony of songs and sweet complaints of lovers kind the human voices sung a treble high to which respond the birds the streams the wind but yet unseen those nymphs those singers were unseen the lutes harps viols which they bear he looked he listened yet his thoughts denied to think that true which he both heard and see a myrtle in an ample plain he spied and thither by a beaten path went he the myrtle spread her mighty branches wide higher than pine or palm or cypress tree and far above all other plants was seen that forest's lady and that desert's queen upon the trees his eyes rinaldo bent and there a marvel great and strange began an aged oak beside him cleft and rent and from his fertile hollow womb forth ran clad in rare weeds and strange habiliment a nymph for age able to go to man an hundred plants beside even in his sight childed an hundred nymphs so great so dight such as on stages play such as we see the dryads painted whom wild satyrs love whose arms half naked locks untrussed be with buskins laced on their legs above 
and silken robes tucked short above their knee. Such seem the sylvan daughters of this grove, save that instead of shafts and boughs of tree, she bore a lute, a harp, or cittern she. And wantonly they cast them in a ring, and sung and danced to move his weaker sense. Rinaldo round about environing, as centers are with their circumference. The tree they compassed eke, and gan to sing that woods and streams admired their excellence. Welcome, dear Lord, welcome to this sweet grove, welcome our lady's hope, welcome her love. Thou comes to cure our princess, faint and sick for love, for love of thee, faint, sick, distressed. Late black, late dreadful was this forest thick, fit dwelling for sad folk with grief oppressed. See, with thy coming, how the branches quick revived are, and in new blossoms dressed. This was their song. And after from it went first a sweet sound, and then the myrtle rent. If antique times admired Silenus old, that oft appeared set on his lazy ass, how would they wonder if they had behold such sights as from the myrtle high did pass? Thence came a lady fair with locks of gold, that like in shape, in face, in beauty was to sweet Armide. Rinaldo thinks he spies her gestures, smiles, and glances of her eyes. On him a sad and smiling look she cast, which twenty passions strange at once berays. And art thou come, quoth she, returned at last, to her from whom but late thou ranst thy ways, comest thou to comfort me for sorrows past, to ease my widowed nights and careful days? Or comest thou to work me grief and harm? Why nilt thou speak? Why not thy face disarm? Comest thou a friend or foe? I did not frame that golden bridge to entertain my foe, nor open flowers and fountains as you came to welcome him with joy that brings me woe. Put off thy helm, rejoice me with the flame of thy bright eyes, whence first my fires did grow. Kiss me, embrace me. If we further venture, love keeps the gate, the fort is eath to enter. Thus as she woos, she rolls her rueful eyes with piteous look, and changeth oft her cheer. An hundred sighs from her false heart upflies, she sobs, she mourns, it is great ruth to hear. The hardest breast sweet pity mollifies, what stony heart resists a woman's tear? But yet the knight, wise, wary, not unkind, drew forth his sword, and from her careless twined. Toward the tree he marched, she thither start, before him stepped, embraced the plant, and cried, Ah, never do me such a spiteful part to cut my tree, this forest's joy and pride. Put up thy sword, else pierce therewith the heart of thy forsaken and despised Armide. For through this breast and through this heart, unkind, to this fair tree thy sword shall passage find. He lift his brand, nor cared, though oft she prayed, and she, her form to other shape did change. Such monsters huge, when men in dreams are laid, oft in their idle fancies roam and range. Her body swelled, her face obscure was made, vanished her garments rich and vestures strange. A giantess before him high she stands, like Briarius armed with a hundred hands. With fifty swords and fifty targets bright she threatened death. She roared, cried, and fought. Each other nymph, in armor likewise dight, a cyclops great became. He feared them not, but on the myrtle smote with all his might, that groaned like living souls to death nigh brought. The sky seemed Pluto's court, the air seemed hell. Therein such monsters roar, such spirits yell, lightened the heaven above. The earth below roared aloud, that thundered, and this shook. Blustered the tempest strong, the whirlwinds blow, the bitter storm drove hailstones in his look. But yet his arm grew neither weak nor slow, nor of that fury heed or care he took, till low to earth the wounded tree down bended. Then fled the spirits all, the charms all in. The heavens grew clear, the air waxed calm and still. 
The wood returned to its wonted state, Of witchcrafts free, quite void of spirits ill, Of horror full, but horror there innate. He further proved, if aught withstood his will, To cut those trees, as did the charms of late, And finding naught to stop him, smiled and said, O oh, shadows vain, no oh, fools of shades afraid. From thence home to the campward turned the knight. The hermit cried, upstarting from his seat, Now of the wood the charms have lost their might, The sprites are conquered, ended is the feat, See where he comes. In glistering white all dight appeared the man, Bold, stately, high, and great. His eagle's silver wings to shine begun With wondrous splendor against the golden sun. The camp received him with a joyful cry, A cry the dales and hills about that filled. Then Godfrey welcomed him with honors high, His glory quenched, all spite, all envy killed. To yonder dreadful grove, quoth he, went I, And from the fearful wood, as me you willed, Have driven the sprites away. Thither let be your people sent, the way is safe and free. Sent were the workmen thither, thence they brought timber enough, by good advice select, and though by skillless builders framed and wrought their engines rude and rams were late erect, yet now the forts and towers from whence they fought were framed by a cunning architect, William, of all the Genoa's lord and guide, which late ruled all the seas from side to side, but forced to retire from it at last, the pagan fleet, the sea's moist empire, won. His men, with all their stuff and store, in haste home to the camp with their commander run. In skill, in wit, in cunning, him surpassed yet never engineer beneath the sun. Of carpenters an hundred large he brought, that what their lord devised made and wrought. This man began with wondrous art to make not rams, not mighty brakes, not slings alone, wherewith the firm and solid walls to shake, to cast a dart or throw a shaft or stone, but framed of pines and firs did undertake to build a fortress huge, to which was none yet ever like, whereof he clothed the sides against the balls of fire with raw bull's hides. In mortises and sockets frame it just, The beams, the studs, and puncheons joined he fast. To beat the city's wall, beneath forth thrust A ram with horned front, about her waist, A bridge the engine from her side out thrust, Which on the wall, when need required, she cast, And from her top a turret small upstood, Strong, surely armed, and builded of like wood. Set on an hundred wheels, the rolling mass on the smooth lands went nimbly up and down. Though full of arms and armed men it was, yet with small pains it ran as it had flown. Wondered the camp so quick to see it pass, they praised the workmen and their skill unknown. And on that day two towers they builded more, like that which sweet Clorinda burnt before. Yet holy were not from the Saracens their works concealed and their labors hid. Upon that wall which next the camp confines, they placed spies who marked all they did. They saw the ashes wild and squared pines, how to the tents trailed from the grove they slid, and engines huge they saw, yet could not tell how they were built, their forms they saw not well. Their engines eke they reared and with great art repaired each bulwark turret port and tower and fortified the plain and easy part to bide the storm of every warlike stour till as they thought no slight or force of mark to undermine or scale the same had power and false as mino gan new balls prepare of wicked fire wild wondrous strange and rare he mingled brimstone with bitumen fell fetched from that lake where sodom erst did sink and from that flood which nine times compassed hell some of the liquor hot he brought i think wherewith the quenchless fire he tempered well to make it smoke and flame and deadly stink and for his wood cut down the aged sire would thus revengement take with flame and fire while thus the camp and thus the town were bent, these to assault, these to defend the wall, a speedy dove through the clear welkin went, straight o'er the tents, seen by the soldiers all, 
With nimble fans the yielding air she rent, Nor seemed it that she would alight or fall Till she arrived near that besieged town, Then from the clouds at last she stooped down. But lo, from whence I note, a falcon came, Armed with crooked bill and talons long, That twixt the camp and city crossed her game, That durst not bide her foes encounter strong, But right upon the royal tent, down came, and there the lords and princes great among, when the sharp hawk nigh touched her tender head, in Godfrey's lap she fell with fear half dead. The duke received her, savored her, and spied, as he beheld the bird, a wondrous thing. About her neck a letter close was tied by a small thread, and thrust under her wing. He loosed forth the writ, and spread it wide, and read the intent thereof. To Judah's king, thus said the schedule, honors high increase. Egyptian chieftain wisheth health and peace. Fear not, renowned prince, resist, endure till the third day, or till the fourth at most. I come, and your deliverance will procure, and kill your coward foes and all their host. This secret in that brief was closed up sure, writ in strange language to the wicked post given to transport. For in their warlike need the east such message used oft with good speed. The duke let go the captive dove at large, and she, that had his counsel close betrayed, traitress to her great lord, touched not the marge of Salem's town, but fled far thence afraid. The duke, before all those which had or charge or office high, the letter read, and said, See how the goodness of the Lord foreshows the secret purpose of our crafty foes. No longer then let us protract the time, but scale the bulwark of this fortress high. Through sweat and labor against those rocks sublime let us ascend, which to the southward lie. Hard will it be that way in arms to climb, but yet the place and passage both know I, and that high wall by sight strong on that part is least defensed by arms, by work and art. Thou, Raymond, on this side with all thy might assault the wall, and by those crags ascend. My squadrons with mine engines huge shall fight, and gainst the northern gate my puissance bend. That so our foes, beguiled with the sight, our greatest force and power shall there attend while my great tower from thence shall nimbly slide, and batter down some worse defended side. Camillo, thou not far from me shalt rear another tower, close to the walls abroad. This spoken, Raymond Old, that sat him near, and while he talked, great things tossed in his thought, said, To Godfredo's counsel given us here, naught can be added, from it taken naught, yet this I further wish, that some were sent to spy their camp, their secret, and intent, that may their number and their squadrons brave describe, and through their tents disguised mask. Quoth Tancred, Lo, a subtle squire I have, a person fit to undertake this task, a man quick, ready, bold, sly to deceive, to answer wise, and well advised to ask, where language it, and that with time and place can change his look, his voice, his gait, his grace. Sent for he came. And when his lord him told what Godfrey's pleasure was, and what his own, he smiled, and said, forthwith he gladly would. I go, quoth he, careless what chance be thrown, and where encamped be these pagans bold, will walk in every tent, a spy unknown, their camp even at noonday I enter shall, and number all their horse and footmen all. How great, how strong, how armed this army is, and what their guide intends I will declare. To me the secrets of that heart of his and hidden thoughts shall open lie and bear. Thus Vaffrin spoke, nor longer stayed on this, but for a mantle changed the coat he wear. Naked was his neck, and bout his forehead bold of linen white full twenty yards he rolled. His weapons were a Syrian bow and quiver, his gestures barbarous like the Turkish train. Wondered all they that heard his tongue deliver of every land the language true and plain, in Tyre a born Phoenician, by the river of Nile a knight bred in the Egyptian main, both people would have thought him. Forth he rides on a swift steed o'er hills and dales that glides. 
But ere the third day came, the French forth sent Their pioneers to even the rougher ways, And ready made each warlike instrument, Nor aught their labor interrupts or stays. The nights in busy toil they likewise spent, And with long evenings lengthened forth short days. Till naught was left the hosts that hinder might To use their utmost power and strength in fight. That day, which of the salt the day forerun, The godly duke in prayer spent well nigh, And all the rest, because they had misdone, The sacrament received, and mercy cry. Then off the duke his engines great begun to show, Where least he would their strength apply. His foes rejoiced, deluded in that sort, To see him bent against their surest port. But after, aided by the friendly knight, His greatest engine to that site he brought Where plainest seemed the wall, Where with their might the flankers least Could hurt them as they fought, And to the southern mountain's greatest height To raise his turret old Raimondo sought. And thou, Camillo, on that part hadst thine Where from the north the walls did westward twine. But when amid the eastern heaven appeared the rising morning, bright as shining glass, the troubled pagan saw, and seeing, feared, how the great tower stood not where late it was, and here and there to fore unseen was reared, of timber strong, a huge and fearful mass. And numberless with beams, with ropes and strings, they view the iron rams, the brakes and slings. The Syrian people now were no whit slow, Their best defences to that side to bear, Where Godfrey did his greatest engine show, From thence where late in vain they placed were. But he who at his back right well did know The host of Egypt to be approaching near, To him called Guelpho and the Roberts twain, And said, On horseback look you still remain, And have regard, while all our people strive To scale this wall, where weak it seems and thin, Lest unawares some sudden host arrive, And at our backs unlooked for war begin. This said, three fierce assaults at once they give, The hardy soldiers all would die or win, And on three parts resistance makes the king, And rage against strength, despair against hope doth bring. Himself, Upon his limbs with feeble eeld that shook, Unwieldy with their proper weight, His armor laid, and long unused shield, And marched gainst Raymond to the mountain's height. Great Solomon gainst Godfrey took the field, For next Camillo stood Argantes straight, Where Tancred strong he found. So fortune will that this good prince His wanted foe shall kill. The archers shot their arrows sharp and keen, Dipped in the bitter juice of poison strong. The shady face of heaven was scantly seen, Hid with the clouds of shafts and quarries long. Yet weapons sharp with greater fury Been cast from the towers the pagan troops among. For thence flew stones and clifts of marble rocks, Trees shod with iron, timber, logs and blocks. A thunderbolt seemed every stone. It brake his limbs and armors so on whom it light, That life and soul it did not only take, But all his shape and face disfigured quite. The lances stayed not in the wounds they make, But through the gored body took their flight. From side to side, through flesh, through skin and rind they flew, And flying left sad death behind. But yet not all this force and fury Drove the pagan people to forsake the wall. But to revenge these deadly blows they strove, With darts that fly, with stones and trees that fall. For need, so cowards oft courageous prove, For liberty they fight, for life and all, And oft with arrows, shafts, and stones that fly Give bitter answer to a sharp reply. This while the fierce assailants never cease, But sternly still maintain a threefold charge, And gainst the clouds of shafts draw nigh at ease, under a pentis made of many a targe, the armed towers close to the bulwark's priests, and strive to grapple with the battled marge, and launch their bridges out. Meanwhile below, with iron fronts, the rams, the walls down throw. Yet still Rinaldo unresolved went, and far unworthy him this service thought, if mongst the common sort his pains he spent, renowned so got the prince esteemed not. His angry looks on every side he bent, and where most harm, most danger was, he sought. And where the wall high, strong, and surest was, that part would he assault, and that way pass. And turning to the worthies him behind, all hardy knights whom Dudon late did guide, 
Oh, shame, quoth he, this wall no war doth find, When battered is elsewhere each part, each side. All pain is safety to a valiant mind, Each way is eath to him that dares abide. Come, let us scale this wall, though strong and high, And with your shields keep off the darts that fly. With him united all, while thus he spake, Their targets hard above their heads they threw, Which joined in one an iron pentis make, That from the dreadful storm preserved the crew. Defended thus, their speedy course they take, And to the wall without resistance drew. For that strong pentacle protected well The knights from all that flew and all that fell. Against the fort Rinaldo gan uprear a ladder huge, An hundred steps of height, and on his arm the same did easily bear and move as winds do reeds or rushes light. Sometimes a tree, a rock, a dart, or spear fell from above, yet forward clomb the knight, and upward, fearless, pressed, careless still, though Mount Olympus fell, or Ossa hill. A mount of ruins, and of shafts, a wood upon his shoulders and his shield he bore. One hand the ladder held whereon he stood, the other bare his targe his face before. His hardy troop, by his example good provoked, With him the place assaulted sore, And ladders long against the wall they clap, Unlike in courage yet, unlike in hap. One died, another fell, he forward went, And these he comforts, and he threateneth those. Now with his hand outstretched, The battlement well nigh he reached, When all his armed foes ran thither, and their force and fury bent to throw him headlong down, yet up he goes. A wondrous thing. One night, whole armed bands, alone and hanging in the air, withstands. Withstands and forceth his great strength so far that, like a palm whereon huge weight doth rest, his forces, so resisted, stronger are. His virtues higher rise, the more oppressed, till all that would his entrance bold debar he backward drove, upleaped and possessed the wall, and safe and easy with his blade to all that after came the passage made. There, killing such as durst and did withstand, to noble Eustace that was like to fall, he reached forth his friendly conquering hand, and next himself helped him to mount the wall. This while Godfredo and his people fanned their lives to greater harms and dangers thrall, for there not man with man, nor knight with knight contend, but engines there with engines fight. For in that place the Paynims reared a post, which late had served some gallant ship for mast, and over it another beam they crossed, pointed with iron sharp, to it made fast with ropes, which, as men would, the dormant tossed now out, now in, now back, now forward cast. In his swift pulleys oft the men withdrew the tree, and oft the riding balk forth threw. The mighty beam redoubled oft his blows, and with such force the engine smote and hit, that her broadside the tower wide open throws. Her joints were broke, her rafters cleft and split, but yet, against every hap whence mischief grows prepared, the piece, against such extremes made fit, launched forth two scythes, sharp cutting, long and broad, and cut the ropes whereon the engine rode. As an old rock which age or stormy wind Tears from some craggy hill or mountain steep, Doth break, doth bruise, and into dust doth grind Wood, houses, hamlets, herds, and folds of sheep, So fell the beam, and down with it All kind of arms, of weapons, and of men did sweep, Wherewith the towers once or twice did shake, Trembled the walls, the hills and mountains quake, Victorious Godfrey boldly forward came, And had great hope even then the place to win. But lo, a fire with stench, with smoke and flame, Withstood his passage, stopped his entrance in. Such burning Etna yet could never frame, When from her entrails hot her fires begin. Nor yet in summer on the Indian plain Such vapors warm from scorching air down rain. Here balls of wildfire, there fly burning spears. This flame was black, that blue, this red as blood. Stench well nigh choketh them, noise deafs their ears, smoke blinds their eyes, fire kindleth on the wood. Nor those raw hides, which for defense it wears, could save the tower, in such distress it stood, for now they wrinkle, 
now it sweats and fries, now burns, unless some help come down from skies. The hardy duke before his folk abides, nor changed he color, countenance, or place, but comforts those that from the scalded hides with water strove the approaching flames to chase. In these extremes the prince and those he guides half roasted stood before fierce Vulcan's face, when lo, a sudden and unlooked-for blast the flames against the kindlers backward cast. The winds drove back the fire where heaped lie the pagans' weapons, where their engines were, which, kindling quickly in that substance dry, burnt all their store and all their warlike gear. O oh, glorious captain, whom the Lord from high defends, whom God preserves and holds so dear, for thee heaven fights. To thee the winds from far called with thy trumpet's blast, obedient are. But wicked Ismen, to his harm that saw how the fierce blast drove back the fire and flame, by art would nature change, and thence withdraw those noisome winds, else calm and still the same. Twixt two false wizards, without fear or awe, upon the walls in open sight he came, black, grisly, loathsome, grim, and ugly faced like Pluto old, betwixt two furies placed. And now the wretch those dreadful words begun, which tremble make deep hell and all her flock. Now troubled is the air, the golden sun, his fearful beams in clouds did close and lock. When from the tower, which his men could not shun, out flew a mighty stone, late half a rock, which light so dust upon the wizards three, that driven to dust their bones and bodies be to less than naught their members old were torn, and shivered with their heads to pieces small, as small as are the bruised grains of corn when from the mill dissolved to meal they fall. Their damned souls to deepest hell down borne, far from the joy and light celestial, the furies plunged in the infernal lake. O oh, mankind at their ends and zample take. This while the engine, which the tempest cold had saved from burning with his friendly blast, approach it had so near the battered hold that on the walls her bridge at ease she cast. But Solomon ran thither fierce and bold to cut the plank whereon the Christians passed, and had performed his will, save that upreared high in the skies a turret new appeared. Far in the air up clomb the fortress tall, higher than house, than steeple, church, or tower, the pagans trembled to behold the wall and city subject to her shot and power. Yet kept the turkey stand, though on him fall of stones and darts a sharp and deadly shower, and still to cut the bridge he hopes and strives, and those that fear with cheerful speech revives. The angel Michael, to all the rest unseen, appeared before Godfredo's eyes in pure and heavenly armor richly dressed, brighter than Titan's rays in clearest skies. Godfrey, quoth he, this is the moment blessed to free this town that long in bondage lies. See, see what legions in thine aid I bring, for heaven assists thee, and heaven's glorious king. Lift up thine eyes, and in the air behold the sacred armies, how they mustered be. That cloud of flesh, in which from times of old all mankind rapid is, I take from thee, and from thy senses their thick mist unfold, that face to face thou mayst these spirits see, and for a little space right well sustain their glorious light, and view those angels plain. Behold the souls of every lord and knight that late bore arms and died for Christ's dear sake. How on thy side against this town they fight, and of thy joy and conquest will partake. There where the dust and smoke blind all men's sight, where stones and ruins such a heap do make, there Hugo fights, in thickest cloud embarred, and undermines that bulwark's groundwork hard. See Dudon yonder, who with sword and fire assails, and helps to scale the northern port, that with bold courage doth thy folk inspire, and rears their ladders gainst the salted fort. He that high on the mountain grave attire is clad, and crowned stands in kingly sort, is Bishop Adamer, a blessed spirit, blessed for his faith, 
crowned for his death and merit. But higher lift thy happy eyes, and view where all the sacred hosts of heaven appear. He looked, and saw where winged armies flew, innumerable, pure, divine, and clear. A battle round of squadrons three they shew, and all by threes those squadrons ranged were, which, spreading wide in rings, still wider go, moved with a stone, calm water circled so. With that he winked, and vanished was and gone that wondrous vision when he looked again. His worthies fighting viewed he one by one, and on each side saw signs of conquest plain. For with Rinaldo, gainst his yielding phone, his knights were entered, and the pagan slain. This scene the duke no longer stay could brook, but from the bearer bold his ensign took, and on the bridge he stepped, but there was stayed by Solomon, who entrance all denied. That narrow tree to virtue great was made the field, as in few blows right soon was tried. Here will I give my life for Zion's aid, here will I end my days, the soldan cried. Behind me cut or break this bridge, that I may kill a thousand Christians first, then die. But thither fierce Rinaldo threatening went, and at his sight fled all the soldan's train. What shall I do? If here my life be spent, I spend and spill, quoth he, my blood in vain. With that his steps from Godfrey back he bent, and to him let the passage free remain. Who threatening followed as the soldan fled, and on the walls the purple cross to spread. About his head he tossed, he turned, he cast that glorious ensign with a thousand twine. Thereon the wind breathes with his sweetest blast, Thereon with golden rays glad Phoebus shines, Earth laughs for joy, the streams forbear their haste, Floods clap their hands, on mountains dance the pines, And Sion's towers and sacred temples smile For their deliverance from that bondage vile. And now the armies reared the happy cry of victory, glad, joyful, loud, and shrill. The hills resound, the echo shouteth high, and Tancred bold, that fights in combat still with proud Argantes, brought his tower so nigh, that on the wall against the boaster's will, in his despite his bridge he also laid, and won the place, and there the cross displayed. But on the southern hill where Raymond fought against the townsmen and their aged king, his hardy Gascoigns gained small or not, their engine to the walls they could not bring, for thither all his strength the prince had brought for life and safety sternly combating. And for the wall was feeblest on that coast, there were his soldiers best and engines most. Besides, the tower upon that quarter found unsure, uneasy, and uneven the way, nor art could help, but that the rougher ground the rolling mass did often stop and stay. But now of victory the joyful sound the king and Raymond heard amid their fray, and by the shout they and their soldiers know the town was entered on the plain below. Which heard, Raimondo thus bespake this crew, The town is won, my friends, and doth it yet resist? Are we kept out still by these few? Shall we no share in this high conquest get? But from that part the king at last withdrew. He strove in vain their entrance there to let, And to a stronger place his folk he brought, Where to sustain the salt a while he thought. The conquerors at once now entered all, The walls were won, the gates were opened wide. Now bruised, broken down, destroyed fall The ports and towers that battery durst abide, Rageth the sword. Death, murdereth great and small, and proud, twixt woe and horror sad, doth ride. Here runs the blood, in ponds there stands the gore, and drowns the knights in whom it lived before. End of Book 18Book 19 of Jerusalem Delivered by Toquato Tasso Translated by Edward Fairfax This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland The Argument 
Tancred in single combat kills his foe Argantes strong. The king and Soldan fly to David's tower and save their persons so. Erminia well instructs Befrine the spy, with him she rides away, and as they go finds where her lord for dead on earth doth lie. First she laments, then cures him. Godfrey hears for Mondo's treason, and what marks he bears. Now death or fear or care to save their lives from their forsaken walls the pagans chase. Yet neither force nor fear nor wisdom drives the constant knight Argantes from his place. Alone against ten thousand foes he strives, yet dreadless, doubtless, careless seemed his face. Nor death nor danger but disgrace he fears, and still unconquered, though or set, appears. But amongst the rest, upon his helmet gay, with his broad sword, Tancredi came and smote. The pagan knew the prince by his array, by his strong blows, his armor, and his coat. For once they fought, and when night stayed that fray, new time they chose to end their combat hot. But Tancred failed, wherefore the pagan knight cried, Tancred, comest thou thus, thus late, to fight? Too late thou comest, and not alone, to war. But yet the fight I neither shun nor fear, although from knighthood true thou errest far, since like an engineer thou dost appear. That tower, that troop, thy shield and safety are, strange kind of arms in single fight to bear. Yet shalt thou not escape, O conqueror strong of ladies fair, sharp death to avenge that wrong. Lord Tancred smiled with disdain and scorn, and answered thus, to end our strife, quoth he, behold, at last I come, and my return, though late, perchance will be too soon for thee, for thou shalt wish, of hope and help forlorn, some sea or mountain placed twixt thee and me, and well shalt know before we end this fray, no fear or cowardice hath caused my stay. But come aside, thou by whose prowess dies the monsters, knights, and giants in all lands, the killer of weak women thee defies. This said, he turned to his fighting bands, and bids them all retire. Forbear, he cries, to strike this knight. On him let none lay hands, for mine he is, more than a common foe, by challenge new and promise old also. Descend, the fierce Circassian gan reply, alone, or all this troop for succor take, to deserts waste or place frequented high, for vantage none I will the fight forsake. Thus given and taken was the bold defy, and through the press agreed so they break. Their hatred made them one, and as they wend, each knight his foe did for despite defend. Great was his thirst of praise, great the desire that Tancred had the pagan's blood to spill, nor could that quench his wrath or calm his ire if other hand his foe should foil or kill. He saved him with his shield, and cried, Retire, to all he met, and do this knight none ill, and thus defending against his friends his foe, through thousand angry weapons safe they go. They left the city, and they left behind Godfredo's camp, and far beyond it passed, and came where into creeks and bosoms blind a winding hill his corners turned and cast. A valley small and shady dale they find amid the mountains steep, so laid and placed as if some theater or closed place had been for men to fight or beasts to chase. There stayed the champions both. With rueful eyes Argantes gan the fortress won to view. Tancred his foe without an shield espies, and far away his target therefore threw, and said, Whereon doth thy sad heart devise? Think'st thou this hour must end thy life untrue? If this thou fear, and dost foresee thy fate, thy fear is vain, thy foresight comes too late. I think, quoth he, on this distressed town, the aged queen of Judah's ancient land, now lost, now sacred, spoiled, and trodden down, whose fall in vain I strived to withstand, a small revenge for Sion's fort or throne that head can be, cut off by my strong hand. This said, together with great heed they flew, 
for each his foe for bold and hardy knew. Tancred of body active was and light, quick, nimble, ready both of hand and foot, but higher by the head the pagan knight of limbs far greater was, of heart as stout. Tancred laid low and traversed in his fight, now to his ward retired, now struck out. Oft with his sword his foe's fierce blows he broke, and rather chose to ward than bear his stroke. But bold and bolt upright Argantes fought, unlike in gesture, like in skill and art. His sword outstretched before him far he brought, nor would his weapon touch but pierce his heart. To catch his point Prince Tancred strove and sought, but at his breast or helm's unclosed part he threatened death and would with stretched out brand his entrance close and fierce assaults withstand. With a tall ship so doth a galley fight, when the still winds stir not the unstable main, where this in nimbleness as that in might excels, that stands, this goes and comes again, and shifts from prow to poop with turnings light. Meanwhile the other doth unmoved remain, and on her nimble foe approaching nigh, her weighty engines tumbleth down from high. The Christian sought to enter on his foe, voiding his point, which at his breast was bent. Argantes at his face a thrust did throw, which, while the prince awards and doth prevent, his ready hand the pagan turned so that all defence his quickness far or went, and pierced his side. Which done, he said and smiled, the craftsman is in his own craft beguiled. Tancredi bit his lip for scorn and shame nor longer stood on points of fence and skill, but to revenge so fierce and fast he came, as if his hand could not or take his will. And at his visor aiming just, gan frame to his proud boast an answer sharp, but still Argantes broke the thrust, and at half-sword swift, hardy, bold, in stepped the Christian lord. With his left foot fast forward gan he stride, and with his left the pagan's right arm hent. With his right hand, meanwhile, the man's right side he cut, he wounded, mangled, tore, and rent. To his victorious teacher, Tancred cried, his conquered scholar hath this answer sent. Argantes chafed, struggled, turned, and twined, yet could not so his captive arm unbind. His sword at last he let hang by the chain, and gripped his hardy foe in both his hands. In his strong arms Tancred caught him again, and thus each other held and wrapped in bands. With greater might Alcides did not strain the giant Antius on the Libyan sands. On holdfast knots their brawny arms they cast, and whom he hateth most, each held embraced. Such was their wrestling, such their shocks and throes, that down at once they tumbled both to ground. Argantes, were it hap or skill, who knows, his better hand loose and in freedom found, but the good prince, his hand more fit for blows, with his huge weight the pagan underbound. But he, his disadvantage great that knew, let go his hold, and on his feet up flew. Far slower rose the unwieldy Saracine, and caught a rap ere he was reared upright. But, as against the blustering winds, a pine now bends his top, now lifts his head on height, his courage so, when it can most decline, the man reinforced and advanced his might, and with fierce change of blows renewed the fray, where rage for skill, horror for art bore sway. The purple drops from Tancred's sides down railed, but from the pagan ran whole streams of blood, wherewith his force grew weak, his courage quailed, as fires die which fuel want or food. Tancred, that saw his feeble arm now failed to strike his blows, that scant he stirred or stood, assuaged his anger and his wrath allayed and stepping back thus gently spoke and said yield hardy knight and chance of war or me confess to have subdued thee in this fight i will no trophy triumph spoil of thee nor glory wish nor seek a victor's right more terrible than erst herewith grew he and all awaked his fury rage and might and said Darest thou advantage speak or think, or move Argantes once to yield or shrink? Use, use thy vantage. Thee and fortune both I scorn, and punish will thy foolish pride. 
as a hot brand flames most ere it forth goeth, and dying blazeth bright on every side, so he, when blood was lost, with anger wroth, revived his courage when his puissance died, and would his latest hour, which now drew nigh, illustrate with his end, and nobly die. He joined his left hand to her sister strong, and with them both let fall his weighty blade. Tancred, to ward his blow, his sword upflung, but that it smote aside, nor there it stayed, but from his shoulder to his side along it glanced, and many wounds at once it made, yet Tancred feared not, for in his heart found coward dread no place, fear had no part. His fearful blow he doubled, but he spent his force in waste, and all his strength in vain, for Tancred from the blow against him bent, leaped aside, the stroke fell on the plain. With thine own weight or throne to earth thou went, Argantes stout, nor couldst thyself sustain. Thyself thou threwest down, O happy man, Upon whose fall none boast or triumph can. His gaping wounds, the fall set open wide, The streams of blood about him made a lake. Helped with his left hand, on one knee he tried To rear himself and new defense to make. The courteous prince stepped back, and, Yield thee, cried, no hurt he proffered him, no blow he strake. Meanwhile, by stealth, the pagan false him gave a sudden wound, threatening with speeches brave. Herewith Tancredi furious drew, and said, Villain, dost thou my mercy so despise? Therewith he thrust and thrust again his blade, and through his ventil pierced his dazzled eyes. Argantes died, yet no complaint he made, but as he furious lived, he careless dies. Bold, proud, disdainful, fierce, and void of fear, his motions last, last looks, last speeches were. Tancred put up his sword, and praises glad gave to his God that saved him in this fight. But yet this bloody conquest feebled had so much the conqueror's force, his strength and might, that through the way he feared, which homeward led, he had not strength enough to walk upright. Yet as he could, his steps from thence he bent, And foot by foot a heavy pace forth went. His legs could bear him but a little stound, And more he hastes, more tired, less was his speed. On his right hand at last, laid on the ground he leaned, His hand weak like a shaking reed, Dazzled his eyes, the world on wheels ran round, Day wrapped her brightness up in sable weed. At length, he swooned, and the victor knight not differed from his conquered foe in sight. But while these lords their private fight pursue, made fierce and cruel through their secret hate, the victor's ire destroyed the faithless crew from street to street, and chased from gate to gate. But of the sacked town the image true who can describe or paint the woeful state, or with fit words this spectacle express, who can? or tell the city's great distress. Blood, murder, death, each street, house, church defiled. There heaps of slain appear, there mountains high. There, underneath unburied hills, up piled of bodies dead, the living buried lie. There the sad mother with her tender child doth tear her tresses loose, complain and fly. And there the spoiler by her amber hair draws to his lust, the virgin chaste and fair. But through the way that to the west hill yode, whereon the old and stately temple stands, all soiled with gore and wet with lukewarm blood, Rinaldo ran and chased the pagan bands. Above their heads he heaved his curtlax good, life in his grace and death lay in his hands. Nor helm nor target strong his blows off bears, Best armed there seemed he no arms that wears, For against his armed foes he only bends his force, And scorns the naked folk to wound. Them whom no courage arms, no arms defends, He chased with his looks and dreadful sound. Oh, who can tell how far his force extends, How these he scorns, threats those, lays them on ground, How with unequal harm, with equal fear, Fled all, all that well armed or naked were. Fast fled the people weak, and with the same a squadron strong is to the temple gone, 
which burnt and builded oft still keeps the name of the first founder, wise King Solomon. That prince this stately house did whilom frame of cedar trees, of gold and marble stone, now not so rich, yet strong and sure it was, with turrets high, thick walls, and doors of brass. The knight arrived where in warlike sort the men that ample church had fortified, and closed found each wicket, gate, and port, and on the top defences ready spied, he lift his frowning looks, and twice that fort from his high top down to the groundwork eyed, and entrance sought, and twice with his swift foot the mighty place he measured about. Like as a wolf about the closed fold rangeth by night his hoped prey to get, enraged with hunger and with malice old, which kind twixt him and harmless sheep hath set, so searched he high and low about that hold where he might enter without stop or let. In the great court he stayed, his foes above attend the salt and would their fortune prove. There lay by chance a posted tree thereby kept for some needful use, whate'er it were, the armed galleys not so thick nor high their tall and lofty masts at jeans uprear. This beam the knight against the gates made fly from his strong hands, all weights which lift and bear. Like a light lance the tree he shook and tossed, and bruised the gate, the threshold, and the post. No marble stone, no metal strong outbore the wondrous might of that redoubled blow. The brazen hinges from the wall it tore, it broke the locks, and laid the doors down low. No iron ram, no engine could do more, nor cannons great that thunderbolts forthrow. His people like a flowing stream in throng, and after them entered the victor strong. The woeful slaughter black and loathsome made that house, sometime the sacred house of God. O oh, heavenly justice, if thou be delayed, on wretched sinners sharper falls thy rod. In them this place profaned which invade, Thou kindled ire, and mercy all forbrod, Until, with their heart's blood, The pagans vile this temple washed, Which they did late defile. But Solomon this while himself fast sped up to the fort, Which David's tower is named. And with him all the soldiers left he led, And gainst each entrance new defences framed. The tyrant Aladine eat thither fled, to whom the soldan thus far off exclaimed, Come, come, renowned king, up to this rock, thyself within this fortress safe up lock. For well this fortress shall thee and thy crown defend. A while here may we safe remain. Alas, quoth he, alas, for this fair town, which cruel war beats down even with the plain. My life is done, mine empire trodden down. I reigned, I lived, but now nor live nor reign. For now, alas, behold, the fatal hour that ends our life and ends our kingly power. Where is your virtue? Where your wisdom grave and courage stout? The angry soldan said. Let chance our kingdoms take, which erst she gave. Yet in our hearts our kingly worth is laid. But come and in this fort your person save, refresh your weary limbs, and strength decayed. Thus counseled he, and did to safety bring within that fort the weak and aged king. His iron mace in both his hands he hent, and on his thigh his trusty sword he tied, and to the entrance fierce and fearless went, and kept the strait, and all the French defied. The blows were mortal which he gave or lent, for whom he hit he slew, else by his side laid low on earth, that all fled from the place where they beheld that great and dreadful mace. But old Raimondo with his hearty crew by chance came thither, to his great mishap. To that defended path the old man flew, and scorned his blows, and him that kept the gap. He struck his foe, his blow no blood forth drew, but on the front with that he caught a rap, which in a swoon low in the dust him laid wide open, trembling, with his arms displayed. The pagans gathered heart at last, though fear, their courage weak, had put to flight, but late, so that the conquerors repulsed were, and beaten back, else slain before the gate. The soldan, amongst the dead beside him, near that saw Lord Raymond lie in such a state, cried to his men, Within these bars, quoth he, come draw this knight, 
and let him captive be. Forward they rushed to execute his word, but hard and dangerous that emprise they found, for none of Raymond's men forsook their lord, but to their guide's defense they flocked round. Thence fury fights, hence pity draws the sword, nor strive they for vile cause or on light ground. The life and freedom of that champion brave, those spoil, these would preserve, those kill, these save. But yet at last, if they had longer fought, the hardy Soldan would have won the field, for gainst his thundering mace availed not, or helm of temper fine, or sevenfold shield. But from each side great succor now was brought to his weak foes, now fit to faint and yield and both at once to aid and help the same the sovereign duke and young rinaldo came as when a shepherd raging round about that sees a storm with wind hail thunder rain when gloomy clouds have day's bright eye put out his tender flocks drives from the open plain to some thick grove or mountain's shady foot where heaven's fierce wrath they may unhurt sustain and with his hook his whistle and his cries drives forth his fleecy charge and with them flies so fled the soldan when he gan descry this tempest come from angry war forthcast the armor clashed and lightened against the sky and from each side swords weapons fire outbrast he sent his folk up to the fortress high to shun the furious storm himself stayed last yet to the danger he gave place at length for wit his courage wisdom ruled his strength but scant the night was safe the gate within scant closed were the doors when having broke the bars rinaldo doth assault begin against the port and on the wicket stroke his matchless might his great desire to win his oath and promise doth his wrath provoke for he had sworn nor should his word be vain to kill the man that had prince sueno slain now his armed hand that castle great would have assaulted and had shortly won nor safe perdy the soldan there a seat had found his fatal foe's sharp wrath to shun had not godfredo sounded the retreat for now dark shades to shroud the earth begun within the town the duke would lodge that night and with the morn renew the salt and fight with cheerful look thus to his folk he said my god hath holpen well his children dear this work is done the rest this night delayed doth little labor bring less doubt no fear this tower our foe's weak hope and latest aid we conquer will when sun shall next appear meanwhile with love and tender ruth go see and comfort those which hurt and wounded be go cure their wounds which boldly ventured their lives and spilt their blood to get this hold that fitteth more this host for christ forth led than thirst of vengeance or desire of gold too much ah too much blood this day is shed in some we too much haste to spoil behold but i command no more you spoil and kill and let a trumpet publish forth my will this said he went where Raymond panting lay, waked from the swoon wherein he late had been. Nor Solomon, with countenance less gay, bespake his troops, and kept his grief unseen. My friends, you are unconquered this day, in spite of fortune, still our hope is green, for underneath great shows of harm and fear, our dangers small, our losses little were. Burnt are your houses, and your people slain, yet safe your town is though your walls be gone for in yourselves and in your sovereign consists your city not in lime and stone your king is safe and safe is all his train in this strong fort defended from their foam and on this empty conquest let them boast till with this town again their lives be lost and on their heads the loss at last will light for with good fortune proud and insolent in spoil and murder spend they day and night in riot drinking lust and ravishment and may amid their praise with little fight at ease be overthrown killed slain and spent if in this carelessness the egyptian host upon them fall which now draws near this coast meanwhile the highest buildings of this town we may shake down with stones about their ears 
and with our darts and spears from engines thrown command that hill christ's sepulchre that bears thus comforts he their hopes and hearts cast down awakes their valors and exiles their fears but while these things hap thus the Frino goes unknown amid ten thousand armed foes the sun nigh set had brought to end the day when vafrin went the pagan host to spy he passed unknown a close and secret way a traveller false cunning crafty sly past ascalon he saw the morning gray step o'er the threshold of the eastern sky and ere bright titan half his course had run that camp that mighty host to show begun tents infinite and standards broad he spies this red that white that blue this purple was and hears strange tongues and stranger harmonies of trumpets clarions and well-sounding brass the elephant there brays the camel cries the horses neigh as to and fro they pass which seen and heard he said within his thought hither all asia is all Africa brought he viewed the camp awhile her sight and seat what ditch what trench it had what rampire strong nor close nor secret ways to work his feet he longer sought nor hid him from the throng but entered through the gates broad royal great and oft he asked and answered oft among in questions wise in answers short and sly bold was his look eyes quick front lifted high on every side he pried here and there and marked each way each passage and each tent the knights he notes their steeds and arms they bear their names their armor and their government and greater secrets hopes to learn and hear their hidden purpose and their close intent so long he walked and wandered till he spied the way to approach the great pavilion's side there as he looked he saw the canvas rent through which the voice found eath and open way from the close lodgings of the regal tent and inmost closet where the captain lay so that if emireno spake forth went the sound to them that listen what they say there vafrin watched and those that saw him thought to mend the breach that there he stood and wrought the captain great within bareheaded stood his body armed and clad in purple weed two pages bore his shield and helmet good he leaning on a bending lance gave heed to a big man whose looks were fierce and proud with whom he parlayed of some haughty deed godfredo's name as vafrin watched he heard which made him give more heed take more regard thus spake the chieftain to that surly sire art thou so sure that godfrey shall be slain i am quoth he and swear ne'er to retire except he first be killed to court again i will prevent those that with me conspire nor other guerdon ask i for my pain but that i may hang up his harness brave at Cair, and under them these words engrave these arms ormondo took in noble fight from godfrey proud that spoiled all asia's lands and with them took his life and here on height in memory thereof this trophy stands the duke replied ne'er shall that deed bold knight pass unrewarded at our sovereign's hands what thou demandest shall he gladly grant nor gold nor guerdon shalt thou wish or want those counterfeited armors then prepare because the day of fight reproacheth fast they ready are quoth he then both forbear from further talk these speeches were the last Befrine, these great things heard with grief and care remained astound and in his thoughts oft cast what treason false this was how feigned were those arms but yet that doubt he could not clear from thence he parted and broad waking lay all that long night nor slumbered once nor slept but when the camp by peep of springing day their banners spread and knights on horseback leapt with them he marched forth in meet array and where they pitched lodged and with them kept and then from tent to tent he stalked about to hear and see and learn this secret out searching about on a rich throne he found armida set with dames and knights around sullen she sat and sighed it seemed she scanned some weighty matters in her thoughts profound her rosy cheek leaned on her lily hand her eyes 
love's twinkling stars, she bent to ground. Weep she or no, he knows not, yet appears her humid eyes e'en great with child with tears. He saw before her set a drastus grim, that seemed scant to live, move, or respire, so was he fixed on his mistress trim, so gazed he, and fed his fond desire. But Tisiphern beheld now her, now him, and quaked sometime for love, sometime for ire, and in his cheeks the color went and came, for there wrath's fire now burnt, now shone love's flame. Then from the garland fair of virgins bright, Mongst whom he lay enclosed, Rose Altamore, his hot desire he hid and kept from sight. His looks were ruled by Cupid's crafty lore, His left eye viewed her hand, her face, His right both watched her beauty's hid and secret store, And entrance found where her thin veil bewrayed The milken way between her breasts that lay. Her eyes are Mida lift from earth at last, And cleared again her front and visage sad. Midst clouds of woe her looks which overcast, She lightened forth a smile, sweet, pleasant, glad. My lord, quoth she, your oath and promise past, Hath freed my heart of all the griefs it had, That now in hope of sweet revenge it lives, Such joy, such ease, desired vengeance gives. Cheer up thy looks, answered the Indian king, And for sweet beauty's sake appease thy woe. Cast at your feet, ere you expect the thing, I will present the head of thy strong foe. Else shall this hand his person captive bring, And cast in prison deep, he boasted so. His rival heard him well, yet answered not, But bit his lips and grieved in secret thought. To Tisiphern the damsel turning right, and what say you, my noble lord, quoth she? He taunting said, I that am slow to fight will follow far behind, The worth to see of this your terrible and puissant knight. In scornful words this bitter scoff gave he. Good reason, quoth the king, thou come behind, Nor e'er compare thee with the prince of Ind. Lord Tisiphernes shook his head and said, Oh, had my power free like my courage been, or had I liberty to use this blade, Who slow, who weakest is, soon should be seen. Nor thou, nor thy great vaunts make me afraid, But cruel love thy fear and this fair queen. This said, to challenge him the king forth leapt, But up his mistress start and twixt them stepped. Will you thus rob me of that gift, quoth she, Which each hath vowed to give by word and oath? You are my champions. Let that title be the bond of love and peace between you both. He that displeased is, is displeased with me. For which of you is grieved, and I not wroth? Thus warned she them, their hearts, for iron I broke, In forced peace and rest thus bore love's yoke. All this heard Vafrin as he stood beside, And having learned the truth, he left the tent. That treason was against the Christian's guide, Contrived he wist, yet wist not how it went. By words and questions far off he tried to find the truth. More difficult, more bent was he to know it, and resolved to die, or of that secret close intent to spy. Of sly intelligence he proved all ways, all crafts, all wiles that in his thoughts abide. Yet all in vain the man by wit assays to know that false compact and practice hid. But chance, what wisdom could not tell, bewrays, Fortune of all his doubt, the knots undid, So that, prepared for Godfrey's last mishap, At ease he found the net, and spied the trap. Thither he turned again, where seated was The angry lover twixt her friends and lords, For in that troop much talk he thought would pass, Each great assembly store of news affords, he sided there a lusty, lovely lass, And with some courtly terms the wench he boards. He feigns acquaintance, and as bold appears As he had known that virgin twenty years. He said, Would some sweet lady grace me so To choose me for her champion, friend, and knight? Proud Godfrey's of Rinaldo's head, I trow, Would feel the sharpness of my curtlax bright. Ask me the head, fair mistress, of some foe, For to your beauty vow it is my might. 
so he began, and meant in speeches wise further to wade, but thus he broke the ice. Therewith he smiled, and smiling gan to frame his looks so to their old and native grace, that towards him another virgin came, heard him, beheld him, and with bashful face said, For thy mistress choose no other dame but me, on me thy love and service place. I take thee for my champion, and apart would reason with thee, if my knight thou art. Withdrawn, she thus began, the frine, pardie, I know thee well, and me thou knowst of old. To his last trump this drove the subtle spy, but smiling towards her he turned him bold. Ne'er that I wot I saw thee erst with eye, yet for thy worth all eyes should thee behold. Thus much I know right well. For from the same which erst thou gave me, different is my name. My mother bore me near Bizerta's wall. Her name was Lesbin. Mine is Almansor. I knew long since, quoth she, what men thee call, and thine estate dissemble it no more. From me thy friend, hide not thyself at all. If I bewray thee, let me die therefore. I am Erminia, daughter to a prince, but Tancred's slave, thy fellow servant since. Two happy months within that prison kind under thy guard rejoiced I to dwell, and thee a keeper meek and good did find. The same, the same I am, behold me well. The squire her lovely beauty called to mind, and marked her visage fair. From thee expel all fear, she says, for me live safe and sure, I will thy safety, not thy harm procure. But yet I pray thee, when thou dost return, to my dear prison lead me home again. For in this hateful freedom, even and mourn I sigh for sorrow, mourn and weep for pain. But if to spy perchance thou here sojourn, great hap thou hast to know these secrets plain, for I their treasons false, false trains can say, which few beside can tell, none will be ray. On her he gazed, and silent stood this while, Armida's slights he knew, and trains unjust. Women have tongues of craft and hearts of guile. They will, they will not, fools that on them trust, for in their speech is death, hell in their smile. At last he said, If hence depart you lust, I will you guide. On this conclude we here, and further speech till fitter time forbear. Forthwith, ere thence the camp removed, to ride they were resolved, their flight that season fits. Vafrine departs, she to the dames beside returns, and there on thorns a while she sits. Of her new knight she talks, till time and tide to scape unmarked she finds, then forth she gets, thither where Vafrine her unseen abode, there took she horse, and from the camp they rode and now in deserts waste and wild arrived, far from the camp, far from resort and sight, Befrine began, against Godfrey's life contrived, the false compacts and trains unfold a right. Then she, those treasons from their spring derived, repeats, and brings their hid deceits to light. Eight knights, she says, all courtiers brave there are, but Ormond strong the rest surpasseth far. These, whether hate or hope of gain them move, conspired have, and frame their treason so. That day when Emeren by fight shall prove to win lost Asia from his Christian foe, these with the cross scored on their arms above, and armed like Frenchmen, will disguised go like Godfrey's garb that gold and white do wear. Such shall their habit be, and such their gear. Yet each will bear a token in his crest, that so their friends for pagans may them know. But in close fight, when all the soldiers best shall mingled be, to give the fatal blow they will creep near and pierce Godfredo's breast, while of his faithful guard they bear false show, and all their swords are dipped in poison strong, because each wound shall bring sad death ere long. And, for their chieftain wist I knew your guise, what garments, ensigns, and what arms you carry, and those feigned arms he forced me to devise, so that from yours but small or not they vary. But these unjust commands my thoughts despise. Within their camp, therefore, I list not tarry. My heart abhors I should this hand defile with spot of treason or with act of guile. 
this is the cause, but not the cause alone, and there she ceased and blushed, and on the main cast down her eyes, these last words scant out gone, she would have stopped, nor durst pronounce them plain, the squire what she concealed would know, as one that from her breast her secret thoughts could strain, of little faith, quoth he, why wouldst thou hide those causes true from me, thy squire and guide? With that she fetched a sigh, sad, sore, and deep, and from her lips her words slow trembling came. Fruitless, she said, untimely, hard to keep, vain modesty farewell and farewell shame. Why hope you, restless love, to bring on sleep? Why strive you, fires, to quench sweet Cupid's flame? No, no, such cares and such respects beseem great ladies, wandering maids them not esteem. That night, fatal to me and Antioch town, then made a prey to her commanding foe, my loss was greater than was seen or known. There ended not, but thence began my woe. Light was the loss of friends, of realm or crown, but with my state I lost myself also, ne'er to be found again, for then I lost my wit, my sense, my heart, my soul almost. Through fire and sword, through blood and death, Befrine, which all my friends did burn, did kill, did chase, thou knowst I ran to thy dear lord and mine when first he entered at my father's place, and kneeling with salt tears in my swollen eye, Great prince, quoth I, Grant mercy, pity, grace, save not my kingdom, not my life, I said, but save mine honor, let me die a maid. He lift me by the trembling hand from ground, nor stayed he till my humble speech was done, but said, A friend and keeper hast thou found, fair virgin, nor to me in vain you run. A sweetness strange from that sweet voice's sound pierced my heart, my breast's weak fortress won, which creeping through my bosom soft, became a wound, a sickness, and a quenchless flame. He visits me. With speeches kind and grave, he sought to ease my grief and sorrow's smart. He said, I give thee liberty, for save all that is thine, and at thy will depart. Alas, he robbed me when he thought he gave. Free was Herminia, but captived her heart. Mine was the body, his the soul and mind. He gave the cage, but kept the bird behind. But who can hide desire or love suppress? Oft of his worth with thee in talk I strove. Thou, by my trembling fit, that well couldst guess what fever held me, saidst, Thou art in love. But I denied, for what can maids do less? And yet my sighs thy sayings true did prove. Instead of speech, my looks, my tears, mine eyes told in what flame, what fire thy mistress fries. Unhappy silence. Well I might have told my woes, and for my harms have sought relief, since now my pains and plaints I utter bold, where none that hears can help or ease my grief. From him I parted, and did close upfold my wounds within my bosom, Death was chief of all my hopes and helps, Till love's sweet flame plucked off the bridle of respect and shame, And caused me ride to seek my lord and knight, For he that made me sick could make me sound. But on an ambush I mischanced to light, Of cruel men in armor clothed round. Hardly I escaped their hand by mature flight, And fled to wilderness and desert ground, And there I lived in groves and forests wild, With gentle grooms and shepherds' daughters mild. But when hot love, which fear had late suppressed, Revived again, there nold I longer sit, But rode the way I came, Nor e'er took rest till on like danger, Like mishap I hit. A troop, to forage and to spoil addressed, Encountered me, nor could I fly from it, thus was I tain, and those that had me caught Egyptians were, and me to Gaza brought, and for a present to their captain gave, whom I entreated and besought so well, that he mine honor had great care to save, and since with fair Armida let me dwell. Thus taken oft, escaped oft I have, 
Ah, see what haps I passed, what dangers fell. So often captive, free so oft again, Still my first bands I keep, still my first chain. And he that did this chain so surely bind About my heart, which none can loose but he, Let him not say, go, wandering damsel, Find some other home, thou shalt not bide with me. But let him welcome me with speeches kind, And in my wanted prison set me free. Thus spake the princess. Thus she and her guide talked day and night, And on their journey ride. Through the highways Befrino would not pass, A path more secret, safe, and short he knew. And now close by the city's wall he was When sun was set, night in the east up flew. With drops of blood besmeared he found the grass, And saw where lay a warrior murdered new, That all be bled the ground. His face to skies he turns, And seems to threat, though dead he lies. His harness and his habit both bereaved he was a pagan. Forward went the squire, And saw whereas another champion laid dead on the land, All soiled with blood and mire. This was some Christian knight, Befrino said, And, Marking well his arms and rich attire, he loosed his helm, and saw his visage plain, and cried, Alas, here lies Tancredi slain. The woeful virgin tarried and gave heed to the fierce looks of that proud Saracen, till that high cry full of sad fear and dread pierced through her heart with sorrow, grief, and pine. At Tancred's name, thither she ran with speed, Like one half mad or drunk with too much wine, And when she saw his face, pale, bloodless, dead, She lighted, nay, she stumbled from her steed. Her springs of tears she looseth forth, and cries, Hither why bringst thou me off fortune blind, Where dead, for whom I lived, my comfort lies? Where war for peace, travail for rest I find, Tancred, I have thee, see thee, yet thine eyes look not upon thy love and handmaid kind. Undo their doors, their lids fast closed sever. Alas, I find thee for to lose thee ever. I never thought that to mine eyes, my dear, thou couldst have grievous or unpleasant been. But now would blind, or rather dead I were, that thy sad plight might be unknown, unseen. Alas, where is thy mirth and smiling cheer? Where are thine eyes' clear beams and sparkles sheen? Of thy fair cheek, where is the purple red, And forehead's whiteness are all gone, all dead? Though gone, though dead, I love thee still. Behold, death wounds, but kills not love. Yet, if thou live, sweet soul, still in his breast, my follies bold, ah, pardon, love's desires and stealths forgive. Grant me from his pale mouth some kisses cold, Since death doth love of just reward deprive, And of thy spoils sad death afford me this. Let me his mouth, pale, cold, and bloodless, kiss. O oh, gentle mouth, with speeches kind and sweet Thou didst relieve my grief, my woe, and pain. Ere my weak soul from this frail body fleet, Ah, comfort me with one dear kiss or twain. Perchance if we alive had happed to meet, They had been given which now are stolen. O oh, vain, O oh, feeble life, betwixt his lips outfly. O oh, let me kiss thee first, then let me die. Receive my yielding spirit, And with thine guide it to heaven, Where all true love hath place. This said, she sighed and tore her tresses fine, And from her eyes two streams poured on his face. The man, revived with those showers divine, Awaked, and opened his lips a space. His lips were open, but fast shut his eyes, And with her sighs one sigh from him upflies. The dame perceived that Tancred breathed and sight, Which calmed her grief some deal and eased her fears. Unclose thine eyes, she says, my lord and knight. See my last services, my plaints and tears. See her that dies to see thy woeful plight, That of thy pain her part and portion bears. Once look on me, 
small is the gift I crave, the last which thou canst give or I can have. Tancred looked up and closed his eyes again, heavy and dim, and she renewed her woe. Quoth Baffrin, cure him first and then complain. Medicine is life's chief friend, plaint her most foe. They plucked his armor off, and she, each vein, each joint and sinew felt, and handled so, and searched so well each thrust, each cut and wound, that hope of life her love and skill soon found. From weariness and loss of blood she spied his greatest pains and anguish most proceed. Not but her veil amid those deserts wide she had to bind his wounds in so great need. But love could other bands, though strange, provide, and pity wept for joy to see that deed. For with her amber locks cut off, each wound she tied, O oh, happy man so cured, so bound. For why? Her veil was short and thin, those deep and cruel hurts to fasten, roll and bind, nor salve nor simple had she. Yet to keep her knight on live, the strong charms of wondrous kind, she said, and from him drove that deadly sleep, that now his eyes he lifted, turned and whined, and saw his squire, and saw that courteous dame in habit strange, and wondered whence she came. He said, O Vaffrin, tell me whence comest thou, and who this gentle surgeon is disclosed. She smiled, she sighed, she looked, she wist not how, she wept, rejoiced, she blushed as red as rose. You shall know all, she says. Your surgeon now commands you silence, rest, and soft repose. You shall be sound, prepare my guerdon meet. His head then laid she in her bosom sweet. The Thrine devised this while how he might bear his master home, ere night obscured the land, when lo, a troop of soldiers did appear, whom he described to be Tancredi's band. With him, when he and Argant met, they were. But when they went to combat hand for hand, he bade them stay behind, and they obeyed, but came to seek him now, so long he stayed. Besides them, many followed that in quest, but these alone found out the rightest way. Upon their friendly arms the men addressed a seat, whereon he sat, he leaned, he lay. Quoth Tancred, Shall the strong Circassian rest in this broad field for wolves and crows of prey? Ah, no, defraud not you that champion brave of his just praise, of his due tomb and grave. With his dead bones no longer war have I. Boldly he died and nobly was he slain. Then let us not that honor him deny which after death a lonely doth remain. The pagan dead they lifted up on high, and after Tancred bore him through the plain. Close by the virgin chaste did Vaffrin ride, as he that was her squire, her guard, her guide. Not home, quoth Tancred, to my wonted tent, but bear me to this royal town, I pray, that if cut short by human accident I die, there I may see my latest day, the place where Christ upon his cross was rent, to heaven perchance may easier make the way, and ere I yield to deaths and fortune's rage, performed shall be my vow and pilgrimage. Thus to the city was Tancredi born, and fell on sleep, laid on a bed of down. But Frino, where the damsel might sojourn a chamber got, close, secret, near his own. That done, he came, the mighty duke before, and entrance found. For till his news were known, naught was concluded amongst those knights and lords, their counsel hung on his report and words. Where, weak and weary, wounded raiment laid, Godfrey was set upon his couch's side, and round about the man a ring was made of lords and knights that filled the chamber wide. There, while the squire his late discovery said, To break his talk none answered, none replied. My lord, he said, at your command I went, And viewed their camp, each cabin, booth, and tent. But of that mighty host the number true Expect not that I can or should descry, 
all covered with their armies might you view the fields the plains the dales and mountains high i saw what way soe'er they went and drew they spoiled the land drunk floods and fountains dry for not whole jordan could have given them drink nor all the grain in syria bred i think but yet amongst them many bands are found both horse and foot of little force and might that keep no order no no trumpet sound that draw no sword but far off shoot and fight but yet the persian army doth abound with many a footman strong and hardy knight so doth the king's own troop which all is framed of soldiers old the mortal squadron name it immortal call it is that band of right for of that number never wanteth one but in his empty place some other knight steps in when any man is dead or gone this army's leader emireno hight like whom in wit and strength are few or none who hath in charge in plain and pitched field to fight with you to make you fly or yield and well i know their army and their host within a day or two will here arrive but thee rinaldo it behoveth most to keep thy noble head for which they strive for all the chief in arms or courage boast they will the same to queen armida give and for the same she gives herself in price such hire will many hands to work entice the chief of these that have thy murder sworn is altamore the king of samarcand adrastus then whose realm lies near the morn a hardy giant bold and strong of hand this king upon an elephant is born for under him no horse can stir or stand the third is tisiphern as brave a lord as ever put on helm or girt on sword this said from young rinaldo's angry eyes flew sparks of wrath flames in his visage shine he longed to be amid those enemies nor rest nor reason in his heart could find but to the duke the frine his talk applies the greatest news my lord are yet behind for all their thoughts their crafts and counsels tend by treason false to bring thy life to end then all from point to point again expose the false compact how it was made and wrought the arms and ensigns feigned poison close or mondo's vaunt what praise what thank he sought and what reward and satisfied all those that would demand inquire or ask of aught silence was made a while when godfrey thus raimondo say what counsel givest thou us not as we purpose late next morn quoth he let us not scale but round besiege this tower that those within may have no issue free to sally out and hurt us with their power our camp well rested and refreshed see provided well against this last storm and shower and then in pitched field fight if you will if not delay and keep this fortress still but lest you be endangered hurt or slain of all your cares take care yourself to save by you this camp doth live doth win doth reign who else can rule or guide these squadrons brave and for the traitors shall be noted plain command your guard to change the arms they have so shall their guile be known in their own net so shall they fall caught in the snare they set as it hath ever thus the duke begun thy counsel shows thy wisdom and thy love and what you left in doubt shall thus be done we will their force in pitched battle prove closed in this wall and trench the fight to shun doth ill this camp beseem and worse behoove but we their strength and manhood will assay and try in open field and open day the fame of our great conquests to sustain or bide our looks and threats they are not able and when this army is subdued and slain then is our empire settled firm and stable the tower shall yield or but resist in vain for fear her anchor is to spare her cable thus he concludes and rolling down the west fast set the stars and call them all to rest end of book nineteen book twenty of jerusalem delivered by toquato tasso 
Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument The pagan host arrives, and cruel fight makes with the Christians and their faithful power. The Soldan longs in field to prove his might, with the old king quits the besieged tower. Yet both are slain, and in eternal night a famous hand gives each his fatal hour. Rinald appeased Armida. First the field the Christians win, then praise to God they yield. The sun called up the world from idle sleep, and of the day ten hours were gone and passed, when the bold troop that had the tower to keep espied a sudden mist that overcast the earth with murksome clouds and darkness deep, and saw it was the Egyptian camp at last which raised the dust, for hills and valleys broad that host did overspread and overload. There with a merry shout and joyful cry the pagans reared from the besieged hold, the cranes from Thrace with such a rumor fly, his hoary frost and snow when Hyam's old pours down, and fast to warmer regions high, from the sharp winds, fierce storms, and tempests cold. And quick and ready this new hope and aid their hands to shoot, their tongues to threaten made. From whence their ire, their wrath, and hardy threat proceeds, the French well knew and plain espied. For from the walls and ports the army great they saw, her strength, her number, pomp, and pride, swelled their breasts with valor's noble heat. Battle and fight they wished. Arm, arm, they cried. The youth, to give the sign of fight, all prayed their duke, and were displeased because delayed till morning next, for he refused to fight. Their haste and heat he bridled, but not break. Nor yet, with sudden fray or skirmish light, of these new foes would he vain trial make. After so many wars, he says, good right it is that one day's rest at least to take, for thus in his vain foes he cherish would the hope which in their strength they have and hold. To see Aurora's gentle beam appear the soldiers armed, pressed and ready lay. The skies were never half so fair and clear as in the breaking of that blessed day. The merry morning smiled and seemed to wear upon her silver crown sun's golden ray, and without cloud heaven his redoubled light bent down to see this field, this fray, this fight. When first he saw the daybreak show and shine, Godfrey his host in good array brought out, and to besiege the tyrant Aladine, Raymond he left, and all the faithful rout that from the towns was come of Palestine to serve and succor their deliverer stout and with them left a hardy troop beside of Gascoigne strong, in arms well proved, oft tried. Such was Godfredo's countenance, such his cheer, that from his eye sure conquest flames and streams. Heaven's gracious favors in his looks appear, and great and goodly more than erst he seems. His face and forehead full of noblest were, and on his cheek smiled youth's purple beams, and in his gait, his grace, his acts, his eyes, somewhat far more than mortal lives and lies. He had not marched far, ere he aspired of his proud foes the mighty host draw nigh. A hill at first he took and fortified at his left hand, which stood his army by. Broad in the front, behind, more straight up tired, his army ready stood the fight to try, and to the middle ward, well armed, he brings his footmen strong, his horsemen served for wings. To the left wing, spread underneath the bent of the steep hill that saved their flank and side, the Roberts twain, two leaders good, he sent. His brother had the middle word to guide. To the right wing himself in person went, down where the plain was dangerous, broad and wide, and where his foes, with their great numbers, would perchance environ round his squadrons bold. There all his Lorrainers and men of might, all his best armed he placed, and chosen bands, and with those horse some footmen, armored light, that archers were, used to that service, stands. The adventurers then, in battle and in fight well tried, a squadron famous through all lands, on the right hand he set, some deal aside. Rinaldo was their leader, lord, and guide, to whom the duke. In thee our hope is laid of victory. Thou must the conquest gain. Behind this mighty wing so far displayed, thou with thy noble squadron close remain. And when the pagans would our backs invade, assail them then, and make their onset vain. For if I guess aright, they have in mind to compass us, and charge our troops behind. Then through his host, that took so large a scope, he rode, and viewed them all, both horse and foot. 
his face was bare, his helm unclosed and ope, lightened his eyes, his looks bright fire shot out. He cheers the fearful, comforts them that hope, and to the bold recounts his boasting stout, and to the valiant his adventures hard. These bids he look for praise, those for reward. At last he stayed, whereof his squadrons bold and noblest troops assembled was best part. There from a rising bank his will he told, and all that heard his speech thereat took heart. And as the molten snow from mountains cold runs down in streams, with eloquence and art, so from his lips his words and speeches fell, shrill, speedy, pleasant, sweet, and placid well. My hardy host, you conquerors of the east, you scourge wherewith Christ whips his heathen phone, of victory behold the latest feast, see the last day for which you wished alone. Not without cause the Saracens, most and least, our gracious Lord hath gathered here in one, for all your foes and his assembled are, that one day's fight may end seven years of war. This fight shall bring us many victories, the danger none, the labor will be small. Let not the number of your enemies dismay your hearts, grant fear no place at all, for strife and discord through their army flies, their bands ill-ranked themselves entangle shall, and few of them to strike or fight shall come, for some want strength, some heart, some elbow room. This host, with whom you must encounter now, are men half naked, without strength or skill, from idleness or following the plough, late pressed forth to war against their will. Their swords are blunt, shields thin, soon pierced through. Their banners shake, their bearers shrink, for ill their leaders heard, obeyed, or followed be. Their loss, their flight, their death, I well foresee. Their captain, clad in purple, armed in gold, that seems so fierce, so hardy, stout, and strong, the Moors, or weak Arabians, vanquished good, yet can he not resist your valors long. What can he do, though wise, though sage, though bold, in that confusion, trouble, thrust, and throng? Ill known is he, and worse he knows his host. Strange lords ill feared are, ill obeyed of most. But I am captain of this chosen crew, with whom I oft have conquered, triumphed oft. Your lands and lineages, long since I knew, each knight obeys my rule, mild, easy, soft. I know each sword, each dart, each shaft I view, although the quarrel fly in skies aloft, whether the same of Ireland be or France, and from what bow it comes, what hand perchance. I ask an easy and a usual thing, as you have oft, this day so win the field. Let zeal and honor be your virtue's sting. Your lives, my fame, Christ's faith, defend and shield. To earth these pagans slain and wounded bring. Tread on their necks, make them all die or yield. What need I more exhort you? From your eyes I see how victory, how conquest flies. Upon the captain, when his speech was done, it seemed a lamp and golden light down came as from night's azure mantle oft doth run or fall a sliding star or shining flame. But from the bosom of the burning sun proceeded this, and garland-wise the same Godfredo's noble head encompassed round, and, as some thought, foreshowed he should be crowned. Perchance, if man's proud thought or saucy tongue have leave to judge or guess at heavenly things, this was the angel which had kept him long, that now came down and hid him with his wings. While thus the duke bespeaks his armies strong, and every troop and band in order brings, Lord Emmeren his host disposed well, and with bold words whet on their courage fell. The man brought forth his army great with speed, in order good his foes at hand he spied. Like the new moon his host two horns did spread, in midst the foot, the horse were on each side. The right wing kept he for himself to lead. Great Altamore received the left to guide. The middle ward led Muliasis proud, and in that battle fair Armida stood. On the right quarter stood the Indian grim with Tisafern and all the king's own band. But where the left wing spread her squadrons trim, o'er the large plain did Altamoro stand, with African and Persian kings with him. 
and two that came from Meroe's hot sand, and all his crossbows and his slings he placed where room best served to shoot, to throw, to cast. Thus Emeren his host put in array, and rode from band to band, from rank to rank, his trookman now, and now himself, doth say what spoil his folk shall gain, what praise, what thank. To him that feared, look up, ours is the day, he says, vile fear to bold hearts never sank. How dareth one against an hundred fight? Our cry, our shade, will put them all to flight. But to the bold, go, hardy knight, he says, his prey out of the lion's paws go tear. To some before his thoughts the shape he lays, And makes therein the image true appear. How his sad country him entreats and prays, His house, his loving wife, his children dear. Suppose, quoth he, thy country doth beseech and pray thee thus. Suppose this is her speech. Defend my laws, uphold my temples brave, My blood from washing of my streets withhold, From ravishing my virgins keep, and save thine ancestors' dead bones and ashes cold. To thee thy father's dear and parents' grave show their uncovered heads white, hoary, old. To thee thy wife, her breasts with tears or spread, thy sons their cradles shows, thy marriage bed. To all the rest, you, for her honor's sake, whom Asia makes her champions, by your might upon these thieves, weak, feeble, few, must take a sharp revenge, yet just, deserved, and right. Thus many words in several tongues he spake, and all his sundry nations to sharp fight encourage it. But now the dukes had done their speeches all, the hosts together run. It was a great, a strange, and wondrous sight, when front to front those noble armies met, how every troop, how in each troop, each knight stood pressed to move, to fight, and praise to get. Loose in the wind wavered their ensign's light, trembled the plumes that on their crests were set. Their arms, impresses, colors, gold and stone, against the sunbeams smiled, flamed, sparkled, shone. Of dry-topped oaks they seemed two forests thick, so did each host with spears and pikes abound. Bent were their bows, in rest their lances stick, Their hands shook swords, their slings held cobbles round. Each steed to run was ready, pressed and quick, At his commander's spur, his hand is sound. He chafes, he stamps, careers, and turns about, He foams, snorts, neighs, and fire and smoke breathes out. Horror itself in that fair sight seemed fair, And pleasure flew amid sad dread and fear. The trumpets shrill that thundered in the air Were music mild and sweet to every ear. The faithful camp, though less, Yet seemed more rare in that strange noise, More warlike, shrill and clear, In notes more sweet. The pagan trumpets jar, these sung, Their armors shined, these glistered far. The Christian trumpets give the deadly call, The pagans answer and the fight accept. The godly Frenchmen on their knees down fall to pray and kiss the earth, and then up leapt to fight. The land between was vanished all, in combat close each host to other stepped, for now the wings had skirmish hot begun, and with their battles forth the footmen run. But who was first of all the Christian train that gave the onset first, first won renown? Gildippes, thou wert she? For by thee slain the king of Orms, her Cano, tumbled down. The man's breast-bone thou clovest and rent in twain, So heaven with honor would thee bless and crown. Pierced through he fell, and falling, heard with all his foe Praised for her strength and for his fall. Her lance thus broke, the hardy dame forth drew With her strong hand a fine and trenchant blade, And gainst the Persians fierce and bold she flew, And in their troop wide streets and lanes she made. Even in the girdling steed, divided new in pieces twain, a pyre on earth she laid. And then Alcaro's head she swept off clean, which like a football tumbled on the green. A blow felled Artaxerxes, with a thrust was Argius slain. The first lay in a trance. Ismael's left hand cut off fell in the dust, for on his wrist her sword fell down by chance. The hand let go the bridle where it lust. 
the blow upon the courser's ears did glance who felt the reins at large and with the stroke half mad the ranks disordered troubled broke all these and many more by time forgot she slew and wounded when against her came the angry persians all cast on a knot for on her person would they purchase fame but her dear spouse and husband wanted not in so great need to aid the noble dame thus joined the haps of war unhurt they prove their strength was double double was their love the noble lover's use well might you see a wondrous guise till then unseen unheard to save themselves forgot both he and she each other's life did keep defend and guard the strokes that gainst her lord discharged be the dame had care to bear to break to ward his shield kept off the blows bent on his dear which if need be his naked head should bear so each saved other each for others wrong would vengeance take but not revenge their own the valiant soldan artabano strong a bocchan isle by her was overthrown and by his hand the bodies dead among alvante that durst his mistress wound fell down and she between the eyes hit aramont who hurt her lord and cleft in twain his front but altamore who had that wing to lead far greater slaughter on the christians made for where he turned his sword or twined his steed he slew or man and beast on earth down laid happy was he that was at first struck dead that fell not down on live for whom his blade had speared the same cast in the dusty street his horse tore with his teeth bruised with his feet by this brave persian's valor killed and slain were strong brunello and ardonio great the first his head and helm had cleft in twain the last in stranger wise he did entreat for through his heart he pierced and through the vein where laughter had his fountain and his seat so that a dreadful thing believed uneath he laughed for pain and laughed himself to death nor these alone with that accursed knife of this sweet light and breath deprived lie but with that cruel weapon lost their life gentonio guascar rosamond and guy who knows how many in that fatal strife he slew what knights his courser fierce made die the names and countries of the people slain who tells their wounds and deaths who can explain with this fierce king encounter durst not one not one durst combat him in equal field gildippes undertook that task alone no doubt could make her shrink no danger yield by thermodont was never amazon that managed steeled axe or carried shield that seemed so bold as she so strong so light when forth she run to meet that dreadful knight she hit him where with gold and rich omail his diadem did on his helmet flame she broke and cleft the crown and caused him veil his proud and lofty top his crest down came strong seemed her arm that could so well assail the pagan shook for spite and blushed for shame forward he rushed and would at once requite shame with disgrace and with revenge despite right on the front he gave that lady kind a blow so huge so strong so great so sore that out of sense and feeling down she twined but her dear knight his love from ground up bore were it their fortune or his noble mind he stayed his hand and struck the dame no more a lion so stalks by and with proud eyes beholds but scorns to hurt a man that lies this while ormondo false whose cruel hand was armed and pressed to give the traitorous blow with all his fellows mongst godfredo's band entered unseen disguised that few them know the thievish wolves when night o'ershades the land that seem like faithful dogs in shape and show so to the closed folds in secret creep and entrance seek to kill some harmless sheep he approached nigh and to godfredo's side the bloody pagan now was placed near but when his colors gold and white he spied and saw the other signs that forged were see see this traitor false the captain cried that like a frenchman would in show appear behold how near his mates and he are crept this said upon the villain forth he leapt deadly he wounded him and that false knight nor strikes nor wards nor striveth to be gone but as medusa's head were in his sight stood like a man new turned to marble stone all lances broke 
unsheathed all weapons bright, all quivers emptied were on them alone. In parts so many were the traitors cleft, that those dead men had no dead bodies left. When Godfrey was with pagan blood bespread, he entered then the fight, and that was past where the bold Persian fought and combated, where the close ranks he opened, cleft and brassed. Before the night the troops and squadrons fled, as Afric dust before the southern blast. The duke recalled them, in array them placed, stayed those that fled, and him assailed that chased. The champions strong there fought a battle stout. Troy never saw the like by Xanthus old. A conflict sharp there was, meanwhile, on foot, twixt Baldwin good and Muliasis bold. The horsemen also, near the mountain's root, and in both wings, a furious skirmish hold, and where the barbarous duke in person stood, twixt Tisifernes and Adrastus proud. With Emeren, Robert the Norman strove. Long time they fought, yet neither lost nor won. The other Robert's helm the Indian clove, and broke his arms. Their fight would soon be done. From place to place did Tisifernes rove, and found no match. Against him none durst run. But where the press was thickest, thither flew the knight, and at each stroke felled, hurt, or slew. Thus fought they long, yet neither shrink nor yield. In equal balance hung their hope and fear. All full of broken lances lay the field, all full of arms that cloven and chattered were. Of swords, some to the body nail the shield, some cut men's throats, and some their bellies tear. Of bodies, some upright, some groveling lay, and for themselves eat graves out of the clay. Beside his lord slain lay the noble steed, there friend with friend lay killed like lovers true, there foe with foe, the live under the dead, the victor under him whom late he slew. A hoarse, unperfect sound did each where spread, whence neither silence nor plain outcries flew. Their fury roars, ire threats, and woe complains. One weeps, another cries, he sighs for pains. The arms that late so fair and glorious seem, now soiled and slubbered, sad and sullen grow. The steel his brightness lost, the gold his beam. The colors had no pride nor beauty show. The plumes and feathers on their crests that stream are strewed wide upon the earth below. The hosts, both clad in blood, in dust and mire, had changed their cheer, their pride, their rich attire. But now the Moors, Arabians, Ethiops black, on the left wing that held the utmost marge, spread forth their troops, and purposed at the back and side their heedless foes to sail and charge. Slingers and archers were not slow nor slack to shoot and cast, when with his battle large Rinaldo came, whose fury, haste, and ire seemed earthquake, thunder, tempest, storm, and fire. The first he met was Asimir, his throne that set in Meroe's hot sunburnt land. He cut his neck in twain, flesh, skin, and bone, the sable head down tumbled on the sand. But when by death of this black prince alone the taste of blood and conquest once he fanned, whole squadrons then, whole troops to earth he brought, Things wondrous, strange, incredible he wrought. He gave more deaths than strokes, and yet his blows upon his feeble foes fell oft and thick. To move three tongues as a fierce serpent shows, which rolls the one she hath swift, speedy, quick. So thinks each pagan, each Arabian trows, he wields three swords, all in one hilt that stick. His readiness their eyes so blinded hath, their dread that wonder bred, fear gave it faith. The Afric tyrants and the Negro kings fell down on heaps, drowned each in other's blood. Upon their people ran the knights he brings, pricked forward by their guides and zample good. Killed were the pagans, broke their bows and slings. Some died, some fell, some yielded, none withstood. A massacre was this, no fight. These put their foes to death, those hold their throats to cut. Small while they stood with heart and hardy face, on their bold breasts, deep wounds and hurts to bear, but fled away, and troubled in the chase, their ranks disordered be with too much fear. Rinaldo followed them from place to place, till quite discomfort and dispersed they were. That done he stays, and all his knights recalls, and scorns to strike his foe that flies or falls. Like as the wind, stopped by some wood or hill, grows strong and fierce, tears boughs and trees in twain, but with mild blasts, more temperate, gentle, still, 
flows through the ample field or spacious plain against the rocks as sea waves murmur shrill but silent pass amid the open main rinaldo so when none his force withstood assuaged his fury calmed his angry mood he scorned upon their fearful backs that fled to wreak his ire and spend his force in vain but gainst the footmen strong his troops he led whose side the moors had open left and plain the africans that should have succored that battle all were run away or slain upon their flank with force and courage stout his men-at-arms assailed the bands on foot he brake their pikes and brake their close array entered their battle felled them down around so wind or tempest with impetuous sway the ears of ripened corn strikes flat to ground with blood arms bodies dead the hardened clay plastered the earth no grass nor green was found the horsemen running through and through their bands kill murder slay few scape not one withstands rinaldo came where his forlorn armide sat in her golden chariot mounted high a noble guard she had on every side of lords of lovers and much chivalry she knew the man when first his arm she spied love hate wrath sweet desire strove in her eye he changed some deal his look and countenance bold she changed from frost to fire from heat to cold the prince passed by the chariot of his dear like one that did his thoughts elsewhere bestow yet suffered not her knights and lovers near their rival so to scape without and blow one drew his sword another couched his spear herself an arrow sharp set in her bow disdain her ire new sharped and kindled hath but love appeased her love assuaged her wrath love bridled fury and revived of new his fire not dead though buried in displeasure three times her angry hand the bow updrew and thrice again let slack the string at leisure but wrath prevailed at last the reed out flew for love finds mean but hatred knows no measure out flew the shaft but with the shaft this charm this wish she sent heaven granted do no harm she bids the reed return the way it went and pierce her heart which so unkind could prove such force had love though lost and vainly spent what strength hath happy kind and mutual love but she that gentle thought did straight repent wrath fury kindness in her bosom strove she would she would not that she missed or hit her eyes her heart her wishes followed it but yet in vain the quarrel lighted not for on his hauberk hard the knight had hit too hard for woman's shaft or woman's shot instead of piercing there it broke and split he turned away she burnt with fury hot and thought he scorned her power and in that fit shot oft and oft her shafts no entrance found and while she shot love gave her wound on wound and is he then unpierceable quoth she that neither force nor foe he needs regard his limbs perchance armed with that hardness be which makes his heart so cruel and so hard no shot that flies from eye or hand i see hurts him such rigor doth his person guard armed or disarmed his foe or mistress kind despised alike like hate like scorn i find but what new form is left device or art by which to this exchanged i might find grace for in my knights and all that take my part i see no help no hope no trust i place to his great prowess might and valiant heart all strength is weak all courage vile and base this said she for she saw how through the field her champions fly faint tremble fall and yield no left alone can she her person save but to be slain or taken stands in fear though with her bow a javelin long she have yet weak was phoebe's bow blunt palace spear but as the swan that sees the eagle brave threatening her flesh and silver plumes to tear falls down to hide her amongst the shady brooks such were her fearful motions such her looks but all tomorrow this while that strove and sought from shameful flight his persian host to stay that was discomfort and destroyed to naught whilst he alone maintained the fight and fray seeing distressed the goddess of his thought to aid her ran nay flew and laid away all care both of his honor and his host if she were safe let all the world be lost 
To the ill-guarded chariot swift he flew, His weapon made him way with bloody war. Meanwhile Lord Godfrey and Rinaldo slew his feeble bands, His people murdered are. He saw their loss, but aided not his crew, A better lover than a leader far. He set Armida safe, then turned again with tardy succor, For his folk were slain. And on that side the woeful prince beheld the battle lost, no help nor hope remained. But on the other wing the Christians yield, and fly such vantage there the Egyptians gained. One of the Roberts was nigh slain in field, the other by the Indian strong constrained to yield himself his captive and his slave. Thus equal loss and equal foil they have. Godfredo took the time and season fit to bring again his squadrons in array, and either camp well ordered, ranged, and knit, renewed the furious battle, fight, and fray. New streams of blood were shed, new swords them hit, new combats fought, new spoils were borne away, and unresolved and doubtful on each side did praise and conquest, Mars and fortune ride. Between the armies twain, while thus the fight waxed sharp, hot, cruel, though renewed but late, the soldan clomb up to the tower's height, and saw far off their strife and fell debate as from some stage or theatre the knight saw played the tragedy of human state saw death blood murder woe and horror strange and the great acts of fortune chance and change at first astonished and amazed he stood then burnt with wrath and self-consuming ire swelled in his bosom like a raging flood to be amid that battle such desire such haste he had he donned his helmet good his other arms he had before entire up up he cried no more no more within this fortress stay come follow die or win whether the same were providence divine that made him leave the fortress he possessed for that the empire proud of palestine this day should fall to rise again more blessed or that he breaking felt the fatal line of life and would meet death with constant breast furious and fierce he did the gates unbar and sudden rage brought forth and sudden war, nor stayed he till the folk on whom he cried assemble might, but out alone he flies, a thousand foes the man alone defied, and ran among a thousand enemies. But with his fury called from side to side, the rest run out, and Aladine forth eyes. The cowards had no fear, the wise no care. This was not hope nor courage, but despair. The dreadful Turk with sudden blows downcast the first he met, nor gave them time to plain or pray, in murdering them he made such haste, that dead they fell ere one could see them slain. From mouth to mouth, from eye to eye, forth passed the fear and terror, that the faithful train of Syrian folk, not used to dangerous fight, were broken, scattered, and nigh put to flight. But with less terror and disorder less, the Gascoins kept array, and kept their ground, though most the loss and peril them oppress, unwares assailed they were, unready found. No ravening tooth or talon hard, I guess, of beast or eager hawk doth slay and wound so many sheep or fowls, weak, feeble, small, as his sharp sword killed knights and soldiers tall. It seemed his thirst and hunger swage he would with their slain bodies and their blood poured out. With him his troops and Aladino old slew the besiegers, killed the Gascoigne's rout. But Raymond ran to meet the soldan bold, nor to encounter him had fear or doubt though his right hand by proof too well he know, which laid him late for dead at one huge blow. They met, and Raymond fell amid the field, this blow again upon his forehead light. It was the fault and weakness of his yield, age is not fit to bear strokes of such might. Each one lift up his sword, advanced his shield, those would destroy, and these defend the knight. On went the soldan, for the man he thought was slain, or easily might be captive brought. Among the rest he ran, he raged, he smote, and in small space, small time, great wonders wrought. And as his rage him led, and fury hote to kill and murder, matter new he sought, as from his supper poor, with hungry throat, a peasant hastes to a rich feast to brought. So from this skirmish to the battle great he ran, and quenched with blood his fury's heat. Where battered was the wall, he sallied out, and to the field in haste and heat he goes, with him went rage and fury, fear and doubt remained behind among his scattered foes. To win the conquest strove his squadron stout, which he unperfect left, yet loath to lose the day, the Christians fight, resist, and die, and ready were to yield, retire, and fly. The Gascoigne bands retired, but kept array, 
the Syrian people ran away outright. The fight was near the place where Tancred lay, his house was full of noise and great affright. He rose, and looked forth to see the fray, though every limb were weak, faint, void of might. He saw the country lie, his men o'erthrown, some beaten back, some killed, some fell down. Courage in noble hearts that ne'er is spent, yet fainted not, though faint were every limb but reinforced each member cleft and rent, and want of blood and strength supplied in him. In his left hand his heavy shield he hent, nor seemed the weight too great, his kirtlax trim his right hand drew, nor for more arms he stood or stayed, he needs no more whose heart is good. But coming forth cried, Whither will you run, and leave your leader to his foes in prey? What, shall these heathen of his armor won in their vile temples hang up trophies gay? Go home to Gascoigne then, and tell his son that where his father died, you ran away. This said, against a thousand armed foes he did his breast, weak, naked, sick, oppose, and with his heavy, strong, and mighty targe, that with seven hard bull's hides was surely lined, and strengthened with a cover thick and large of stiff and well-attempered steel behind, he shielded Raymond from the furious charge, from swords, from darts, from weapons of each kind, and all his foes drove back with his sharp blade, that sure and safe he lay as in a shade. Thus saved, thus shielded, Raymond gan respire. He rose and reared himself in little space, and in his bosom burnt the double fire of vengeance. Wrath his heart, shame filled his face. He looked around to spy, such was his ire, the man whose stroke had laid him in that place, whom when he sees not, for disdain he quakes, and on his people sharp revengement takes. The Gascoigns turn again, their lord in haste to avenge their loss, his band reordered brings. The troop that durst so much now stood aghast, for where sad fear grew late, now boldness springs. Now followed they that fled, fled they that chased. So in one hour altereth the state of things. Raymond requites his loss, shame, hurt, and all, and with an hundred deaths revenged one fall. Whilst Raymond wreaked thus his just disdain on the proud heads of captains, lords, and peers, he spies great Sion's king amid the train, and to him leaps, and high his sword he rears, and on his forehead strikes and strikes again, till helm and head he breaks, he cleaves, he tears. Down fell the king, the guiltless land he bit, that now keeps him, because he kept not it. Their guides, one murdered thus, the other gone, the troops divided were in diverse thought. Despair made some run headlong against their phone to seek sharp death that comes uncalled, unsought, and some that laid their hope on flight alone fled to their fort again. Yet chance so wrought that with the flyers in the victors pass, and so the fortress won and conquered was. The hold was won, slain were the men that fled, in courts, halls, chambers high above, below. Old Raymond fast up to the leads him sped, and there, a victory true sign and show, his glorious standard to the wind he spread, that so both armies his success might know. But Solomon saw not the town was lost, for far from thence he was, and near the host. Into the field he came, the lukewarm blood did smoke and flow through all the purple field, there of sad death the court and palace stood, there did he triumphs lead and trophies build. An armed steed fast by the soldan yode, that had no guide nor lord the reins to wield. The tyrant took the bridle and bestrode the courser's empty back, and forth he rode. Great, yet but short and sudden, was the aid that to the pagans, faint and weak, he brought. A thunderbolt he was, you would have said. Great, yet that comes and goes as swift as thought, and of his coming swift and flight unstayed, eternal signs in hardest rocks hath wrought. For by his hand an hundred knights were slain, but time forgot hath all their names but twain. Gildippe's fair, and Edward thy dear lord, your noble death, sad end, and woeful fate, if so much power our vulgar tongue afford, to all strange wits, strange ears, let me dilate 
that ages all your love and sweet accord your virtue prowess worth may imitate and some kind servant of true love that hears may grace your death my verses with some tears the noble lady thither boldly flew where the fierce soldan fought and him defied two mighty blows she gave the turk untrue one cleft his shield the other pierced his side the prince the damsel by her habit knew see see this mankind strumpet see he cried this shameless whore for thee fit weapons were thy kneeled and spindle not a sword and spear this said full of disdain rage and despite a strong a fierce a deadly stroke he gave and pierced her armor pierced her bosom white were they no blows but blows of love to have her dying hand let go the bridle quite she faints she falls twixt life and death she strave her lord to help her came but came too late yet was not that his fault it was his fate what should he do to diverse parts him called just ire and pity kind one bids him go and succor his dear lady like to fall the other calls for vengeance on his foe love biddeth both love says he must do all and with his ire joins grief with pity woe what did he then with his left hand the knight would hold her up revenge her with his right but to resist against a knight so bold to weak his will and power divided were so that he could not his fair love uphold nor kill the cruel man that slew his dear his arm that did his mistress kind enfold the turk cut off pale grew his looks and cheer he let her fall himself fell by her side and for he could not save her with her died as the high elm whom his dear vine hath twined fast in her hundred arms and holds embraced bears down to earth his spouse and darling kind if storm or cruel steel the tree down cast and her full grapes to naught doth bruise and grind spoils his own leaves faints withers dies at last and seems to mourn and die not for his own but for her death with him that lies o'er throne so fell he mourning mourning for the dame whom life and death had made for ever his they would have spoke, but not one word could frame. Deep sobs their speech, sweet sighs their language is. Each gazed on other's eyes, and, while the same is lawful, join their hands, embrace, and kiss. And thus, sharp death, their knot of life untied. Together fainted they, together died. But now swift fame her nimble wings dispread, And told each where their chance, their fate, their fall. Rinaldo heard the case by one that fled from the fierce Turk, And brought him news of all. Disdain, goodwill, woe, wrath, the champion led to take revenge. Shame, grief, or vengeance call. But as he went, Adrastus with his blade forestalled the way, And show of combat made. The giant cried, by sundry signs i note that whom i wish i search thou thou art he i mark each worthy shield his helm his coat and all this day have called and cried for thee to my sweet saint i have thy head devote thou must my sacrifice my offering be come let us hear our strength and courage try thou art armida's foe her champion i thus he defied him on his front before and on his throat he struck him, yet the blow his helmet neither bruised, cleft, nor tore, but in his saddle made him bend and bow. Rinaldo hit him on the flank so sore that neither art nor herb could help him now. Down fell the giant strong, one blow such power such puissance had, so falls a thundered tower. With horror, fear, amazedness, and dread, cold were the hearts of all that saw the fray, and Solomon that viewed that noble deed trembled his paleness did his fear bewray for in that stroke he did his end a reed he wist not what to think to do to say a thing in him unused rare and strange but so doth heaven men's hearts turn alter change 
as when the sick or frantic men oft dream in their unquiet sleep and slumber short and think they run some speedy course and seem to move their legs and feet in hasty sort yet feel their limbs far slower than the stream of their vain thoughts that bears them in this sport and oft would speak would cry would call or shout yet neither sound nor voice nor word send out so run to fight the angry soldan wood and did enforce his strength his might his ire yet felt not in himself his courage old his wonted force his rage and hot desire his eyes that sparkled wrath and fury bold grew dim and feeble fear had quenched that fire and in his heart an hundred passions fought yet not on fear or base retire he thought while unresolved he stood the victor knight arrived and seemed in quickness haste and speed in boldness greatness goodliness and might above all princes born of human seed the turk small while resists not death nor fight made him forget his state or race through dread he fled no strokes he fetched no groan or sigh bold were his motions last proud stately high now when the soldan in these battles past that antius like oft fell oft rose again ever more fierce more fell fell down at last to lie for ever when this prince was slain fortune that seld is stable firm or fast no longer durst resist the christian train but ranged herself in row with godfrey's knights with them she serves she runs she rides she fights the pagan troops the king's own squadron fled of all the east the strength the pride the flower late called immortal now discomfited lost that title proud and lost all power to him that with the royal standard fled thus emoreno said with speeches sour art not thou he to whom to bear i gave my king's great banner and his standard brave this ensign remedon i gave not thee to be the witness of thy fear and flight coward dost thou thy lord and captain see in battle strong and runs thyself from fight what seek'st thou safety come return with me the way to death his path to virtue right here let him fight that would escape for this the way to honor way to safety is the man returned and swelled with scorn and shame the duke with speeches grave exhorts the rest he threats he strikes some time till back they came and rage gainst force despair gainst death addressed thus of his broken armies gan he frame a battle now some hope dwelt in his breast but tisafernes bold revived him most who fought and seemed to win when all was lost wonders that day wrought noble tisifern the hardy normans all he overthrew the flemings fled before the champion stern Garnier, Rogero, Gerard bold he slew, his glorious deeds to praise and fame eterne, his life's short date prolonged, enlarged and drew, and then, as he that set sweet life at naught, the greatest peril, danger most he sought. He spied Rinaldo, and although his field of azure purple now and sanguine shows, and though the silver bird amid his shield were armed jewels, yet he the champion knows, and says, here greatest peril is heavens yield strength to my courage fortune to my blows that fair armida her revenge may see help macon for his arms i vow to thee thus prayed he but all his vows were vain mahoon was deaf or slept in heavens above and as a lion strikes him with his train his native wrath to quicken and to move so he awaked his fury and disdain and sharped his courage on the whetstone love himself he saved behind his mighty targe and forward spurred his steed and gave the charge the christian saw the hardy warrior come and leaped forth to undertake the fight the people round about gave place and room and wondered on that fierce and cruel sight some praised their strength their skill and courage some such and so desperate blows struck either knight that all that saw forgot both ire and strife their wounds their hurts forgot both death and life one struck the other did both strike and wound his arms were surer and his strength was more from tisafern the blood streamed down around his shield was cleft his helm was rent and tore the dame 
that saw his blood besmear the ground, his armor broke, limbs weak, wounds deep and sore, and all her guard dead, fled and overthrown, thought now her field lay waste, her hedge lay down, environed with so brave a troop but late. Now stood she in her chariot all alone, she feared bondage, and her life did hate, all hope of conquest and revenge was gone half mad and half amazed from where she sat she leaped down and fled from friends and phone on a swift horse she mounts and forth she rides alone save for disdain and love her guides in days of old queen cleopatra so alone fled from the fight and cruel fray against augustus great his happy foe leaving her lord to loss and sure decay and as that lord for love let honor go followed her flying sails and lost the day so tisiphon the fair and fearful dame would follow but his foe forbids the same but when the pagan's joy and comfort fled it seemed the sun was set the day was night gainst the brave prince with whom he combated he turned and on the forehead struck the knight when thunders forged are in typhius bed not bronte's hammer falls so swift so right the furious stroke fell on rinaldo's crest and made him bend his head down to his breast the champion in his stirrups high upstart and cleft his hauberk hard and tender side and sheathed his weapon in the pagan's heart the castle where man's life and soul do bide the cruel sword his breast and hinder part with double wound unclosed and opened wide and two large doors made for his life and breath which passed and cured hot love with frozen death this done rinaldo stayed and looked around where he should harm his foes or help his friends nor of the pagans saw he squadron sound each standard falls ensign to earth descends his fury quiet then and calm he found there all his wrath his rage and rancor ends he called to mind how far from help or aid armida fled alone amazed afraid well saw he when she fled and with that sight the prince had pity courtesy and care he promised her to be her friend and knight when erst he left her in the island bare the way she fled he ran and rode aright her palfrey's feet signs in the grass out where but she this while found out an ugly shade fit place for death where naught could life persuade well pleased was she with those shadows brown and yet displeased with luck with life with love there from her steed she lighted there laid down her bows and shafts her arms that helpless prove there lie with shame she says disgraced or thrown blunt are the weapons blunt the arms i move weak to revenge my harms or harm my foe my shafts are blunt ah love would thine were so alas among so many could not one not one draw blood one wound or rend his skin all other breasts to you are marble stone dare you then pierce a woman's bosom thin see see my naked heart on this alone employ your force this fort is eath to win and love will shoot you from his mighty bow weak is the shot that dripple falls in snow i pardon will your fear and weakness past be strong mine arrows cruel sharp gainst me ah wretch how is thy chance and fortune cast if placed in these thy good and comfort be but since all hope is vain all help is waste since hurts ease hurts wounds must cure wounds in thee then with thine arrow stroke cure stroke of love death for thy heart must salve and surgeon prove and happy me if being dead and slain i bear not with me this strange plague to hell love stay behind come thou with me disdain and with my wronged soul forever dwell or else with it turn to the world again and vex that night with dreams and visions fell and tell him when twixt life and death i strove my last wish was revenge last word was love and with that word half mad half dead she seems an arrow poignant strong and sharp she took 
when her dear knight found her in these extremes, now fit to die and pass the Stygian brook, now pressed to quench her own and beauty's beams, now death sat on her eyes, death in her look, when to her back he stepped and stayed her arm, stretched forth to do that service last, last harm. She turns, and ere she knows, her lord she spies, whose coming was unwished, unthought, unknown. She shrieks and twines away her stainful eyes from his sweet face. She falls dead in a swoon, falls as a flower half cut that bending lies. He held her up, and lest she tumble down, under her tender side his arm he placed, his hand her girdle loosed, her gown unlaced, and her fair face, fair bosom he bedews with tears, tears of remorse, of ruth, of sorrow. As the pale rose her color lost renews with the fresh drops fallen from the silver morrow, so she revives and cheeks empurpled shows, moist with her own tears and with tears they borrow. Thrice looked she up, her eyes thrice closed she, as who say, Let me die ere look on thee. And his strong arm with weak and feeble hand she would have thrust away, loosed and untwined, Oft strove she, but in vain, to break that band, for he, the hold he got, not yet resigned. Herself fast bound in those dear knots she fanned, dear, though she feigned scorn, strove and repined. At last she speaks, she weeps, complains and cries, yet durst not, did not, would not see his eyes. Cruel at thy departure, at return as cruel, Say, what chance thee hither guideth? Wouldst thou prevent her death, Whose heart forlorn for thee, For thee death strokes each hour divideth? Comest thou to save my life? Alas, what scorn, What torment for Armida poor abideth? No, no, thy crafts and slights I will descry, But she can little do that cannot die. Thy triumph is not great, nor well arrayed, unless in chains thou lead a captive dame, a dame now ta'en by force before betrayed. This is thy greatest glory, greatest fame. Time was that thee of love and life I prayed. Let death now end my love, my life, my shame. Yet let not thy false hand bereave this breath, for if it were thy gift, hateful were death. Cruel, myself an hundred ways can find to rid me from thy malice, from thy hate. If weapons sharp, if poisons of all kind, if fire, if strangling fail in that estate, yet ways enough I know to stop this wind. A thousand entries hath the house of fate. I'll leave these flatteries, leave weak hope to move. Cease, cease, my hope is dead, dead is my love. Thus mourned she, and from her watery eyes disdain and love dropped down, rolled up in tears. From his pure fountains ran two streams likewise, wherein chaste pity and mild ruth appears. Thus with sweet words the queen he pacifies. Madam, appease your grief, your wrath, your fears, for to be crowned, not scorned, your life I save. Your foe, nay, but your friend, your knight, your slave. But if you trust no speech, no oath, no word, yet in mine eyes my zeal, my truth behold. For to that throne whereof thy sire was lord, I will restore thee, crown thee with that gold. And if high heaven would so much grace afford as from thy heart this cloud, this veil unfold of paganism, in all the east no dame should equalize thy fortune, state, and fame. Thus plaineth he. Thus prays, and his desire endears with sighs that fly and tears that fall. That as against the warmth of Titan's fire snow drifts consume on tops of mountains tall, so melts her wrath, but love remains entire. Behold, she says, your handmaid and your thrall, my life, my crown, my wealth use at your pleasure. Thus death her life became. Loss proved her treasure. 
This while the captain of the Egyptian host, That saw his royal standard laid on ground, Saw Rimadon, that ensign's prop and post, By Godfrey's noble hand killed with one wound, And all his folk discomfort, slain and lost. No coward was in this last battle found, But rode about and sought, nor sought in vain, Some famous hand of which he might be slain. Against Lord Godfrey boldly out he flew, For nobler foe he wished not, could not spy. Of desperate courage showed he tokens true, Where'er he joined or stayed or passed by, And cried to the duke as near he drew, Behold, of thy strong hand I come to die, Yet trust to overthrow thee with my fall, My castle's ruin shall break down thy wall. This said, forth spurred they both, both high advanced their swords aloft, Both struck at once, both hit. His left arm wounded had the knight of France, His shield was pierced, his vaunt brace cleft and split. The pagan backward fell, half in a trance, On his left ear his foe so hugely smit, And as he sought to rise, Godfredo's sword pierced him through. So died that army's lord. Of his great host, when Emeren was dead, Fled the small remnant that alive remained. Godfrey aspired as he turned his steed, Great Altamore on foot with blood all stained, With half a sword, half helm upon his head, Gainst whom a hundred fought, yet not one gained. Cease, cease this strife, he cried, And thou, brave knight, yield. I am Godfrey, yield thee to my might. He that till then his proud and haughty heart To act of humbleness did never bend, when that great name he heard, From the north part of our wide world renowned To Ethiop's end, answered, I yield to thee, thou worthy art, I am thy prisoner, fortune is thy friend, On Altamoro great thy conquest bold Of glory shall be rich and rich of gold. My loving queen, my wife and lady kind, Shall ransom me with jewels, gold and treasure. God shield, quoth Godfrey, that my noble mind should praise and virtue so by profit measure. All that thou hast from Persia and from Ind, enjoy it still, therein I take no pleasure. I set no rent on life, no price on blood. I fight and sell not war for gold or good. This said, he gave him to his knights to keep, and after those that fled his course he bent. They to their rampiers fled in trenches deep, Yet could not so death's cruel stroke prevent. The camp was won, and all in blood doth steep. The blood in rivers streamed from tent to tent, Its soil defiled, defaced all the prey, Shields, helmets, armors, plumes, and feathers gay. Thus conquered Godfrey, and as yet the sun dived not in silver waves his golden wane, But daylight served him to the fortress one With his victorious host to turn again. His bloody coat he put not off, But run to the high temple with his noble train, And there hung up his arms, And there he bows his knees, 